so hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name's Chris Bealey, I'm a data scientist. I work at the, um, the strategy unit. Um, this is welcome to the NHSR conference. This is a very exciting conference. I don't really have time to tell you why I'm so excited about it, but I will have more time later on. Uh, but I feel very excited and proud to see you all here. This is really amazing. Um, so just some housekeeping before we start. So there are no fire alarms planned. If you hear, let me get this right. So the first fire alarm is a, is a, a woman's voice and it will say something like investigating. And if you hear that, they're investigating. And then the second fire alarm is a man's voice and it says something that sounds more worrying than that. If you hear that, that voice, the fire exits are here and here and there are stairs uh, to, uh, to the outside. Um, so just about the talks today. So I'll be handing over to the chair soon after the keynote speaker. There is a Slack channel for asking questions. We've done this um, partly to make it easier because putting hands up is always a bit tricky and it's a big room, but also partly to make sure that the people at home, of which there are lots of them, hello, if you're watching online, uh, get a chance to ask questions. Um, so they're in the Slack channel, uh, which I've forgotten the name of the Slack channel, so if someone from the team could shout it out now, that'd be really helpful. In-person conference talk, thank you very much. This is so professional already. And if you're not on the Slack, uh, this QR code here will take you to a place where you can join. Right, I think that's everything I want to say about the conference so far. Um, so we have our first speaker now um, from the Royal Statistical Society, Brian Tarran. Brian has uh, very interested in forging links with the NHSR community, which is really exciting. We're always keen to uh, forge links with anybody, and the Royal Statistical Society are a great bunch of people to forge links with. Um, and Brian has built a really amazing data site, uh, data site website called Real World Data Science, and he's going to talk about uh, some of his work uh, in due course. Brian, please. Oh yeah, sorry, and just for the benefit of the speakers, the questions will be read out by Zoe. I don't know where Zoe is, but she's somewhere, so they'll just magically, yeah, there she is. So yes, the questions will just appear. Excellent, good, thank you. I was, I was worried about, I came completely unprepared and uh, hadn't got the Slack set up. Right. Is this working? It is now working. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me along today. Uh, so, uh, as Chris said, I'm Brian Tarran. I'm the uh, editor of realworlddatascience.net, and it's really exciting to be at my first NHSR and PyCom conference. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing about all the work that the uh, NHSR community has been doing. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for 30 minutes to tell you about the work that we're doing, and hopefully you'll see some opportunities for us uh, to work together going forward. So. My talk is going to be about this website, Real World Data Science. I'm going to tell you about uh, how we uh, built it and how the, uh, I guess the journey I went on from being a, a journalist to someone who had to start get familiar with uh, open source data science tools in order to create this. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the community that we're building around Real World Data Science. It's a small community, uh, but it's a, it's a growing one. And I, I want to kind of leave the door open at the end for us to, to, to work together to create a really valuable resource for the, for the broader data science community. Uh, there's a lot of excellent work that goes on within the NHS community. We'd like to uh, amplify that and share that with the, with the wider world. So, so my story then, where does it begin? So March 2022, uh, my, my boss uh, at the time came to me and said, build us a website, right? So this isn't a particularly scary thing to hear. If you work in publications like I do, I'd worked on uh, website projects before, done some uh, design work. I'd never built a website from scratch, but I was feeling confident and I applied for the job. I was feeling cocky, right? I knew a bit of HTML. I thought this isn't going to be a problem. How hard can it be building a website, right? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of things that you need to do. There's a lot of uh, steps involved in the process. And when I started researching it, um, I kind of felt that like maybe I'd perhaps bitten off a bit more uh, than I could chew. I was a bit panicky. I thought, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to start. So I reached out to some people that I knew in the, in the data science community to, to, you know, to start thinking about you know, what, what could we build. And that's when I heard this phrase, do you know Quarto? And I didn't know Quarto, but you know, hearing these four words, they really changed my whole perspective about how to, how to build a, a digital publication um, and certainly how to uh, 
I, I guess, engage with a, a wider community, the wider open source community. So if I back up a little bit and tell you about the context in which you know, my boss came to me and said, build us a website. So the challenge uh, that was set for me, really it stemmed out of a task force that was set up by our president at the time, uh, Sylvia Richardson. And uh, Sylvia set up a data science task force, and that was convened to look at how the RSS could uh, deepen and extend its impact on the field of data science and its offering to fellows who work as data scientists. Right, the RSS has been around for coming up to 200 years. The people that work, we work with that are members of our, of our community are statisticians generally, uh, but obviously statisticians now work in data science, but there are lots of data scientists who, who don't necessarily have a an academic background in statistics, and we kind of wanted to make sure that we were serving that community as well. And Sylvia's task force, it was kind of really inspired by this challenge that was set out in the 2019 US report called Statistics at a Crossroads, which talked about statistics neither, uh, either needing to flourish by embracing and leading in data science or, or decline and, and become irrelevant. So this task force of people from academia and industry uh, that they, they sort of set about thinking, well, what could the RSS do? And they came up with uh, three priorities. Uh, so there's the, uh, the focus was, one was on leading the professionalization of data science. Another was to develop the science of data science. And, and uh, where I came in was about supporting the practice of, of data science. So out of these three key priorities, we got three initiatives that, that, that launched. Some of you may have heard of the Alliance for Data Science Professionals. So this is a grouping of uh, the RSS, the Operational Research Society, British Computing Society, and uh, various other bodies. And their goal is to kind of set prof common professional standards for data scientists. So regardless of what your academic background is, uh, the, these standards apply across. And if you're a member of one of these bodies, you can get accredited uh, as, a, as a data science under this, under this scheme. Uh, on the developing the data science of the science of data science side of things. We're looking at launching a journal, and we're uh, hoping to announce more on that soon. But as I said, for me, supporting the practice of data science, that's where real-world data science came in. So the, uh, you know, I said that the task force was made up of people from academia and industry. The people that worked in industry, they were kind of feeling that a lot of the conversation out in the wider world about data science was, I guess, kind of quite marketing-driven, quite PR-driven. There's a lot of focus on uh, new tools and techniques and... Uh, you know, people talking about AI, but they don't really mean AI. It's all, you know, just kind of smoke and mirrors, really. And they wanted to ground the conversation in actual real-world uh, applications of data science. So that, that came out of our research as well with RSS members and, and others. You know, people were saying to us that they kind of felt that they would like to see some examples of what does data science actually look like in practice, you know. What is the end-to-end -end of a data science project, you know, from the, the question that you're being asked to answer the thought processes, that you're, the conversations you're having in your data science teams about how we're going to tackle this, and then you know, what are the end results and how do we report these back and how do they have an impact. And you know, you'll work in, in, in data and data science. You, you'll probably recognize this, that there's no shortage of data science content online, right? But I think there's, uh, it's kind of hit and miss about whether what you find is going to be of value to you and is kind of relevant to the, the challenge that you're, that you're working in. So then for me, right, the, the, the three key priorities were to kind of create a new publication for data science professionals, something that would focus on real-world examples of uh, data science practice. And we wanted really generally to kind of support knowledge sharing within the, the data science community. But I guess for me, I was really keen that whatever we created would be a suitable home for data scientists. So uh, I'm a journalist. My, my background and my training is in content tools, right? I'm, I like using Adobe InDesign to create page layouts. So I like using Photoshop to edit things. Um, if, you know, if you said to me, build a website, after my brief flurry of panic, I'd probably think, oh, I'll go to WordPress. But I didn't, I didn't want us just to create something that was, that, that was built for a content person like me. I wanted to build a, a website that would allow data scientists to write and to talk about their work in a way using tools that they were familiar with. So that's when I started you know, uh, speaking to some contacts, finding out you know, how, how do you present your data, how do you present your work with, with, your, uh, with your internal teams or external clients, whatever it might have been. And that's when I heard this phrase, do you know Quarto? Um, I don't know how many of you do know Quarto. Uh, you work with uh, 
uh, our tool, so I'm guessing some of you will have heard of it. Uh, I certainly hadn't, uh, but it was a revelation, actually, when I went to the website, so quarto.org. Uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a build as a next generation version of our markdown, which I hadn't used before, right? But I could see just from this very sort of simple side-by-side -side comparison that this looked quite exciting to me, right? We've got this on the left, the kind of um, the raw underlying code, and on the right, you've got the outputs, the rendered outputs. The thing I was particularly excited about was this uh, bit on the, on the lower left, uh, the, where you can see that, or I could see that the, uh, the figure was kind of being generated uh, from, from the code in the document. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd anno annoyed contributors to the previous magazine I'd worked on, Significance, which was a statistics magazine. I'd annoyed them quite a lot over the years. One, because every time they presented a beautifully laid out article in LaTeX, I would say, that's great, but we don't actually use LaTeX because we're not statisticians. We would need that in Microsoft Word, please, and can you resettle your equations? And that uh, used to create a lot of um, uh, tension. And I'd also, we spend a lot of time messing around with graphics, trying to get them right, right resolution, right size, right fonts, all this. Anyway, this circumnavigated that, so I thought this was perfect, this was great. So I set out to learn Quarto, and this was quite a big step for me. I'm, I, don't, I, have, I don't do data science tools, right? I'm a journalist. I don't use these sorts of things, but I thought I really want to kind of try and meet the data science community where it's at. Uh, and admittedly, it wasn't quite a big, it wasn't such a big hurdle at first, it didn't seem. Now, step one, install some software, right? I could do that. Anyone could do that. This is where things started to get tricky. Step two, choose a tool. I didn't know any of these. I'm sure you all, you all know RStudio, Jupyter, uh, Virtual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code, but I certainly didn't. Um, I think I looked at a Jupyter notebook once before and it collapsed all the, the cells and didn't know what I was doing and quickly got out of there in a panic. Uh, so anyway, I had to clearly pick a tool and learn that. So now I'm learning Visual Studio Code. I'm learning Quarto. Um, but again, you know, the, 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 I went to the Quarto website and there was a, a really nice uh, tutorial, set of tutorials. So it, the, the first... Uh, introduction, I guess, gets you used to using the document format. I then progress on to uh, the guide section where they talk about creating a website. Uh, and so I followed that through. And after about th you know, three days, maybe a week, I built my first website. And I was really proud of this website. I know it's not, it doesn't look like much. Uh, it's pretty, pretty plain. But this was the first website um, I'd ever built. And you can see I was starting to mess around with the you know, placements of things. It doesn't look quite right. But I was happy with this. The only problem was it was running on my local machine, and a website's only good if people can access it on the website or through the web. So I needed to figure out how to get it from my local machine onto the, to the web. So back to the Quarto guide, back to this uh, section on publishing GitHub pages. Well, OK, I was using GitHub. I'm sure you all do. But I was using it as a kind of file storage system. I didn't really know what it was, but I was, you know, I was told, well, maybe you should, you know, this is how you should kind of build out your, uh, your, your demo website. And then there was this section here about using a GitHub action. I thought this sounded exciting. Automatically rendering files. I uh, like that rather than having to manually do it each time. Um, but you know, when I started to dig around into what a GitHub action was, um, it turns out that that's pretty, pretty difficult stuff. So I'm learning Quarto, learning Visual Studio Code, and now GitHub. And I definitely felt that I'd, I'd bitten off more than I could chew at that point. Um, but then I discovered a section on uh, the Quarto website. So there's this gallery. And uh, within the gallery, there's a subsection on, on websites. And then these, these are three websites in particular, uh, the NASA site, uh, OpenScapes, and Data Science in a Box. They were really useful to me, because not only were these uh, you know, other websites I could look at to see how people had used Quarto to build websites, they uh, made all their source code available on GitHub. Right? So I could have a look at. What, are they, what they'd built, and then go and look at how they'd built it. And they all used GitHub Actions to render their site, right? so I could kind of reverse engineer it. So this was great, and I, I couldn't quite figure it out myself, so I started asking questions in some, of the, in some of the GitHub repos. And that's when I realized, so I'd gone from thinking of GitHub just as a kind of personal file storage thing to actually thinking of it as a, as a platform for uh, building a community around something. So there was a community around these sites, and there was a, a wider quarter community, and everyone was kind of working together to support each other in a kind of non-competitive sense, right? People were kind of sharing ideas, things that you might want, look to improve, things that you might like to um, uh, fix, whatever it might be. There was people lending a, lending a helping hand. 
And it made me realize, actually, there's, there's a strength in community. So this hadn't been a kind of... We wanted to serve the data science community, but we hadn't really thought about what we were building as being something around which a community would necessarily uh, evolve. And so that's, that really changed our thinking. So I went back to the, um, the, the priorities that, that I'd kind of been set or that I'd sort of thought about myself. And I sort of focus in on these three words, create, support, community. So I kind of felt like maybe the, the idea had been there all along, right, that we'd want, we, we needed, if we were going to build a website that was going to success, we needed to create a support community uh, around that. And so that's what we set out to do with, with real world data science. You know, we decided that we were going to use Quarto, we were going to build it on GitHub, we were going to make all our code and uh, our source files available for people to use and reuse however they wanted to. And from that, we hoped that a community would, would spring forth. Now, I probably don't have to sell you on the benefits of a community, right? You're all here. You're all part of the, of the NHSR and PyCon community. So you know the value of, of community. But this was really important a learning process for, for me and for the RSS as a whole in, in how we could approach publications. So I, came at, I come at things from a very kind of old media way of thinking about it. As a journalist, you're trained to kind of, uh, I guess, work in silos or small groups and not really tell people what you're working on because you don't want anybody to scoop you and uh, get, your, get their, the story that you're working on into the paper or the magazine before you've had a chance to finish it. But actually, you know, open my eyes to the potential of what I would call as an open source collaborative uh, publication. So that's the route we've gone down now. So, you know, the website is... Uh, we, it's self-published and it's online only, obviously, being a website. Uh, but we're building it on open, using open source software and tools. Uh, these are data science tools primarily, but, you know, we're, we're, we're working with them and we've uh, now done this not just for real-world data science, but another publication that we've put out, uh, Best Practices for Data Visualization. Everything we publish is free to read, right? We want this to be not a resource that RSS members can only access. We want this to be something that the data science community as a whole can uh, make use of and contribute to. And we're publishing under you know, Creative Commons licenses uh, because we think that that's the best way to encourage people to, to pick up and uh, use our content and develop on it, build on it, and create, create new things, new exciting things. So I'll skip over this because you definitely don't need to know, I don't, you don't need me to tell you on why you use it to use open source tools, right? I think everyone's on the same page here. Uh, similarly, on, on for, you know, for Creative Commons, I kind of already said that what I needed to say there, but the, the, the one thing I would focus on is what we're trying to do with real-world data science is we've talked about putting the focus on actual real-world applications of data. And why are we using Creative Commons is because we want people to see a real-world application of data. Let's say you're an educator and you think, I'm really looking for a, a case study that I can use in my teaching to show my students what data science out in the real world actually looks like. Well, we want them to be able to take that case study, use it in class, maybe build a lesson plan around it or a tutorial or an exercise or something, and then for them to feel that they want to then share that back with the community so that others can benefit and learn from that and, and take it forward. And for GitHub, why we want to use GitHub as, as the kind of host platform, if you like, for our site, is because we really want to encourage different types of contribution. So, again, an old media uh, way of thinking about things is that people write articles for us and we publish them. But actually, if you don't want to write articles for our website, we want you to feel like you can be involved in developing things for the site. You can uh, be involved in uh, supporting other people to create content for the site. There's lots of different ways that you can contribute. And we want to build up a digital record of contributors and acknowledge what they've done. So if you go to the website today, you'll see that you know, we've got these, these four key sections. We've got case studies, which you know, talk about uh, data science being used to solve real-world problems in different uh, domains. We've got a section on ideas, uh, tools, methods that, that, that underpin these data science projects, that make the projects possible. And we want to focus in and zero in on the, the people that are actually doing the data science as well. So these, these are just some of the people that are sharing their career stories with us, how they got into data science, uh, the uh, advice that they have for others who might be looking to, to follow suit. So we'd love to feature some members of the NHSR community uh, in this section as well. And we've also made space right, for people to have a conversation, to have a discussion around big issues in data science because there are a lot of issues at the da in, in data science at the moment, as we'll see in a couple of weeks' time when the uh, AI Safety Summit is hosted. There'll be a, a, there's a whole week of con a conversation around uh, things like uh, 
uh, trust, transparency, bias in, in AI models, and data science is a really important part to play in informing those conversations. And I said about non-traditional ways of contributing. So at the start of summer, um, a data science student called Finn Olehona from the, the Netherlands got in touch and said, I'd really like to create a template repository for real-world data science. He wasn't interested in writing an article for us, but he wanted to create something so that if you wanted to write an article for us, you could use this template to create an article, you could render the article, and it would look like it would look on our website. So it gives people some confidence that if they're building something, they can create, a, a, that they know what it's going to look like before it's even been submitted, before it's even been published. And this has been really valuable, not only for our contributors, but for me as well. So I now use this when I'm sketching out an article idea, uh, in the, so I don't have to kind of mess around with the, the, the site source code. I will use this to kind of play around with some, some different tools and, and techniques. And Finn has built a a report, a dummy report that kind of shows all the different quarto formats that you can use. So Finn is just one of the uh, community of contributors now. So this isn't everybody who contributes to the site. These are just people who have a GitHub uh, profile. So Finn's highlighted there. Zoe, who's also uh, in the room today, Zoe's been really helpful as well, spotting a, a bug or two for us uh, on the site. And we've got others who are looking at, you know, helping us with pull requests and things like that. So. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of ways for, for, for people to contribute to this community, and there's a lot of ways that I'm benefiting, I think, from this community. So um, I mentioned at the start, right, that I, one of the things that it, it attracted me about Quarto was that you could you know, design the figures in the, co in the code, and then they render them automatically. Well, it turns out that doesn't work for us, because if you've got 60-plus articles on your site and everyone's using a different package, your site rendering speeds fall off a cliff, so we had to figure out a solution to that, and that's where the community come in. I also learned that code annotation is a cool thing. I hadn't seen this. It, it's been out in Quarto for ages, but I hadn't clearly bothered to read the documentation properly. And it was only when Finn uh, built it into uh, the demo uh, document for us that I realized that it was possible. And I, you know, there's a little demo of, of how it works. You know, we, we like to encourage people to annotate their code if they're, if they're including it in articles. But this is a kind of nice, uh, more interactive way uh, that you can kind of build those annotations. Uh, in. And I also realized that designing a website is a lot harder than just wrapping a few italics and bold text tags around things. Who would have known? Who would have thought that? Anyway, to get the site looking like this uh, required uh, all this uh, CSS code. Don't look at it too closely because I'm sure I've done things wrong, but you know, I couldn't have done this without the, the support of the community and frequent dips into Stack Overflow and things like that. For, uh, for help to try and figure out how to get something looking like I wanted it to look. So I guess my key learnings from it, or, you know, I wish I'd learned coding at school. Uh, that would have been, I think, a, a real benefit for, for this project. But it's really exciting to see initiatives now that are trying, is trying to bring uh, coding into school. So we recently featured an article about the Argels network that's been set up by, I think, one of the founders of NHSR, Mohammed Mohammed, uh, and some colleagues at a, a local school. Um, and I'd love to see that spread uh, nationwide. Because I think if, you know, if, if, if my experience to teach shows anything, it's that if, actually if you can start using things like Quarto and our Markdown, actually it does it develop, you develop a passion and a, an understanding and an appreciation for coding. And if I can learn it, I guarantee you anybody uh, can. And I learned that you know, open source collaborative publication is exciting and something that I want to make sure that we, uh, we follow up and, and deliver on as we go. So that's the reason why I'm here today, to talk about how we can you know, work together or to try and encourage you to think about working with us to, to share the, the work that you're doing within the NHSR community with the real world data science audience. Um, and maybe there's some stuff that you can learn as well from the, from the real world data science community and bring back to your own workplaces because uh, in March, I went to the Alan Turing Institute's AI UK conference, and uh, there was a panel on public health and how AI can support uh, you know, activities and, uh, and interventions and things like that in public health. And uh, Joanna Hutchinson from the UK Health Security Agency was there. And this isn't a direct quote because um, it has been a while and my notes are a bit rusty, but uh, Joanna said something along the lines of, you know, collectively, we've got to get better at recognizing what, uh, what best practice looks like and, importantly, learning from developments across sectors. So there's a really nice example that uh, I like to, to refer people to. So this, uh, 
if you, I don't know if you've seen it before, it's, uh, it's the, uh, a map of the global drifter program. And these are machines, boys essentially, that are dropped in the ocean at different parts, and they're used to kind of monitor ocean currents and uh, so ocean surface temperature, all things like, so, like that. Well, a team of researchers wanted to, uh, I guess, they wanted to understand, estimate the travel time and the most life, likely path drifters would take. Not only because it would be interesting for the drifter program, because you could use that to look at you know, how uh, marine life might move around the ocean as well. And the, they, they, in, in their work, they highlight this thing that you know, the novelty of the work that they did was they apply hexagonal tessellation of the ocean using Uber's H3 index. Like that's Uber, the cab company. So Uber has developed this uh, method for optimizing its ride pricing and, and how it sends its cabs uh, around cities. And a group of researchers working on ocean surface uh, temperature and currents and all this sort of stuff, took that, that work, because it was open sourced, and applied it to the work that they were doing. And that's now been built into a package, a, a tool that is available through the uh, NOA website. And I think that's really exciting, right? Because that says to me, like what Joanna was saying, that we can learn from across sectors. If you're sharing what you're doing in, in, you know, in the health service with a wider community, maybe there will be people working on not, the, not in the same domain, right, but on, on similar problems. And they'll be able to take what you're doing and learn from that and be inspired by it. And similarly, maybe some, some work that some of our other contributors are doing will inspire you to, to approach problems, to approach projects uh, differently. So this is where we are today uh, at, at, at Real World Data Science. So we've gone from this, my first website, to this. Uh, these numbers are a bit old now, but we're up to nearly 60 articles, 20 contributors, and tens of thousands of, of users since, since we launched properly uh, at the start of this year. And so that was, we, we launched about a year after my uh, boss had come to me and said, build us a website. Well, I'm proud. I can now say I built a website. Uh, it's a very big personal achievement for me. But I actually think it's more honest uh, to say that that we are building a website, as in the, the data science community, the people around uh, real world data science, my colleagues in the RSS, the people that present at our conferences, the people that lead and take part in our training courses. All these people we, we are kind of feeding into to the work we're doing. And if I could leave you with uh, one, one message today, it would be, why not join us? So thank you for your time this morning, for listening. Um, here's our details. If you have any questions, happy to answer them, but thank you, that's it from me. You can come and share the podium with me. We don't have time for many questions, but I think we've got a couple of good ones. Any advice on how to maintain articles on the content for longevity? Oh, um, well, because we, we've not been going uh, a long time yet, uh, we've not had to encounter that problem. I'm guessing that can refer to things like what may, maybe if, you, if you've got code and stuff like packages becoming depreciated and things like that. Perhaps, I don't know. We I haven't... think it's more about content. Oh, okay, well, content. Well, I mean, I think the, the, I mean, the, the, the thing that I love most about uh, digital publication, I'd worked in print publishing most of my career, um, is that when things get out of date or you notice that they might be incorrect, you can quickly update them. Uh, and so uh, I think what we want to encourage people to do if you're, if you're contributing to the site is to think, uh, to return to your content, to, to kind of keep revisiting it and thinking how things have changed. You know? I know that there is a temptation in, um, well, the, the way most of us work, right? We, we bounce from project to project and we don't really look back very often. But hopefully people, if, you know, if they're proud of their work and they've, they've published it and they, people are finding use and value in it, they'll be sort of minded to kind of maintain it. And you mentioned about users and numbers and mm. there's some metrics in there. One of the questions was what's the most read article on the site, but I'd like to expand that and say how are you tracking what people are looking at and using? Yeah, so we use uh, Google Analytics. So Quarto has a functionality where you can build in a, a Google Analytics 4 tracking code um, and then that, that monitors uh, what people are what people are looking at. I actually don't know what the most popular article is. I should, 
So, oh, actually, I think it might well be the Argyles article that we published recently. That one's done really well. People are really excited about that project. So, yeah. And just to say, everybody in the room, you can buy some merchandise of our girls. So we're going oh. to move over to the next speakers, I think. Is that right? Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hello, um, my name's Ben. Um, I'm introducing the speakers in this morning session. Um, so we're first gonna call up Zoe Hancock. Can you come to the front, Zoe? And um, Richard Wood, if you would like to be ready with your team to come up in about 10 minutes. So we've got three, four short speakers and one long speaker between now and 11. And Zoe is going to talk to us for 10 minutes about hypergraphs to model multimorbidity. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many faces. Um, so I'm Zoe. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Leeds, um, but I recently did an internship within the digital analytics research team um, with Dan Schofield and Jonathan Pearson. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a bit about hypergraphs and how we can use them to model multimorbidity. So, I guess first I should probably say what multimorbidity is. So if you have more than one condition that is chronic, you could, if you had two, that's comorbidity, any more than two, multimorbidity. Um, it's thought at the moment that one in four patients, so a quarter of the people who go to GPs actually have multimorbidities and struggle in with their daily lives with these um, chronic conditions. And in 2015, about half of the population over 65 years old had multimorbidity. And this is only predicted to rise to two thirds of people. So two thirds of this room when you're over 65 are likely to have multimorbidity. As we know, the population is aging, people are living longer, and therefore people are gonna gain conditions, chronic conditions, acute conditions. And so unfortunately the healthcare services are gonna become increasingly constrained. Frameworks and policies are currently in place mostly for individual conditions. So you may find that you might need to go maybe to a neurology clinic um, or perhaps a physiotherapy clinic, but they're on the other side of the ward or hospital that you're at. So perhaps these could be better placed to suit these common pathways. And also multimorbidities, as you can imagine, your quality of life is reduced and increasing Having more multimorbidity means more morbidity, as is in the name. So I guess I, now I'll talk to you a bit about graphs and hypergraphs. Um, excuse me, but I'm going to say hyper a lot. So if you feel free to play a drinking game for every time I say hyper, have a sip. <laughs> so we have a standard graph, which the left side of the screen shows. So you have these nodes, which are the circles. These can be um, an item or a, in this case, a condition, and these connected by the edges, which are the lines. Um, with standard graphs, these can only be connecting two nodes together, so showing a relationship between these two nodes, um, but they can be directed, so you can go from one node to another, or they can just be, have a relationship implied. If we wanna get even more hyperactive, uh, we can have hypergraphs, which can connect more than two nodes together. Uh, these obviously are more computationally expensive as you can have more and more different combinations of edges. You can also have undirected hypergraphs similar to the standard graphs. So there's no arrow, let's say, between two nodes. You just have the relationships implied and you can't rejoin into a node. These are connected by hyper edges. And then we have directed hypergraphs. Um, where you can have nodes incoming and nodes outgoing, <coughs> and you can imply temporality from this. Again, these are more complex, more computationally expensive, um, but are really good for showing directionality, what leads to another condition, for example. Um, and these edges we call hyper arcs. Stay with me, there's quite a lot to remember. Um, we focus in this work on B hypergraphs, so that is, you can have as many nodes going into one node, but there are other hypergraphs. For example, you could have um, one node going into many nodes or as many nodes going into as many nodes, if that makes sense. So we use the SAIL um, Wales Multimorbidity 
E cohort data set to extract the Charleston index conditions um, for hypergraph construction. So this is a population-based hypergraph where everyone's data and conditions are put into one massive hypergraph. Hypergraphs are good to represent multimorbidities because people can have sets of diseases and then go to another disease, for example, and this is better than just having a chain of diseases. In this case, the nodes are the diseases and the hyper edges or the hyper arcs, depending if you've got directionality involved, are the multimorbidity sets, so the sets of conditions that someone has. You can change these hyper edges or hyper arcs so that they um, represent different things. So you could have it so that the prevalence of the conditions or the population location, for example. And you can also look at these hypergraphs and say, uh, how important are these conditions relative to other conditions? What is the centrality? And you can rank individual diseases or disease sets based on this importance. So we uh, also made sort of a website using um, Streamlet. So we made an applet, which you can, you can create fake patients and fake conditions. There's no patient data using this. It's completely randomly generated. But you can um, input the number of patients you want to make a hypergraph from and the number of conditions and build this hypergraph. And this Streamlit app is really useful if you want to get to grips with hypergraphs because it shows you exactly how they're constructed, all the mathematical nonsense behind it and everything like that. We also had a look within the Streamlit app so we can now work out the most likely next disease given um, a set of diseases or a single disease. So for example, you can put your disease in at the top. We note them just by letter, alphabetical letters, so A, B, C, D. Um, and then you can say what disease is next likely to occur given this disease set. And this is based on the hyper arc, the weighting of the hyper arcs. And then when we used the Charleston comorbidity index, we created some plots. So on the left, we've got uh, the page rank plot, which is, again, this importance of the nodes and the diseases. So on the x-axis, you've got the success of page rank, so that is the likelihood of a disease coming after another disease. And on the y-axis, you've got the predecessor page rank, and that is the likelihood of a disease coming before another disease. So for example, to pick out one, we've got CPD at the top left. And because that has a higher predecessor page rank, it's more likely to come before a disease rather than after disease. And similarly, dementia on the sort of bottom right is more likely to come after another disease, which clinically makes sense. Then the other plot we have on the right um, is a predecessor transition matrix. So you can see the probability of going from one disease to another. So you would, your start node is the X axis and the end node is the Y axis. So for example, you can see that the probability of going from CPD to CHF is 0 0.19. And you can look at this pairwise probability. So that was quite a quick talk. But um, if you're interested in the Streamlit applet, feel free to scan with your phones the URL, URL on the screen. Um, we've also got a paper that's on archive at the moment um, by one of the previous interns that's got all the mathematical um, formulas and stuff to help you understand. And there's also another paper coming soon that looks at frailty and the um, electronic frailty index rather than the Charleston comorbidity index. But yeah, that's everything. Thank you for your time. Before you go, we have one more question. Oh, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Where else could hypergraphs be used apart from multimorbidity? Oh, gosh. The, <laughs> Put the you on the spot, sorry. Probabilities are endless, I think. Um, well, obviously, there's things outside of uh, health that you could do. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of if you have anything that has some sort of relationships, a group of relationships that lead to another. Um, so, for example, maybe um, I can't think on the spot. Sorry. One, <laughs> sorry. Um, does this technique quantify the causality of one disease on another? No, there's no uh, causality implied here. It's basically just probabilities at the moment. Um, future work is considering using like directed acyclic graphs to work out 
yeah, is, is there a causal pathway between one condition or another or sets of conditions or another? So to extend that, could it be in the healthcare situation extended from the conditions to the situation? I'm thinking maybe frailty and other comorbidities could lead to nursing home care. Is that something that could be extended to it? Yeah. Continuing yeah. healthcare is the thing I'm thinking about. Okay, yeah. that's good. Wow. Uh, questions are coming in. We've got some time. Um, for calculating likelihood of the next disease, how much weighting was put on the patient demographics such as health status, age, and I'm guessing IMD, deprivation maybe something as well? Okay. Um, so in this hypergraph, we didn't actually use any of those things, uh, any demographics, but it was something we were uh, seriously considering. Um, so at first we focused with adding mortality to our hypergraph so we can predict the probability of uh, someone having mortality at the end of the period of analysis. And then we were also thinking about, as you said, um, putting IMD, age, uh, gender into it as well. Um, so we were thinking about whether, because these are start state nodes, I guess we could call them, there's nothing that goes into them. So they will always be successor conditions. So that means it's quite difficult to work out the um, page rank and importance of these demographics. So it would be difficult to extract exactly what demographics lead to a certain condition, if, if that answers the question. It does, and there's another question, well, it, it sort of adds to it rather than answers it, I guess. Um, how do you think about age in interpreting these hypergraphs? Because some conditions, like dementia, could be a successor, perhaps appears at older ages, is what you were talking about. Yeah, um, yeah, because you're definitely right. Age is definitely gonna affect the chance of having dementia. Um, and when I was talking about having these nodes as the age and stuff, because of the computationally expense of these hypergraphs, you have to worry about like, if you do have age as a node, it's quite difficult to have that as a continuous, well, you can't have it as a continuous variable. You'd have to put it into brackets and say like um, 25 to 40 year olds, 40 to 60, yada, yada. And then by the, the more discreet you make it, the more computer, the computationally expensive the graph is going to be, and then you, you've got slowing, and possibly it might not even converge in time. That's it for the grilling. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, you've really inspired a lot of people to think about that, and we want to see more application of these graphs, so thank you so much for that. I'm going to pass over to our chair to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we just thank Zoe again? Yes, thanks Zoe again, and for the questions. And uh, could we have Richard Wood and Nick Howlett to talk about random forest for near real-time hospital performance metric prediction? Hi, so yeah, I, I'm Nick, and I'm here to talk about some forecasting work that I've done. Um, the, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, so the outline of my talk, uh, I'm going to introduce the problem, set the context of it. Uh, I'll talk about the methods we've used to approach that problem. Uh, I'll go over some results we've got, and then I want to spend a bit of time talking about our particular implementation of that, and then I'm going to talk quickly about the further research we want to do. So what is the problem? Uh, well, this visualization kind of sums it up as simply as possible. Um, you have a time series metric of interest, and you want to know what happens in the next 24 hours. Here I've got accident emergency occupancy, uh, and uh, this kind of is like a classical time series forecasting issue. So why is this important? Well, the urgent care performance in the NHS has been deteriorating recently. Uh, and although we're actually in a really good place uh, getting real, near real-time data feeds, um, that really only gives you an assessment of the performance happening right now. Um, but operational uh, guidance should be informed by the, uh, what's going to happen in the near future. Um, so an example of this might be if you were to be, for, if you were a hospital manager and you were warned about a, a spike in uh, a and &E patients requiring admissions, you could sort of direct your efforts into discharging medically fit patients in order to clear those beds uh, to try and maintain smooth flow through the uh, emergency department. So with that in mind, the objectives were to forecast the next 24 hours uh, of various urgent care metrics. I have some here. There was 11 in total. Um, and with those forecasts, we wanted to appreciate the uncertainty. So we wanted to provide confidence intervals around uh, the central estimate. Um, and then we wanted to make these forecasts on a kind of rolling basis every hour using this near real-time data. 
uh, and then to find a way of implementing it and serving that to people so they can make their operational decisions. I'll move in into the methods. So just to get a bit of context about where I am and what, what I do. So I work for the BNSSG ICB, it's a great acronym. Uh, so that's Bristol, North Somerset, and South Gloucestershire ICB. We're based in, Brist uh, in Bristol, but we kind of serve a million resident population. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, there are three major hospitals. Um, we wanted to serve this solution to all of them. So if you're keeping track, that's 11 metrics and three hospitals. So that's 33 forecasts we're performing every hour. In terms of the data, actually, it's incredibly simple. Um, you can't really get much simpler for, for a time series problem. Um, essentially, it's just time-stamped data with values uh, and a metric ID. So if you're looking to re-implement this, this is all you really need. Uh, so onto the approach. So obviously, forecasting is quite a, you know, a well-established technique, but just measuring the performance of a forecast in a vacuum doesn't really tell you very much. So our approach was to compare it to two other methods. Um, the first one is the baseline. We call it the naive baseline, not because it's bad at performing. Actually, it performs quite well, but because it's quite conceptually simple, which is just to take a six-week rolling average of that value at the same time of day. So an example would be if you wanted to know the value of a metric at 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, you would take the last six Tuesdays at 4 o'clock and average that value. Uh, and then we also compared it to ARIMA, which is the kind of classic approach to, to solving this issue. So using those three methods, we uh, calculate a 24-hour ahead projection, so that's 24 hourly forecasts. Uh, and then we uh, assess the accuracy of those using these metrics, so mean absolute error, root mean squared error, and symmetric mean uh, absolute percentage error. Uh, I won't go into the details of those, but uh, we, we tend to lean towards SMAKE, but we used all three just to be sure that we weren't biasing our results based on any particular metric. So a quick tour about the random forest technique. So the random forests are trained on 18 months of data, but each sample in that training data is just 24 hours. So it's looking at 24 hours of data, and then there are 24 separate models trained at predicting each hour ahead. And then we're sort of stitching that together uh, to form our forecast. We can also utilize the fact that the, um, the random forest provide us with the 100 separate trees, so 100 separate predictions for each, uh, for each hour, and we can use those to construct our confidence intervals. I'll also make mention that, although I said the data goes in, it's just the time series, we are also attaching calendar variables, such as uh, the day of the week and public holidays. So moving to the results, I have a quartet of plots here that's kind of just showing you the kind of overall results um, in, in terms of comparing the techniques. So that all of these are average SMAPE error over sort of different cuts of the data. In the top left, you have a cumulative chart. So this is showing, if you look at the, the blue line, which is our random forest technique, and the green, which is the arima, and the red, which is the baseline, you'll see that the blue is slightly off to the left, which is indicating that overall it's performing better. Um, the next two charts, top right and bottom left, are looking at the dependence on like temporal variables. Uh, we found that there was no clear association with the time of day. As you can see, all those accuracies are pretty much flat across the week. However, there was a dependence, uh, sorry, I said time of day, I meant day of week. There was a dependence with time of day. Uh, you can see that our accuracy has a, well, our error has a minimum at about five in the morning. Uh, and we think this is because the morning rush in uh, emergency departments is probably one of the most predictive seasonal daily effects that, uh, that can be picked up from the data. Uh, this next chart's quite intense, so brace yourself. Uh, it's a lot of information, um, so I'll try and acquaint you with it as quickly as I can. Um, so what we've got here is a grid, and each cell is the average performance for a specific metric for a specific site using a specific technique. We've then blocked that up into sort of a subgrid uh, using the bolder black lines there. So each row is one of our sites, so one of the hospitals, uh, and each column is a particular performance metric. So what I want to bring your eyes' attention to is the, the sort of rightmost column in each sub-column. That is our technique ranked against all the other techniques. And where it's green, it outperformed the other two techniques. And I'm, hopefully it's convincing enough to see that it outperforms in almost all, all cases. The one where there was more contention at the bottom here, Western General Hospital, uh, actually the baseline did overall perform better. Uh, and we believe that's because Western's uh, 
particularly small hospital, uh, and that low valley data wasn't very well suited for the Rand Forest. Um, yeah. So I want to quickly talk a bit about the implementation. So we were quite happy with uh, how the Rand Forest was performing, so we wanted to make sure we could get these uh, results out to people. So we built a Shiny app. This is what the forecast looked like in the Shiny app. I think this is quite a cool display, the way, we, way we've done this. So if you look at the red line, that's the actual data. That's the, the last 48 hours. And you look at the sort of greeny blue line on the right, that's our next 24 hours forecast ahead. But we also include the previous 24 hour forecast that was made exactly 24 hours ago. And we've sort of underlaid that with the last 24 hours of real data. In this way, you can kind of do kind of continuous assessment of the accuracy of, of the method. You can see how well the, the method has been performing uh, sort of lately, and that allows you to sort of take more or less confidence in, in the today's results. So the one in the middle, I promise we didn't cherry pick this, is obviously performing very well, uh, and the one on the right maybe less so, um, but that allows you to sort of make that decision uh, in that context. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on the pipeline, although I'm really proud of the pipeline that we've built here. We've, this is, the data scraped uh, from an API and then pre-processed and stored on SQL, uh, and then the models are all run uh, and the predictions are made every hour, and this is all sequenced and scheduled on a, on a Linux server. It's all in Docker's, it's all very snazzy. Um, and then the way we do it is we sort of host all of the data on a, on a SQL server, and the Shiny app is just taking from that SQL server. So no matter when you refresh the Shiny app, it just pops up with, with whatever the latest prediction was, and there's no kind of delay or lag there. Okay, just moving on to the last slide. So further research. So um, our research now on this is sort of focused on sophistication versus practicality, basically. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing 33 predictions uh, every hour. And so if they just took two minutes, you wouldn't finish it in time. And so we need, it needed to be really scalable and really fast. Um, but we're starting to ask the question now, uh, what if we in included more variables? What if we made the, the models more complicated? Could we make them more accurate? Uh, you know, could we cherry pick certain really important metrics and boost their boost their um, their accuracy? So that's what we're kind of looking at right now. We're trying to discover if the, if the sort of benefit trade off of getting more accuracy for more computational time is, is worth it. Um, so yeah, and uh, we're very happy to collaborate. We've already been collaborating with Cornwall on this. They have an implementation of this technique in, in their system. Um, so I'll end there. I'll link you to a paper that we wrote about this, and I'll give you my email, and thank you for listening. Thank you. We probably have time for one question. There are a few more. Just to remind everybody that we're using the Slack channel to coordinate the questions and to keep this as a conversation, so it'd be lovely if you could check that out too. But is there, um, feeding into the model, you just had some time series, but do you actually have any capacity or way of feeding in calendar events like festivals and holidays and things like this? Yeah, so we attach a sort of Boolean flag for that, basically. We have a, just a single flag for holiday, you know, public holiday. So it, and it, I think there's a, a holidays package in R that, that has these, as, and you can enter your own. So yeah, we have the, there's a variable in, in the model matrix for that. Very succinct, thank you so much. And another round of applause, thank you, and we'll pass over. Okay, next up, could we have uh, Divya, Michael, and Jane to talk about forecasting emergency department admissions? Um, hello. Uh, thank you for being here. So we are going to talk about um, some work we've done forecasting emergency department admissions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about like the background to why we're working on this, um, as well as the kind of the modeling approach we have, and then how um, some of the Python packages that we've used as well in this modeling. Um, my name's Jane, this is Michael. Um, we work for NHS England. Uh, we work as data science analysts. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Don't press this anywhere in particular. Oh, shoot. Right, okay, sorry. So just a little bit then about the background of the tool. So why are we looking to forecast emergency department admissions? Um, so people who are admitted to hospital through um, accident and emergency are a source of unplanned um, uh, admissions to hospital. 
Um, and so being able to provide some information and some intelligence on this um, helps people um, who are on the ground making decisions about staffing um, and beds um, and how to organise things. Um, and this is really important for things like managing winter pressures in hospital, but also for planning things like how much planned care you can deliver. Um, so for things like surgeries and stuff like that, that's going to be affected by how many people you have admitted to your hospital um, through um, emergency departments, so like a non-planned route. Um, so just in terms of what our forecasts look like, um, so we are making quite short-term forecasts. So we make forecasts every day and um, for the next three weeks, so 21 day ahead forecasts. Our forecasts are at um, trust level. Um, so for each trust with a type one um, that has, has an emergency department, um, pretty much all of them we make forecasts for. Um, and sometimes we give a slight breakdown for those as well. Um, the data source that's used is the emergency care data set, um, so it's a patient level data set about people who go to accident emergency, um, and the model is learning for each trust, it's using the emergency care data set to make its forecasts. So we're like making quite a lot of outputs um, because we're forecasting every day for um, lots of trusts. Um, so uh, we need to like disseminate that information and um, so this is the dashboard these are just some screenshots from the dashboard where we put the forecasts and um, you so we have the model fit um, on the left in the blue so that's kind of how historically the models fit so we show that to um, people who are using the dashboard um, and then also we have like the actual data that's filled as the the actual number of admissions that we've had are shown as well. Um, and then to the right in the pink bit, um, these are the forecasts for the next 21 day ahead. Um, and as well as giving a point forecast, and um, we also give um, these kind of range of credible intervals. So uh, we have uh, 95, 80 and 50% um, credible intervals. Um, I suppose to communicate the uncertainty um, in the predictions that we're making um, and so that people can, uh, yeah, like I suppose use the forecasts well. And then this is just another part of the dashboard. So this is communicating to uh, people who are using the dashboard just about the accuracy of the forecast so for historically for that particular trust. So um, this is showing for each of the um, each of the credible intervals the number of actual admissions that fell within those range um, historically. Um, so ideally, an ideal model would show 95% of the actual values and the 95% confidence intervals and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, these were all shown at trust level, so for these ones. I'm going to hand over to Michael now. I'll hope you're better using this. <laughs> cool, thanks very much, Jen. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a bit now just about the background of the model um, and how it, it kind of like works under the hood. Um, so it's a Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, so the Bayesian part of it means that we can incorporate um, some prior information into our predictions. Um, it also means that we can provide um, these confidence intervals. So Bayesian models don't just output single point predictions, like Jane said. They output these like range of values. Um, and this gives users some idea of how kind of confident they should be in the model's predictions. Um, the hierarchical part of the model, so this means that during training, um, information is shared between different trusts and different sites. So th this was chosen um, because a lot of sites and trusts have some data quality issues, so missing values or like um, some data which is like obviously incorrect. Um, and having this hierarchical kind of information sharing um, helps, helps, like, helps with this problem, helps compensate for it. Um, finally, our model uses a component breakdown um, to describe its forecasts. So this means that if a user wants to see what's driving the forecast, like why the model's predicting there's going to be lots of admissions on a certain day, and they can break it down into these components and see why the model is, is doing what it's doing. So I'll talk a bit now about these actual, these five components. So the first is a general trend component. Um, this is meant to take into account long-term trends such as population increases, um, changes in policy or trust changes such as mergers. Uh, there's a weekly seasonality component um, which is meant to take into account changes in weekly behavior. So obviously people are acting different on weekends than they are versus weekdays. Um, which is going to have um, going to have a knock-on effect in, in the number of people being admitted. Uh, there's a yearly seasonality component, which does the same thing, just on a yearly basis. So taking into account things like holidays um, or even pollen, for example, um, which can you know make chest conditions worse. 
Um, there's also a bank holiday component. So we know just from looking at the data that bank holidays generally have quite a big impact um, on the number of people being admitted. Uh, generally, there's a decreased number of admissions in those days. Um, so the model is made aware of that and factors it into its predictions. Um, there's also a weather component. So this component is meant to capture the impact of temperature um, on, on admissions. So yeah, if it's nice weather, people are going to be outside you know, playing sports, stuff like that could lead to an increase in injuries and vice versa, very cold weather could lead to, um, you know, people with chest conditions or like respiratory conditions um, could be aggravated by that. So on the front end of the model, um, if a user wants to see the contribution of one of these components to the forecast, um, they, can, they can have a look at it. So in this case, this is the weekly seasonality component um, for Backpool Teaching Hospital. So on the x-axis, there's the days of the week, and on the y-axis, there's the effect on admissions of that particular day. So in this case, Sunday, on the far left, would have the um, lowest admissions generally, with 16% uh, less than expected, and vice versa, Wednesday would have the highest admissions, uh, generally with 8% more than expected. Um, and they can like, look at similar kind of breakdowns for the trends and the weather, et cetera. So um, I'm gonna talk a bit now just about how we actually implemented this and what kind of like tech we're using. Um, so there's two key libraries we use. Um, so NumPyro is a library for Bayesian modeling um, and general probabilistic programming. So the model is trained using a Markov chain Monte Carlo method, um, which is implemented in NumPyro. Um, it's, it's a really cool package. I'd recommend checking it out if you're interested in doing any, any similar work. Um, and then to analyze the results of this, of this, um, of this Monte Carlo algorithm, we use a library called Arviz um, for visualization and for monitoring. So on the right here, there's some like prior versus posterior plots and some trace plots and things, um, which you might be familiar with if you've ever done Bayesian modeling before. But these are the two kind of main, main libraries in the back end that we use. Um, in terms of like how the model actually functions and how information flows in it, uh, we use two main services, so Foundry and Databricks. So on the left side, all the training data, the a and &E data and the weather data, um, and all the information on different organizations like trusts and site structures um, is all stored on Foundry. So when the model is run, this data is pulled onto Databricks. Um, it's fed into the model. The model produces some forecasts. Um, every morning we have a QA process where we just do like a quick visual inspection of the forecasts to make sure they're reasonable, they're not doing anything crazy. Um, if, we, if they're all good, then they're uploaded back onto Foundry um, where the users can access them on the front end then. Um, so throughout the project, um, we've tried to follow uh, the best practices of, 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 of DevOps um, and, and, and MLOps. So these include things like properly packaging um, all your code, um, making sure all your pipelines are fully automated for deployment and testing, um, and just generally trying to make everything as, 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 as kind of like replicable as possible. Um, so yeah, this means that we can develop the model while simultaneously running it in production every day. Um, so just a final slide here on the general impact of the model. So at the moment, we're forecasting for 120 trusts um, across all seven regions of England. Um, we have over 1,200 active users um, across a different range of disciplines. Um, and in addition to providing these forecasts, we also give um, trusts some kind of incentive to increase their their general data quality, because better data quality will lead to better forecasts. So yeah, that's um, everything. If you want to hear more, then there's our emails to contact. Um, or if you want to talk to us in the break, feel free. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, we have a flurry of comments and questions oh. in the Slack. It'd be really great if you could pick some of those up because there's some really interesting things in there. Uh, but we're gonna have to move on, I'm so sorry. Thanks. But really, do join us, keep the conversation going because there's a lot of people who are very interested in your work. It seems so short to see it, but uh, we appreciate <laughs> it. I'm gonna pass over to the next person. Um, my name's uh, Daniel Wyand. I'm a um, consultant medical microbiologist at uh, Newcastle upon Tyne Hospitals Trust. 
and um, I'm giving you a talk on parameterized reporting using R. And I was going to use my own laptop to present my slides. Uh, you can use the clicker. Or I can use the clicker. OK. <laughs> I'll use the clicker. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I've come a couple of years in a row now to this uh, conference, and um, it's definitely one of the better ones I come to. Um, uh, I'm a clinician who codes, um, and um, the first speaker was talking about um, having to learn how to use Quarto, and um, through learning how to use Quarto, I've been able to do quite a bit of stuff that I just wouldn't have been able to do without it, yeah. and um, hopefully um, this uh, talk is useful to you. Um, working um, for the NHS and um, with the NHS around um, uh, the country to um, see how we can use Quarto to help automate some processes that just would be really, really, really difficult to do manually, uh, so they just wouldn't happen in real life. Um, so I work um, predominantly at the Freeman Hospital uh, in Newcastle. There's two large hospitals uh, in the Trust. Uh, there's also the uh, Royal, Vic Royal Victoria, uh, Vic well, Victorian family, and um, I work uh, in medical microbiology, so I, I specialize in infectious diseases. Uh, there's um, uh, just under 100 staff members. We um, work through uh, over a million samples uh, a year, and there's um, a budget of uh, six million uh, per year. But there's not really data scientists working in our um, department at the moment, uh, although that is changing as a result of the work that we're doing here, which is justifying um, the uh, expenditure on, um, on data science uh, capability in our department. Um, so what I love about Quarto is um, that uh, it's able to deal with um, ever-expanding data sets. Um, when people ask for just one more analysis, uh, then um, it's often a case of just amending the code slightly rather than starting from scratch. Um, and uh, producing reports is almost entirely what Quarto is there to do. Uh, so producing summaries and summaries of summaries and summaries of summaries of summaries is no problem. Um, and uh, what I find great about Quarto is that it also avoids us getting stuck. Um, so often projects become so big that eventually they fail. Um, and uh, Quarto um, helps avoid that by essentially allowing you to produce a pipeline of um, data um, analysis, interpretation, uh, publication of the results, um, and um, that's replicable, um, it's reproducible, um, and that's something that uh, is pretty new to the NHS, really. Um, so the challenge that I'm describing to you here is that um, as a medical microbiologist, we are sat on absolutely loads of data, um, and uh, we use that data historically to, for example, write antibiotic guidelines to tell us how to treat patients in the NHS. But um, realistically, that data was mainly just sat, um, stored on uh, largely ancient computer systems um, and wasn't really being analyzed effectively to help um, us actually uh, gain many insights into how we should be writing our guidelines. So the task uh, using Quarto is to generate custom antimicrobial resistance reports. Um, but we want to stratify that uh, for the whole hospital. We don't just want it once. Um, we want to repeat that. And we want to repeat it for each hospital in the trust. We want to repeat it for every directorate. We want to report, uh, repeat it for every uh, ward. We want to repeat it for all age groups. Um, because as soon as you start publishing this data, people have questions about their own specific cohorts uh, of patients. And um, you don't just want to report uh, this kind of data once, you want to report it uh, as regularly as possible. Um, so uh, now I share antimicrobial resistance reports for all of those um, stratifications uh, every quarter. Um, and uh, at the beginning, when I thought about how to do this, um, without Quarto, I wouldn't have known uh, where to go next. But with Quarto, it's manageable. So, in the beginning of this uh, presentation, I'll just go through what a parameterized report is and um, how to write one. Um, and I just want to give a bit of kudos to uh, J.D. Ryan, who gave a talk at this year's um, our conference in America. Um, and I've basically stolen her slides here. This is one of the benefits of R as well, because you can just take their code and then you've got their slides. Um, but um, essentially, uh, 
to produce a parameterized report, you have to have an object uh, called a params, and uh, you have to um, tell uh, R what the parameter is by which you're stratifying your data. And then for each one of those params, you can produce a report. So here, J.D. Ryan is talking about um, a parameterized report where each quarto file um, or rather output file includes data for a particular year uh, from 2019 to 2023. So that's actually kind of what I wanted to do, um, but I wanted to parameterize by, by other variables. Um, if you do want to um, see the um, R code that JD Ryan produces, then she has published that on her GitHub page. And there's also uh, a colleague, uh, Megan Hall, who wrote an excellent uh, blog post on um, how to produce parameterized reports. And again, she's shared her code on GitHub. Um, so um, I definitely recommend having a look at what they've got there. Um, and uh, I've myself produced a reproducible example of producing parameterized reports using Quarto using the NYC Flights 13 data set. Um, and I gave a talk about three weeks ago as part of this conference uh, online as a webinar um, uh, where I've shared the code on how to, how to do it without actually giving you my data from my laboratory because I couldn't do that. So I had to use a um, data set that is freely available. So I just used the NYC Flights uh, 13 data set there. And if you uh, want to check out how it's done, then this is the way that I've done it and uh, how Megan Hall does it as well. So we start with um, uh, project setup. So um, first, we need to specify what the parameters are by which uh, we want to stratify the data in the YAML. Um, then we want to wrangle the data sets into params. Um, and we want to specify what the parameters are by which the report has been stratified in the actual body of the report, because otherwise each report will have the same um, narrative, which isn't quite right because the narrative is dependent on the parameters that you've um, stratified your data by. Um, and then uh, I also use an R script to execute um, the production of parameterized reports using Quarto, and I'll come back to that a bit later as to why I do that. And then um, inline code is really, really handy. So when you're writing a Quarto file, um, then it's possible to uh, obviously produce um, figures and cha charts and tables uh, depending on the data, but you can actually change the narrative of the, um, of the report itself. Uh, so the actual body of the report can, can um, depend on what the parameters are that you've stratified your data by. So um, in the YAML, um, then as per usual, you would have your, uh, your name, project title, and so on. Um, you could set what format you want your report in, uh, which is one of the other benefits of Quarto. So not only does it let you code in R and Python and other languages, but you can actually produce the um, report in lots of different um, formats as well. So these slides were produced using Quarto. And um, then we want to set in the YAML the parameters by which the data has been stratified. So here I'm giving you an example of the NYC Flights 13 data set. So we've um, stratified the data by uh, origin, destination, and I can't read it from here, month. There you go. Um, so, um, and then after that, you just write the content of your report. Um, but you also need to wrangle your data into params. Um, that's done um, by um, essentially copying the code that Megan Hall produced. Um, and here I've um, produced a param for the origin field in or column in, in the NYC 13 uh, flights data set. Um, so you want to load your packages first, then wrangle your things into parameters, and then uh, you can undertake additional wrangling steps uh, if necessary after wrangling your data into parameters. And again, you can write your, write your content after that. And then in the actual body of the report, you can specify what your parameters are as well. So here um, we can see that um, with this line of code here within the body of the report, we can say which um, origin airport the data relates to. Um, I'm clicking. Uh, here we can see which destination it relates to, and here we can see which month it relates to. 
So um, yeah, it's really, really important in the body of the report to say actually what the data is that's been included for the analysis. And then inline code is great because it helps strengthen the narrative um, of the report. Um, so for example, um, we can um, use inline code to state the number of observations in the data set uh, after stratification. So that line of code there uh, tells us how many uh, rows of data there are in our data set. Um, and that number has been generated using the inline code. Um, so when it comes to rendering reports, there's a few different options, um, starting from basic to more complicated, but the more complicated option I tend to find more useful because it automates the production of um, parameterized reports. So um, the easiest step is to just render the report using the uh, YAML that I showed you before and just amending that to include only the variables that you're interested in. Um, the second option is to um, uh, type out what the variable is that you're interested in parameterizing by in the terminal, uh, which I find a bit tricky, uh, and it reminds me of MS-DOS from the 1990s. Um, and then um, there's also the option of just um, leveraging the, the quarter render function of quarter itself uh, to produce the reports, which is my preferred uh, option. So if you want to render your report using the YAML, then it's just a case of, in the YAML, changing the parameter name to something that is in the data set. So if you want to, for example, uh, look for the uh, flights data set at only flights uh, leaving from JFK airport, then you just specify JFK in the parameters there. And then you um, end up with a report focused on JFK airport. Um, and if you want to produce it in the terminal, then you have to write a series of different lines of code, as you can see here. Um, and um, you don't have to write all of those lines of code individually, but I'm just um, showing that there's several different steps to it. So you um, have to write quarter render, and then give the name of the file, and then um, hyphen p, and then give the name of the um, parameter by which you're um, stratifying your data. Um, so that, to me, is a little, a little bit prone to typos. Um, so I did try doing it like that, but actually uh, my preferred method is uh, rendering using the quarter render function. So you um, create a function um, that produces, uh, I've named it the run params function uh, because that's what Megan Hall calls it. And um, you specify what the file is that you're parameterizing. Um, then you say what the output format is that we want to produce. Um, then you um, specify the parameter of interest. So in this case, the, uh, the origin airport. And then interestingly here, it lets you uh, state what the name is of the output file that you're producing, which is really helpful because if you're producing lots and lots and lots of reports that have been parameterized by different things, then you just automatically want um, Quarto to, to name the output file in a way that's sensible so that when you want to share that file in future, you don't have to look at the actual content of the file to share it um, to make sure that it's the right one. You just want to look at the file name, so the metadata of the, file, of, of the, of the report. And um, so here, uh, we're saying that we're telling um, Quarto to um, name the uh, file by the origin airport that the data relates to. Um, and you can just run a single report using um, this line of code, so you could just still specify that you only want JFK data, but actually if you want um, one file for each one of the three airports in New York, then you just run this uh, code um, using the per map function, and um, then it produces um, uh, one report for each of the origin airports, and it names the file for you as well. And then that makes it easy to share that sort of um, uh, data with, with colleagues. So, um, that was the theory using the flights data set. And um, when we, in practice, um, apply that in real life on some um, antimicrobial resistance data, then um, I've used a few other packages to do that. So that's kind of the other half of this talk uh, that I want to tell you about and also anyone who's watching. Um, so there's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant package uh, produced uh, by a colleague in the Netherlands um, called the AMR package for R. And it just makes life so easy to analyze historical trends in antimicrobial resistance and also predict future trends in resistance. Um, so I used that package to interrogate, uh, sorry, to analyze data um, 
taken from the laboratory information management system um, from 2019 to the present day, every quarter. Um, I analyzed uh, the data using the, uh, as I say, the MR package. Um, it uh, cleverly du duplicates data, which is really important uh, so that um, individual patients who maybe have 40 or 50 blood cultures don't um, skew the data. Um, it helps um, calculate and visualize historical antimicrobial resistance rates, and it helps um, produce regression models to predict future antimicrobial resistance rates. Um, so uh, other key packages that um, I've used to produce the parameterized reports that I've made is the NHSR plot the dots package, which is brilliant um, because it um, shows um, uh, where there's outliers in the data that may be of interest to us um, to look into retrospectively in order to see whether there's something uh, odd going on, rather than just visualizing, visualizing a trend line or um, a rag rating, then it actually kind of highlights variation in, in, the, uh, in the data using SPC principles. And then um, I've also produced um, uh, reports using um, survival analysis using these two packages here, um, because uh, what happens is that you produce a port in antimicrobial resistance, and then people ask, well, what does that mean for uh, mortality for our patient groups? And then you add that to the report as well. And the report just gets longer and longer and longer. Um, but actually, making it longer and longer and longer using Quarto isn't too much of an issue because you just produce um, more lines of code that you add to the report, and then it gives people what they want and what they're asking for. Um, and then again, you just parameterize that, and you share, that uh, share the data for, 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 um, for colleagues to, to use how, how, however they wish. So um, since quarter one, 2019, uh, we've looked at um, over 10,000 uh, distinct blood cultures uh, from over 7,000 distinct patients, uh, leading to the isolation of 13,000 uh, different um, organisms from those um, uh, more than 7,000 patients. And when we, in the laboratory, um, test um, organisms for the susceptibility to different antimicrobials, then we can test anywhere between 6 to 18, maybe sometimes 24 and different antim antimicrobials for each organism. So you end up with a lot of data, uh, which is kind of why um, I have concerns about using um, shiny apps to produce dashboards to analyze this sort of data, because by the time you stratify your data by like sev several different variables and then have 20 different antimicrobials to look at, the quarter dashboard would become really, really, really rabbit holey. Um, so that's kind of why uh, I've produced parameterized reports rather than dashboards to share this data, because it gets around the issue of having to click a lot to get into the actual insights of the data. So um, if you've used the NHSR plot the dots package, then you'll be familiar with this sort of uh, appearance of the data. Um, this is a, uh, a chart showing uh, the number of bactremias um, that we saw over time since 2019. You can see that there was a significant dip in the number of bloodstream infections during COVID when people weren't being admitted. Um, and then there was um, a more recent rise in the number of bloodstream infections. And um, the data uh, that we've got now makes us wonder whether uh, the number of bloodstream infections might be rising because of increases in, in, in antimicrobial resistance and um, the lesser efficacy of um, the antimicrobials that we're using empirically, which has made us look at the antibiotic guidelines to amend them to make sure the patients are being treated with more appropriate antibiotics based on our local resistance patterns in Newcastle. So can you the yes. Um, so as I say, uh, there's survival analysis data as well, and antimicrobial resistance data can be shared with colleagues. Um, as we can see in the top line, there's tazosin resistance rates that are rising, but um, the AMR package lets us predict what will happen in the future. So here we have predicted um, what uh, the resistance rates are for each of the different antimicrobials that we commonly test for uh, gram-negative organisms. Um, and and then when we parameterize that data, we can, um, for example, see that there's differences in antimicrobial resistance between different hospitals in one trust. Um, this is the sort of insight that just would be impossible without um, using data science tools. We can also see that there's significant differences by different wards um, and different directorates. So resistance rates are much higher in the hemonc population than in the general population. We can see that um, some wards have much higher resistance rates. So again, in Hemonc and the ITUs that look after Hemonc patients, we see much higher resistance rates. 
Um, and uh, we can see that in certain age ranges, um, resistance rates are also rising uh, more significantly. And this data is shared in the form of um, HTML files, which I um, share with colleagues across the trust, um, which is also stored in our um, trust OneDrive uh, for colleagues to, to, to look at and um, make their decision making. And the last slide um, here, I just wanted to stress quite how important this sort of work is to justify increased expenditure on uh, data science and increased resources in, uh, of, of data science. Um, so um, the trust has become really, really keen on using R and Python and GitHub to uh, undertake work. And um, now we're increasing our data science capability as well by training people through the ONS data science graduate program. And we've uh, recruited um, a new uh, data scientist to the directorate as well. So um, if you uh, want to see the code that I use to produce parameterized reports, then there's the QR code there. And thank you very much for listening. Hi, everyone. I am, so this is a, a research collaboration with uh, Dr. Rosenberg from the US National Cancer Institute. I am Ferran. I'm working in the university in UCL in the Clinical Operational Research Unit. And we, together with clinicians and patients, patient representatives and families, we do, I'm working on congenital heart disease uh, research. As part of this research, we look at mortality after a procedure, which is ASD closure, atrial septal defect closure. And we investigated um, in this plot, what, um, what we looked at is uh, at what happens after the repair of this, of this defect um, for patients uh, during a follow-up of up to 20 years. And what happens with the, uh, the data is that, well, it's, I have to say it's surgical repair. So most, most of the repairs are transcatheter and have low mortality it's, uh, to avoid uh, alarming in the population. This is what happens after surgical repairs. And uh, after some years of, uh, after the repair, what happens is we can either have data on the patients and we know whether they are alive or dead or we lost inform the information on the patient and we don't no longer know what happens to the patient. That's what we call uh, right censoring of, the, the, of the, the data. And when the data is right censoring, so for instance, uh, uh, here at 16 years, we know that 131 patients still are alive, but it doesn't mean that 400 and something patients died because we started with more than 500 it means that we lost the information on, on many of those. And that's why it's important to provide the numbers at risk, which is how many patients we have information about at each time point, okay? And so using, when you have sensor data, you have to use some survival analysis technique to estimate the probability of mortality for, for this cohort. And one of the techniques is Kaplan-Meier, that gives you the average uh, cumulative mortality. How many of you know Kaplan-Meier? Please, can you raise your hand before the coffee break? Thank you very much. Because I'm going to say another method. Another possible method is going to come later. But what happens, we were not happy with Kaplan-Meier because uh, when, when we looked at the curve, we saw that there were some, some peaks, some, some bumps uh, in mortality. But we could not decide whether this were significant or not because there's a huge confidence, uh, so uncertainty, a huge confidence interval around the results. So we didn't know whether, um, we, we could not tell uh, it is mm, safe to have the repair and mortality is just at the start, or there is some, something that's going to happen to patients after 10 years, for instance. So there is another technique which is Another thing we can look at, usually we look at in papers, is the 
uh, Nielsen Allen uh, cumulative hazard. So the cumulative uh, risk of mortality. But what happens with this estimate? How many of you know the Nelson Allen cumulative hazard, please? Wow, I, I would expect some hand at least. All right, uh, yeah, thank you very much, that's nice. So, some, some other nerds in the, in the, the room. So, the, the, this has the same problem, because in fact it's just a transformation. It's a still cumulative uh, risk, it's cumulative mortality, cumulative hazard. And it has the same problem. We have the same, we observe the same peaks in another scale, it's a, another scale, but there's a huge uncertainty. And we cannot resolve what's happening to patients. So, I made some research. Uh, there is also the possibility of estimating the, um, the hazard, not the cumulative hazard, but the actual hazard, using uh, parameterization. So you assume the mortality follows a weevil, a negative binomial, uh, something, some distribution. But then what you get is a smooth curve, a very nice, but a smooth curve. And you will not observe any, you will not explain these peaks. And I found out this, I found this, this method, which no one is going to know, I guess. If anyone knows, please raise your hand. Rosenberg, okay. So this method from, by Rosenberg, which consists in estimating the actual hazard using these planes. And if in this example, what we can see is that if we plot uh, the, the actual risk of mortality, the actual hazard, uh, along these years after repair, we see that there's the highest mortality is at the start during the repair, uh, the period operative mortality. And then uh, there is um, the mortality risk is hazard is below 1% and it increases after eight years and it stays then uh, more or less around the 1%. That's the hazard. And that is a, a much nicer explanation. And, and I'm saying this, this, this explanation taking into account also the uncertainty. The, there's an uncertainty estimated in the hazard. So we found this very, I found this really interesting to be able to, to, to look at things, and to, to look at the hazard and because it is directly, because it explains, it allows me to look at trends in mortality. And uh, this method by Rosenberg turns out to be using uh, a maximum likelihood estimation, with, which essentially is important for us because we don't lose the good properties of the Kaplan-Meier. So the Kaplan-Meier has some good asymptotic properties that are uh, preserved if, you, if we use this method because it's maximum likelihood estimation. The issue is that when I look at the publication from 1995 by Rosenberg, it is uh, not the software is the method is not available, and the software that he was using was implemented in Bad Lab. And then we worked together uh, in this project, which is what I wanted to present in estimating in the hazard using these planes uh, using R. We we are cre we have created a, an R package, which allows to do this estimation and also allows to simulate data which we use for, for validating the method. I wanted just to, not just to, to do, I wanted to talk a bit about the details, but we, I guess we don't have much time. But uh, just to say that for doing this, I had to refresh what is, how to develop a package and I used uh, tools that that uh, you possibly already know. And I found for, for dealing with these splines in R, I found very interesting the splines to package. So if any, at any time you have this need to estimate functions non-parametrically, the splines to package is very good. And one problem that I encountered that I'm, I'm throwing in, uh, to you in case anyone can help, is the, that there was no equivalent to, in R, I found no equivalent to the, to the function f min con in MATLAB, which allows to do constraint optimization, optimization with constraints. So it's like a black box where you put the, the function and then you get a solution. And it uses seven, multiple methods. Instead, what we have in R is multiple methods. And so what I did was, uh, 
run for, for different methods, mostly from the stats package, and take the best solution from that given, given from any of these methods. I hope uh, someone can give me a, a better solver. <laughs> and if not, it's all right. We, for the time being, it's a good solution. And just to conclude, uh, what we would like to do next is improve uh, a bit the, the coding. I'm going to attend, a, there's a webinar, I think, on, on package maintenance, our package. I, I really need it. I need to know more about how to do an R package. And then uh, we will work on, on develop further applications. And also, we intend to share it uh, properly in CRAN or, or some similar platform. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thanks very much. So uh, there's no time for questions, unfortunately. But thanks to uh, Ben for chairing this morning and to all the speakers so far and to all the questions on Slack. So it's now time for a coffee. We're back at 25 past 11. Just while you're having your coffee, we are planning an unconference tomorrow. Um, we'll be saying more about that uh, just after lunch. Uh, but basically, it, we're going to be talking about ideas that you generate tomorrow. So look out um, for Pavel. Pa Pavel, can you just put your hand up? So this person here is organizing it. So just in the coffee room, there'll be somewhere to put. So if there's something you want to talk about tomorrow in a kind of mini workshop type format, just jot it down. Uh, it's in by the coffee. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk more about the encore later on. So just have a look out for that. OK, thanks. Back at 25 past 11. Thank you. Right, OK, thank you very much. Thank you, back. So uh, we have Tom chairing the next session. So I'll now hand over to Tom. Thank you. Hello. So hopefully we're all um, feeling a bit refreshed now. Um, up next, we have Robin. Um, I feel like he, sh he should need no introduction. I I've used so many of his packages being a, a massive map nerd. Um, so it's great to welcome onto the stage. So over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Tom. And uh, first thing to say is, you know you're in good company when uh, before, the before the session starts, you end up having a, a short conversation about what distribution of Linux you use. So <laughs> thanks for that, Tom. I know I'm in good company here with map nerds and data scientists and uh, many other people interested in technology for social benefit. Um, so, yeah, my name's Robin. For people who don't know my work, and um, a few R packages, and, and I'd say that these aren't fundamental R packages on which I've built. I've just built a few things on top of um, much more fundamental packages like SF. Could you put your hands up if you know what SF is? Keep your hands up if you actually use SF on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah? So there's some SF users in the room. That's great. And by the way, I'm going to try and make it a bit interactive. So I might even get people standing up, seeing as we're talking about active travel. Um, but let's see how we go. Um, but yeah, as, um, as Tom said, my name's Robin. Um, I am here with my active travel England hat on. So uh, another quick check-in, because I know from the bus journey in that not everyone knows what Active Travel England actually is. When you work somewhere, you assume that everyone knows what it is. But could you put your hands up if you do know what Active Travel England is? Very low numbers. This is disappointing. Uh, put your hands up if you don't, just to get a response rate. OK, right. So I'm going to have to explain a bit about Active Travel England. So ATE, as we affectionately call it um, in the organization, is a government, independent government organization that was essentially split out from the Department for Transport. And I think right here at the NHS, our Python conference is a great place to be talking about Active Travel England because one of the reasons why it was created is because active travel is it's cross departmental. So um, it probably fits best in the transport box. So we'll put it in the, the walking and cycling people. We'll put them in the, the Department for Transport. But of course, active travel is so much more than just um, getting around. It interacts with the health service a huge amount, especially with the increased interest and use of social prescription. So rather than prescribing a course of antibiotics or other um, drugs, you can um, recommend people um, do uh, a bit more active travel. So there's a clear link with um, 
health on that aspect, but active travel also affects and is affected by the planning system, so DLUC, so, um, and there's this long list of other um, actors in the space that active travel interacts with. So in essence, Active Travel England is the national uh, independent body for active travel in England, and we also have links um, in Scotland and Wales, and we aim to create the evidence base and do the things that are needed to be done to make sure that we hit the government's target for active travel, which is um, essentially for 50% of short trips in towns and cities to be made by um, active modes, at least in part. So that's what active travel is. And I'm gonna um, kind of touch on what we actually do, what that actually means day to day as it relates to data science in a, in a future slide. Um, but um, by, by way of introduction to myself, how I ended up as head of data science in Active Travel England, um, it's been quite a long and interesting journey uh, to get into this role. And it is actually only a part-time role because I'm still part-time uh, associate professor of transport data science at the University of Leeds. Um, so it's very interesting doing this as a kind of part-time and having my academic hat on and my Active Travel England hat on. And as I say, I'm here with my Active Travel England hat on, and this is a perfect time to be talking about this because we do actually have some links with um, NHS and we have a potential project where we will be working with colleagues in, in uh, NHS England that I can touch on. Um, and I could say a lot about how I, how I ended up in, in this role, but I think a really good way to start is going back to what Brian Taran said in the first talk, which was um, he ended up, his talk was based on this question from his boss of being asked to build a website. So the same applies to me, except in my case, this was in early 2015, I was asked to build a web application. So I was very fresh out of uh, university at the stage, and basically I realized that I had a lot of learning to do. So I really empathized with what Brian was talking about in terms of, I don't know what I'm doing, and I really need to upskill. So up until that point, I'd been writing, I would say, ad hoc R scripts for my research, for my uh, PhD at the University of Sheffield. But suddenly I found myself in the situation of being the lead developer for a national, uh, for a national web application. So um, yeah, I, just as another show of hands, who's heard of, and this is not the NHS use of the word, but um, the active travel use of the word, Who's heard of the PCT and not primary care trusts? Anyone heard of the PCT? Okay, zero. So that, that's interesting. And it shows that, that um, often when I do these talks, like you get over half the people putting their, their hands up. So that's really great to see the, the difference in audience. So the PCT is the propensity to cycle tool. And that's a DFT funded tool. And it's actually the number one tool used by uh, local authorities, um, to plan strategic cycle networks. And it does link to health because we estimate potential health benefits in the, in the PCT. And I should probably stop calling it that because it's gonna get confused with primary health, health trusts. So that's the, the propensity to cycle tool. In any case, that, um, that role and that responsibility really made me realize that I needed to up my game in terms of my programming, and suddenly it wasn't the case that I could write a script and run it once, maybe twice, and hope it would work. It needed to run and be reliable because hundreds of people were going to use the results. And that led me on a bit of an R journey where I signed up to some advanced R training courses um, at the University of Newcastle led by Colin Gillespie, who's a statistician and um, excellent R tutor and contributor. And I just started to take the um, programming side of it seriously. And it, in the process of building this web application and building the back end, I guess, I realized that it would be very useful not just to write one-off scripts, but to start writing functions. So 
at one point we needed to calculate routes between A and B. And rather than just write that into the script, it helped to write a function. And then I realized that potentially this could be useful for other people. So I packaged it up. And eventually, that became my first R package, which is SD Planner. And seeing as Tom seems to think that lots of people are using the, the, this stuff, has anyone heard of SD Planner other than Tom? Or does anyone use it? Hands up? Nope. OK. <laughs> so um, that, that's a, a, a brief story of how I got here and how I got into R. But I should probably um, move on with the, the rest of the talk. So yeah, um, that's, that's a brief introduction um, to myself. So um, moving rapidly onwards, um, I have added a couple of slides on the health impacts of active travel. Um, I added these a bit late in the day because I assume it's obvious to, to everyone, but I just wanted to pull out a couple of um, fairly recent bits of research that I think show the huge impact that active travel can have on health. And it's my understanding that if this was like a new uh, therapeutic intervention, it would be seen as like quite game changing. So um, this is a big study of 250,000 people, uh, part of the UK Biobank study, and they did a follow up uh, on average of five years after. And they just looked at the effect size of do you walk or cycle to work? And they found this huge impact on all cause mortality. And I, I tried to find um, comparator figures for um, other types of intervention, non-active travel, but I couldn't find them. But I think if you were to treat this as a drug, then it would be quite a game changer. So that's one piece of research that came out in 2017. And I think it should have been, at the time, headline news, because it's like, this is, we, we can um, get a massive reduction in our chance of death um, based on, on this large data set. So that's impact on all-cause mortality, and they specifically looked at, at, at a few diseases as well. Um, but active travel has all of these co-benefits as well. So uh, just 10 days ago, uh, this, there was a new paper on the health impacts of active travel published, and that looked more at the kind of mental health side of things. So um, this study actually got a fair amount of press coverage. So I've just pulled out one example from the Telegraph. Um, and you don't need to read the headline. But basically, um, this was a really interesting study where they did a randomized trial based on a fairly small number of people where they randomized um, the people who all had the same symptoms and uh, prescribed the standard um, drugs at the time to one group. And then the other randomly selected group, they asked them to go for regular runs in a, in a group. And what I find fascinating about the results is that um, both types of intervention um, had this positive impact in terms of the mental health outcomes. So you can see that these two plots at the top are broadly the same. But um, they also looked at the physical health impacts as well. And they found that. Um, in some cases, some of the physical uh, health outcomes showed a, a, a decline, so a worsening uh, when they had the, I guess, drug-based intervention, whereas um, the physical health outcomes um, showed um, statistically significant improvement um, from the more active travel-based intervention. And that was just 10 days ago that that paper dropped and was published. And it, it, it did actually happily get substantial press coverage. Again, it was nowhere near headline news. But I wish stuff like this had more um, public awareness, because the, the numbers behind it are really solid. And it just shows that the although we know that there's strong evidence, it keeps improving all of the time. And I thought it'd be worth uh, just commenting on this. This isn't my field. This is your field. And I think there's a lot that we can learn in um, transport research and other areas from these very rigorous type of uh, epidemiological and uh, medical intervention trials and the statistical analysis of the data that results from those kind of um, that kind of research. So that's a bit of an introduction into the health impacts of active travel. So um, that certainly shows the relevance and 
these two papers kind of imply that active travel can be seen as a health intervention. It's not just a transport intervention. It's actually can be seen as a health intervention that is more focused on preventative rather than palliative um, care. So intervening before people get ill, uh, which can be highly cost effective. So um, moving on to active travel England, I think that's, that's the context in which we're operating from the health perspective. This is quite a big slide and I know from uh, sitting towards the back that not everyone will be able to see every part of it, but um, in a nutshell, there are various boxes in there that, that show what we do as Active Travel England. So in terms of who we are, which is the boxes on, on the right, this broadly shows that we've got three types of people in Active Travel England. So we have a, a lead data engineer, Beck, who is um, focused on getting our data into good shape and um, making it usable, not just for the uh, data and digital team, but across the whole organization. Um, we have digital um, tool focused people. So we have three developers. And then we also have this really interesting link with the Alan Turing Institute, which has been mentioned already at this, this conference. And then we have the data science side. And it's a fairly small, but I would say very agile team uh, working in this space to try and improve the evidence base around active travel. And obviously, these are really big areas, so we can't tackle all of it all, of, all at once. So um, over the last few months, we've, we've done some triaging to basically prioritize in, in this broad spectrum of stuff that we could be looking at. And a good way of looking at the, the context in which we're operating is there are definitely data gaps and there are um, bits of data that you simply can't collect, but there's bits of data that are available. Um, and that's the overlap between the data gaps and the collectible data. And then there's policy needs. And basically we're trying to focus on this sweet spot uh, between policy needs, collectible data and data gaps. And um, in terms of active travel data, what does it look like? Well, um, there's basically three broad categories. There's infrastructure data, which basically is related to the interventions, but especially, quote, hard interventions, where you actually change the physical infrastructure by building a new crossing, for example, implementing a new speed limit, or just putting in some kind of traffic calming. Um, you've got behavior data, which is stuff like the National Travel Survey, and then you've got outcome data, which is, I guess, um, of the type represented in the first slides, which showed these kind of health outcomes, but there's also economic outcomes and many other types of outcome. And we identified that of those three, the one highlighted in green, infrastructure data, is probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of the fact that there's not much data in just in terms of where those interventions are. And to make a health analogy, if you imagine a hospital where loads of interventions, you're making loads of changes constantly um, to um, the environment and also the prescriptions that people are receiving, but you're not taking any record of it. You don't know what's changing. That would be crazy. And uh, to some extent, um, that's the situation on the street infrastructure that we find outside. Like often local authorities themselves don't have good records of when they made a particular change, like a change in speed limit. So we actually need to go right back to this foundation of what's changing on the infrastructure. So um, obviously we're doing things um, on all of these and at the moment we're shifting quite a lot to the health outcomes. And if anyone's really interested in this, there are ways of quantifying um, the health benefits. So um, the international standard that's most commonly used is called HEAT and that's developed by the World Health Organization. Um, in the UK, the DFT has developed guidance that is encapsulated within something called AMAT and that's the active modes appraisal tool. And I'm not gonna ask if anyone's heard of that because I'm assuming not, but feel free to uh, put your hands up. But um, the, the point is that a lot of these tools are not really done in collaboration with health researchers. They're kind of at the fringes of health and it's like health economists. And I think um, given how quickly the evidence base is still emerging, as I showed in the first two slides, I think there's a lot of scope for improving the estimates and really being a lot more detailed in terms of predicting the health impacts. 
Um, so that's, that's one of the, the, the broad messages that I've got. And obviously we've got a lot of stakeholders. The, the primary uh, stakeholder is local government. So we allocate funding and provide support to local authorities to improve uh, active travel um, based on, on uh, central government funding. So that's a bit about what we do in ATU. And I've got an example of a project that we've developed. So this is developed by um, the software developers um, at ATE. It's an open source project, so people can look it up. And um, it's broadly called ATIP, which stands for the Active Travel Infrastructure Platform. And going back to my point about we don't always know where these interventions are happening or what they're like, um, it's a web tool that has allowed us to collect very detailed information about um, specific changes um, that are going on across uh, the country. And this, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, and in conversations with um, colleagues in the Department for Transport, I think is the first national map of interventions where we know how much um, funding they've been allocated. So this is a great example of how um, data and digital is being used in Active Travel England. And I've got a quote there from Brian Deegan, who is the Director of Inspections in Active Travel England. So one project I alluded to was, um, and this is um, still early days on it, but we've been in conversation with people in NHS England to talk about travel to hospitals. And I know um, there are a number of uh, travel surveys that happen in uh, hospital trusts. So um, we are, we've, we've just prototyped um, a bit of research to look at active travel potential to hospitals with a case study focused in Liverpool. So this is Alder Hay um, Hospital in, in Liverpool. And we've got some data for this and we just decided to look, okay, what's, what's the current um, baseline of active travel to this hospital? and what could it get to? And when you, um, when you simulate origin destination data and you assign it to a network, you can um, do things like this, where you basically just count how many people are likely to be traveling on every part of the network, and you can generate this kind of river network going into uh, the hospital. And as I say, this is like a prototype project um, that we're working on. Uh, but it can really give some interesting insights. So the color scheme here is what I think is most interesting, which shows um, the, an estimated level of traffic stress on those roads. And we've got another version of this, which is um, if we assume that not that people just take the fastest route, let's assume that people um, really try and avoid stressful um, traffic conditions. Uh, we've got another version of this, which is um, the other extreme, so not the fastest, but if you try really, really hard to avoid traffic and you're willing to go a long way around, the, the network might look a, a little bit like this. And in reality, it's probably somewhere between the two, but you need to estimate both sides of the equation in order to get a good um, estimate of what the potential is. And as I say, that's a prototype project, but we've actually, we're actually applying this project to um, travel to school in England. So we are estimating um, walking and cycling potential for school, which is uh, a potentially a real leverage point in the system because it's about um, kids' behavior that has loads of impacts on their future health outcomes and other things around travel to school. So we're actively working on the school routes project using a similar uh, methodology. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit at this point but just as a kind of pointer to anyone who wants to get involved in this area, I would say that broadly we're using something that I would call transport data science. And um, I'm sure lots of people, who, anyone who's using origin destination data is kind of using these techniques already. But if you want to learn more about this, um, there's an open source book which I've contributed to called Geocomputation with R. And again, like Brian um, Taras said, this, uh, this project has become like a community project that's got 70 plus contributors online. So if you want to learn more about using geographic data and specifically um, there's a chapter on transport and it's useful for your research, this is just a, a pointer to that. And the key components of this I'd say are 
aerial units desire lines, which is what's shown in this map here, where you simulate travel just as straight lines, and then you add complexity by converting those into routes, and then you can even um, simulate them as agents, which is particularly important for um, health outcome research. So that's the data science side of things. That's broadly what I think um, the techniques we're using. I would say there's a lot of geographic information in there. And I think the reason why the geographic side becomes so important with active travel is because active travel is a very localized activity. People travel um, often mostly within a three to five kilometer radius of their own house. So if you don't have that detailed information, you can't plan where the interventions are going to be most effective. And I think potentially that's something similar that um, could be useful for, for health research is where are, these, where, where, where are these impacts most prevalent? Where is a particular type of disease most prevalent? And um, that, that principle applies uh, across the two. So um, this is just origin destination data for anyone who hasn't seen it before. Um, basically, you've got a big table um, and for all of England, there's a few million of these where you just have zone A, uh, the origin zone, the destination zone, and then a count between them. And this is a very useful form of data because it's aggregated and that allows us to um, get data. This is actually open data derived from the census, but we can get these kind of aggregated data sets from other sources as well. Um, and then a, a really key component in what we do is routing. So um, you can convert that origin destination data where you have a point. Um, you can convert that into a route on the network, and that can give you a probability of that trip being made by a certain mode of transport. And there are many um, routing services available. And I know that um, NHS uh, colleagues have, have been doing some of this routing stuff at scale previously. Um, and then I think where there's real potential to add value is going from these individual routes to route networks. So assessing areas in, in terms of like how good, it, how comprehensive is your network? How much traffic stress on average is there? And there's a huge amount of work to be done to improve those kind of um, network level statistics, which I would see as an environmental driver of some of the, the health outcomes that we're seeing in cities. So I think there's huge potential for using this kind of analysis as a predictor of health outcomes, but also as a way to inform more effective interventions across the whole uh, spectrum. So I'm not gonna say anything else about um, route networks. I am gonna say a few things about um, the potential uh, research avenues. So there's a huge uh, range of things that, that we can do in this space, and there's a lot of need for further research. So going all the way back to I think the first slide by, um, which showed the aggregate results of um, commuter walking and cycling, which showed this overall big uptick, um, that doesn't have any disaggregation based on local environmental factors. And just one example uh, that we're showing here is lighting condition. So um, my colleague um, Eugenie Vidal is looking at the impacts of street lighting on people's likelihood of not just cycling, not just walking, but also running based on Strava data. And this shows the, the real impacts of darkness, but we found that street lighting has a big impact on people's willingness to continue to, to do this throughout the year. So that shows a subtlety that's not taken into account in these big uh, aggregate studies, like stuff um, like based on UK biobank data. I'm not gonna talk about the, the results due to lack of time. I think the most exciting uh, recent bit of research um, is by someone called Caroline Tate, who um, was at the University of Leeds. She's actually a medical doctor by training, but branched off to do a PhD in data science. And she's now working at Bradford um, as a public health, um, a, a, as head of public health, essentially, in, in Bradford City Council. And she undertook this um, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but it's almost the best that you can get in uh, the open transport network where she looked at a natural experiment where these contraflow interventions are going in across London and without going into the details, um, managed to pull out the before and after impacts of, uh, on road traffic collisions, which is a huge cause 
of ill health, especially among young people, and found essentially that um, contraflow interventions are safe and there was no uh, statistically significant um, uptick in uh, crashes. And you've also got these big um, spatial uh, studies, which I'm not going to go into. So in a nutshell, um, that's what we're working on in Active Travel England. I think there's huge potential to take these kind of methods forward. Um, at a recent uh, event that I went to, there was this rather cheesy, perhaps Americanized term of like 10x your impact. But I do think this is what it's about. You can um, take a piece of work and do things to make it have a much bigger impact. And I've just got a few examples here. Um, the first one that I want to mention is by the previous speaker, Ferran, who's put, put the stuff up on GitHub and that allows other people to benefit th from this. And it's not just people in the NHS or even England. Anyone in the world can now take that and use that to benefit their research. And I've got a couple of examples from government, which is Splink, which comes out of the Ministry of Justice. And then also um, the Stats19 R package, which you can use today to download and access um, good data on road traffic casualties, which could be also be useful um, for research. So in a nutshell, I think um, communication is key. It's not just about doing the research. And if you, if you don't get your work out there in one way or another, it's difficult for it to have the impact um, that, it's, that it could have. It's great to see so many talks about packaging and generalizing code and building a strong foundation for others to build on, which is a shared um, thread between active travel research and health research. And I really hope that we can make some of those linkages stronger. So many thanks for listening and look forward to any questions. So you probably can squeeze one quick question in while our next speaker comes up to the stage. But um, do findings from the tool influence policy making on aspects such as cycle lane availability on roads? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> Do findings from the tool influence policy making on aspects such as cycle lane availability on roads? Okay, yes, good question. So I would say that the findings from the tool definitely affect policy um, at the local level. So the results that we're presenting, I think are quite innovative in that they go right down to the street level. So they can say whether the north corridor going out of Leeds or the West Corridor has more potential, but for every city in England, and that affects local council decision-making. Um, I won't comment on the extent to which it's affected national government policy, because there's no way of uh, knowing for sure, but I know that this has fed up to a uh, pretty high level, and the aggregate numbers on the potential benefits, I think there's a good chance that it has influenced it. So hopefully that's a useful uh, answer, but definitely, the point being that if you make your results locally specific, there's a higher chance that someone at a local level can pick up and use those results. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we've got uh, Martina and we've got Paul. So over to you guys. Oh. And as a, a little note as well, there is a, a little bit of a change to the conference schedule just after lunch. Um, so I think I've been lumped with giving a talk, so sorry to everyone for that. Um, Pavel will then be talking about tomorrow's um, unconferencing session. And then um, Chris is going to be talking about, I don't really know what he'll tell you, I'm sure. So, yeah. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Martina Paseca from NHS England. And this is uh, Paul Carroll. And we're here to talk about geographic mappings to support stakeholder requests uh, and beyond. So as we've already heard in previous talks, it's very important to have geographically resolved um, information in healthcare, not only by given the types of organizations that deliver that care, the needs of those populations, but also the move to integrate the care systems. So that means considering how we curate the data, visualize it, uh, diagnose what that might mean for populations, and then plan and act upon it. So in the past, people would have used more proprietary software like ARC, uh, uh, GIS or others, and then some other open source software, but dedicated to geospatial. But now there's a lot of packages, as has been discussed, both in R and Python that can be leveraged. So some healthcare applications, but clearly there's a range of them, includes, well, first of all, just simply being able to visualize um, the information uh, in 
uh, visualize the information, especially for stakeholders that they want to make certain decisions, go rapidly to other uh, colleagues and uh, make those decisions taking into account wider determinants of health. A lot of times exist at those lower output areas. Another area is the coverage of services, whether that's existing ones or optimal ones. So where should we place new um, clinics or hospitals? And also understanding optimal routing, whether that is for patients or healthcare professionals. Uh, so we'll just talk about two areas. So the first I'll just be talking a bit of the 101 in terms of getting started and that is based on R, but there's a similar philosophy with uh, Python packages. Uh, and then Paul will be talking about a collaboration that actually NHS PyCom did. Um, so at NHS England and also with Google Health about going a bit more prescriptive into how can we optimize routing and other decision making. Um, in regards to uh, how people uh, navigate. Uh, so in terms of visualizations, so this is just a quick walkthrough with Leaflet. Uh, but as I said, I think Folium is, is quite similar when I, I saw that being used. So first, usually a lot of things are considered in terms of the boundaries. So that might be the ICSs, the sub-ICVs, the regions. So the shapefiles and the geoportal um, are available and can be downloaded, especially as the geojsons. Um, and once you have those, um, so those can be downloaded or also accessed via APIs, but you can then load them into R. So this is an example of the function where you could read that information. Um, and then, for instance, one thing that you can do is display those polygons, that is, those, those areas as we've seen uh, previously. So you can toggle with a lot of things. So the area you, you center around, so there you have the kind of UK latitude, longitude, um, and you have a range of parameters. So you can say that the fill color is white, but similarly, you could, for instance, make the color a function of a given parameter. You could also add uh, labels and also tooltips. So this is just an example. This is just a screenshot. The, this is the type of map that you um, can generate and you can have it so that if you hover or click, you'll obtain more information as desired. Uh, the other useful thing is more around um, uh, spatial uh, points. So in that case, what you need is to have the latitude and longitude. So for a lot of organizations in via ODS, you can obtain the postcode and from that, the latitude and longitude that allows you to overlay other information. Um, as you can see, you can also uh, toggle with them to see different organizations um, and you might also overlay information on that. Um, so in terms of use case, because these are widgets, so you could put them in a quarto, you could put them in a markdown and a render as a PDF and share while maintaining the interactivity. If you do have a GitHub IO page or something else in the open, you can serve that and include it in the page. So in this case, stakeholders want to know more about cyber compliance at a sub ICB level, which is a more faint lines, then, but then also understand what that means within the ICS boundaries and the trusts. And we also had a few composites to understand that. Um, another area has been more around um, rapidly supporting uh, requests from stakeholders. So we do have some things that are more statics, but that if they want to look at various factors like uh, a, a new intervention where you need to consider digital maturity, uh, CTC ratings, a local population, and also at different organizational level levels that will be hard to do in statics. Similarly, with fully fledged dashboards, though we can quickly uh, spin them up because it's a plug and play, sometimes it can be hard to get the permissioning right uh, so that you can easily give it. So with a widget, you can just email it or you can put it in a PDF and it's easy to share. Um, and I'll now pass, uh, pass to Paul. Okay. okay, so last year we um, presented a geospatial, I presented a geospatial piece of work that um, basically led to a few areas of the NHS getting in touch with their different needs. Um, it led to us putting together a team, NHS England, with, through PyCon, with um, Google Health, and we built an app to answer some of these use cases. Um, I know I haven't got long, so I'm gonna run through some of these um, web, this streamlit app application. But this is designed to run on this computer, your computer in front of you. The, the aim of this was to bring the, the code to the data. A lot of the problems the NHS were telling us were they couldn't actually send um, to a server, an external server, they didn't have a contract with Geospatial. So we looked at it and thought, well, okay, what can we do with this? We built this app to be preloaded with NHS Digital's uh, hospital data set. So what I'm seeing here is, what you're seeing here is a filter of by the town of Cambridge with all the hospitals in 
in uh, Cambridge for, that are on that NHS Digital's hospital website. Um, this is easily downloadable from our GitHub page. It should be able to give you a route optimizer, just as you see here. The aim we're thinking of here is every ICB, every hospital, has blood deliveries, has district nurse visits, has a, a, a ambulance patient drop-offs. Um, and they're using geospatial solutions that are either commercially provided. We wanted to do it and give it to you for free. Um, and here's the optimizer. It loads as fast as you can see in here. We've got all the eight different hospitals in Cambridge listed in order with from and to, with distance and miles, cumulative distance, and then hard-coded times, the walking, peak driving, etc. You can also add in um, a new start address. So if I put in the Clarendon Arms, uh, a pub I know very well in Cambridge, um, it reloads very quickly. The aim of this is that you can, if you're using this in the same ICB or same trust regularly, the, the network X map that it um, gives an API call first time around is cached. So the first time you run this for a big area like Cornwall, it may take a, quite a bit of time. The second time you run it, as I've just done for Cambridge here, it loads very, very um, extremely fast, a lot quicker than it would otherwise. Um, you've got a new start address here, one, two, three, four. Your three hospitals, Adam Brooks, Royal Papworth, and Rosie Hospital, and a different route planned as well. That's the first page that works out of the box. Um, we've got a multiple shortest route page, which was something asked for us by, um, I think it was Esnef Trust, about could they take an appointment van out into some, maybe some of their more rural areas and see if they could um, reduce appointment cancellations or have a conversation with um, different local authorities about laying on public transport for four different types of, um, uh, for different types of um, public transport in, in towns to get their staff to work. I'm just trying to remember the address for a, I think it's Pizza Express in Woking, but I don't know why that's coming to mind. The aim of this is that you have multiple shortest routes. So you'll have that same kind of information I showed you on the first page. The API call shouldn't take too long to load. There's four hospitals here. When the map loads, just as I say, it won't take too long to load. Anyway, you get a filtered map on, on Folium. When I say filtered, it means you can have, you can turn off or on the different routes very easily. So we just did this for four different routes because it's easy to show you something quicker. You can turn them off and on. You've got the data frame below, and all of this is customizable. It's really a proof of concept piece of work, but it can be adapted to however you use data for geospatial in your trust. The third page, was again, was a proof of concept piece of work. I'm going to put in, if you think about now what the NHS is doing with, um, I think it's the flu and COVID um, vaccines are doing at the same time. I think Leicester Railway Station on London Road, we can look at the population very easily there and see what's coverage, um, what's the coverage of the population within say, one mile um, in Leicester. And we just did this using, I think it's population data from ONS, so I, um, IMD population, LSOA data. But this can be adapted again. You could put in substitutes, like other GP practices, and very easily, very visible. This is the type of thing that retailers do. So your McDonald's, your Domino's, they, they look at what population coverage you have within a certain radius. Within a one-mile radius of Leicester Railway Station, you've got a coverage, population coverage of 74,000. The walking time of 20 minutes at pre-defaulted walking at three miles an hour and you can actually hover over all the LSOAs and see the blue ones are where the centroids are fully covered by the radius, the red ones are ones where the edge is just um, slightly covered but still within that radius. Um, this is all available as um, a GitHub repository. There's a workbook section too, so on the left of what you see up here, please take our code if it's useful, clone it, fork it, reach out to us, let us know how it's, how it's going, or you've just emailed me as well, my email's up there. Um, I've rushed through it very quickly. We've got time for any questions? Probably take one quick question. I'll just move away before I um, get told off for causing echo. Um, so you briefly showed an NHS Open Analytics site. Can other analysts share contents there? Sorry, could you repeat? Yeah. So it's, you briefly showed an NHS Open Analytics site. Mm -hmm. Can other analysts share content there? Uh, I think there's some open templates there that NHS England uh, created. So those can be. Uh, cloned or forked to create your own pages on github.io. Yeah. Great. And one other quick question. Um, can NHS staff use your route optimization code with patient data, i.e. to optimize health visit or, or uh, health visitor or GP visits? Yes, anyone can use it. It's on GitHub and it's open, it's public. Um, we've had someone in Brazil for a brewery clone it. Um, at least someone's using it, but any of you can use it here, anyone, government or NHS or public. So please yeah. go ahead. Brilliant. Um, yeah, the, the second part of that question was, are there any data escape risks? Um, everything, the API call for the region goes out, and there will be geolocation for postcode to, LS, um, to longitude, latitude to postcode, but nothing else leaves the laptop. It works like the calculator app does on your laptop. So it's designed to work with 
you know, how many district nurses visits would you have in a day? So eight or 10, maybe 12, um, if they're working very, very fast. Beyond that, you will need a supercomputer for something like 20 or 23, but you're not gonna get really doing that for the kind of use cases we look at for the NHS. Brilliant, well, um, thank you, Martina and Paul, and it's over to you as well now, Paul, isn't it? So a quick round of applause for Martina. Okay. Okay, um, I'd like to talk to you about a project that was, it's on, ongoing currently till November 2nd with East Midlands Ambulance Service. Um, we're working on a project exploring process mining and seeing if we can evaluate information from it with the aim of ideally trying to improve some of the processes within, within East Midlands Ambulance Service. Let me start with what is process mining. Um, it's a bit of a buzzword term at the moment. It's been around since the late 2000s. Um, it works by turning data into an event log. So the left side of the screen, you've got a um, patient zero with all their different events has to be time ordered. So when we work with East Midlands Ambulance Service data, you have a row per patient with all of their different events. So when would the incident come in? When was it originated? When did it go forward and how did it end? First thing you do with anything in process mining is turn it into the way the data looks here on the left. It's a tool to visualize, analyze, and ideally improve business processes. When you use directly following graphs like the one up the top, we've used PM for Pi, um, which is a Python package. That gives you the first type of analysis. And then you've got PetriNet on the bottom, which can also show you basically how the different processes break down for one stream. So we've, we've employed the PM2 process mining pathway, and this means taking three stages to work this through. The first is process discovery. So what you look at with your data on the left. Um, you need to know what you're doing, like what is happening within a process. You may have an idea in certain businesses, but does it actually match? And that's where conformance comes in. So do you have your pre-planned idea? Do you have a training route? Or is conformance something that emerges as your highest trace within a process? Enhancement, that's the last piece. So the iteration of four, five, three, four, and five here leads you iteratively to speak to experts, keep improving, and then hopefully get to six where you can actually improve the process. As I said, we're working with the East Midlands Ambulance Service, but we're specifically only working with category two data. So these are things that are not your most urgent category in category one. We started trying to apply business rules to filter out anomalous data. And we also explored some of this by filtering by outcome, clinical category, other different variables that are available within the data set, such as highest qualification when seen. With 152,000 patients, this is what your spaghetti diagram looks like. Very hard to make sense of anything that's really going on. When you start applying business rules, we only lost 528. Now, what do I mean by business rules? It means that if an incident comes in, um, the, the end date of that incident with a, a patient and ambulance going out isn't before the incident. So it's just putting things in a logical step, like someone isn't, um, doesn't die before they're born, for example, those type of business rules. We still had quite a high, fairly high number of patients left in this after applying the business rules, 152,000. And that led us to getting something that looks more similar and more what you might expect. There's seven or eight main different categories here of seven or eight main timestamps within that event log, which we transformed to make the, the data look like it did on page one. And that's what the kind of separated out, that's what the non-separated out data looked like. When you start to separate out the data and start to make it more interesting as where can we get some value with this? We started to look at the Y variable for, for ambulances, which is time, right? What is what's happening and how long is it taking? How many patients are going through these traces? So treated and transported. I think if you can see the numbers at the bottom, it accounts for nearly 70, 71% of all the total patients. And we have the time for each different um, stage as well. So instant on the disease not transported, 67 minutes, then originated one minute. And you can start to see different patterns and different um, values emerging from this process. It got more interesting once the 70% was too high really to, to extract a lot of value on the left. But when you start looking at outcomes, so obs and gynae, what type of clinical category, cardiovascular trauma, and you can start to see where different patients were going through and different times. Time on scene, for example, with different categories, such as trauma would obviously be ideally lower because you want to get it into hospital, but it could be higher in certain categories. So conformance, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. It's an expected trace. So if you're, you know, Motorola producing a phone, there's a, a way you might produce that. If there's an assembly line at Ford, there's a, a method that you have to go through before you fit this together. With conformance, we didn't have that with East Midlands, East Midlands Ambulance Service. So we looked at what happened, what happened the most frequently and what we were able to extract value from. So we conformed the raw data to the expected trace, looked at some of the lowest fitting traces, and these are all different functions that are available in the PM for Pi open source package. It may not strike you as surprising, but ambulance data is actually fairly high conforming. 99.48% of traces actually fitted what we could call the usual trace. And that's because an ambulance can't depart scene until it's arrived scene. It, the incident has to happen before they, they're mobile. So we started to think, okay, where are we actually gonna extract value from this to give back to the service? 
On the right, the poorest fitting trace, only 0.65%, um, only one instant treated and discharged. I think it was for a bee sting. So looking at the 18 minute category here, this is what they're measured against um, for can they get an ambulance there within a certain period of time. We started to split the cases into what happened when it was below 18 minutes or up to 18 minutes and what happened afterwards. Could we see any value here and could we actually try and see where there were blockages? The only thing we really came up with here was that instant to originated quite often for the greater, greater than 18 minutes were taking an hour. And this pointed to ambulance, ambulances having an instant happening, but they weren't able to leave the hospital where they're waiting to drop off the previous patient. So it was a long time before they could respond to the actual call. Further analysis. When you've got a really high conforming, um, I guess what we call trace diagram for 99.48%, we started to look at the effect of other variables in the original data set and adding those back in. So to, if you can take, for example, here we put IMD. We, we basically cross-referenced the instant postcode with the IMD data set that's available on ONS and started to see was there a difference, was there an effect of so most deprived LSOAs and the mean effect, so the average time for an ambulance response, and there was. And you can see the effect in minutes between the, um, the lowest, IMD, uh, lowest, most deprived LSOAs at the top and the highest deprived, and there's a real clear trend when you start to look at the box plots. We repeated this type of analysis for other variables within here. We wanted to see we were asked by EMAS, highest qualification on the scene, does it have an effect? So if you have higher trained clinicians attending, what happens? Is there a difference? And we took the mean time, we knew that, and we split it out into the different clinical categories for the qualification. And there is. UCA is generally someone who would be calling another ambulance to attend, which is why it's so high. But you can even see variation with the mean between specialist practitioners and ECAs and the technicians. So this is something they're taking back and they want us to do further analysis on. So feature engineering. That's a little bit of what we showed you there. We're starting to add in variables from the original data set, but also extenuous variables, so ones from IMD, and could we associate them with the data set? Can we look at the effect of pressure, so number of calls per hour, and what that has an effect on mean time of response? Could we look at whether there are other staff attending? Do you have police, fire, other nurses on, on scene? IMD I mentioned already. We started to investigate the mean effect of the mean on these variables with the aim of could we build a prediction model? Could we start to simulate effectively what would happen if you changed? specialist practitioner around. So that's the stage we're at now. We haven't yet finished. We've got a few more weeks on this. Um, we're trying to predict time for the entire, sec entire job, but more just those little sections in between where you can start to associate the variables with them. So does geography, how far someone does an instant have an effect? It may do in rural areas. It may do less so in, a, in an urban area. We're in the reiteration stage, that bit I mentioned of the three, four, five. Um, the resources we've used are from, mainly from processmining.org as well as pm for pi but we're starting to combine other data science methods, so ge um, geographical analysis like the, pro um, the presentation I just showed you before. We've also asked, can we start to look at outcomes for patients? So joining EMAS data with hospital data. So what happens when they drop the patient off? Does it have an effect upon the patient outcome? Um, and investigate holdups from A&E as well. So when they are at capacity, what can we do with it? Can we have any kind of, you know, is there any feedback loop within this that we could suggest to them? And the aim of this is really data quality improvement. We found a lot of problems with syncing um, EMAS data with NHS data, just simply because they're not using the same terms and not, not using the same kind of hospital names. So this, these are resources we're using. We used everything that was open source, just pm for pi There is a Bupar R package as well. Um, Van der Aast is the godfather of process mining, so please take a look at his book if you're interested. There's also a free course, I think, on Coursera. And our repo and paper will be out, I think, in early November on this as well. Um, any questions? I'm not sure we've got any questions just yet, um, but if you have any questions throughout the day, um, oh, we do have one um, really quickly. Um, it looks like this process mining would be a great first step before attempting a discrete event simulation to model potential reconfigurations. Have you done that? No, that's the stage we're thinking about doing now. We're trying to produce um, what might be, if you combine the two and put it into like a streamlit app with a model, you could look at a drop down for plus two minutes for a specialist practitioner, minus three for a technician, and you could build a model or effectively put the real data into an AMSIM or a, a simulation model. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. Thank you to Zoe you. for making me feel like my parents are not being able to find anything on my phone. So, um, Next up, um, we've got Chris Maney. So um, an extra special thanks to Chris because there was a bit of a panicked um, message on, I think, Friday afternoon saying, Help, we need a, a speaker. Can you do something quickly? And he said, yeah, all right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, 
So uh, we're all up brilliant. Um, so this is quite a grand title, right, isn't it? Um, building NHS data science teams. So I thought I'd have a crack at this because I've been trying to have some thoughts about it for a while and I didn't get around to actually putting it together as a, an abstract. So uh, at breakneck speed, here's some of my unordered scattergun thoughts. Hopefully it's useful to some of you who are in the process of participating in building, um, redirecting teams towards data science methods. And I've got a nice caveat because, of course, data scientist without a caveat, what's going on? Um, this is just my opinions. Some of this is wrought from my experience. Some of it is me being on my soapbox. Uh, you may disagree with it. Who knows? Uh, hopefully, whatever stage you're at, whatever stage your team is at, whether you're starting on a data science journey or whether you're coming in from industry with best practice, hopefully some of these things will help. Um, I'm hoping that uh, some of these thoughts help you to understand, I guess, some of the things I've learned in my journey and whether they're applicable to you. So firstly, uh, my, my reason for putting this up here is this is my potted CV. Um, with the exception of maybe the PhD study, I don't think I'm that atypical for someone working in um, analytics. So I started in a job that I had absolutely no idea how to do in public health. I spent a very hard year learning the basics of Excel when I didn't know any of it. Um, and then some general dog's body work in clinical networks before getting into a good analytics job at an acute trust that um, gave me the space and the time to learn how to do SQL, how to build dashboards, how to try and work a little bit through the questions. I then took a senior analyst role with an NHS benchmarking tool that UHB build, um, which was really formative for me. Um, but I do remember the, um, the day that I first opened up some of the SQL code that, that team were using. As I joined it, I'm thinking I've made a horrendous mistake because I couldn't do this. It's far too complicated. But that changes over time. I think that particular role did help me to understand some of the consultancy elements. And I think one of the areas that we as the analytical community, maybe not so much individuals, but we tend to fail slightly on our presentation of things out to uh, wider audiences, which is why the consultancy industry has such an inroads into the NHS. It's not always bad, but um, if it can be sold better, sometimes you're out of the conversation already. Um, the last couple of years, I um, had the opportunity to move into leadership management roles, um, thinking, I'm ready for this, I can do this. And my manager at the time at UHB said something very helpful to me, which was, are you sure you want to? You're not going to enjoy that you enjoy working with the data. And at the time, I went, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I got bogged down immediately in the difficulties of trying to lead a team, because you think you've got the right answer, but you're working with other people who aren't you. So my key thoughts are, these sound very business speak, so apologies, um, but build allies, understand the question, be or employ a technical leader, release your analysts or data scientists, and leadership is a skill. So, Build allies. What I mean by that, um, it's easy to sit in blessed isolation, like ticking away on your data and giving people the right answer and telling them no when um, the data won't support it. Um, that doesn't win you very many friends. It doesn't win you a lot of investment in your department and in your team. Um, it also, if you can't communicate that well to internal partners, you'll have things like um, inability to use certain technology because you can't describe that need to your colleagues in your IT services or similar departments. It's very important as well to foster those leads with, uh, sorry, those links with um, the various services that you work with. They're not just your customers, they're helping you define the question. And if you can't define the question very well, you'll answer it very poorly. Also, I'd suggest external relationships as well. Now, I'm talking to the NHSR community conference, so you're already getting some of that external stuff, right? But these things don't happen if you don't do them. So if you don't go and make links with people, go and talk to people, go and set up groups, go and share your work, you can't wait for someone else to do it because it needs you to make the first step. So it's good that you're all here and for people listening online, you too, thank you. But keep that going, we need that. You've seen loads of the presentations today where people saying the code's here on GitHub, you can reuse that. Brilliant. I don't want to have to re-engineer the wheel when someone's thought about it in much more detail than I ever will. So I think the other point on that really is also make sure you're licensing things properly. 
So as we start to use GitHub quite a lot, I see lots of people put things on GitHub. And if you don't put a license on it that allows other people to use it, realistically, they can't use it. So please do have a little bit of thought about applying open licenses. If you want to collaborate externally, if you don't license your code accordingly, people shouldn't really be reusing it. Right, understand the question. So I did say that a minute ago. Now, I mean that on a couple of levels. So I mean, understand the individual study question. And I know it's like a statistician trope and general joke, of, but seriously, what's your study question? Um, but that is important in each individual piece of work, right? You need to work with your stakeholders to work through what is it they're actually asking, because they've probably come to you and said, I need some data on thing. And you've had to translate data on thing into a question you can answer with your data set. But also wider than that, you need to tie it into your organization's priorities. So it's no good going after something that you're really, really interested in. It's much better going after the thing you're really interested in because it fits with your organization's population health management strategy. So if you can learn to identify the needs of your organization and catch the things that you want to achieve in that, I mean, obviously do that genuinely. I don't mean that, like use that as a way to shield things, but you, you're not gonna get the investment and the ability to communicate why things are important if you can't set them in the wider context of your organization's need. So that's what I'm, I'm saying there. Sorry, forgive me, these are all prompts to help me speak rather than a cogent points. Um, another one there is don't be afraid to say no. And that's important that it also goes with the last point. Um, it's really important to say no when the data don't, doesn't support things, or particularly when you've got a bad question. The problem is that if you say no, you will become unhelpful and people will go round you. So one of the things that I've encountered in the last couple of jobs is occasionally we'll get an analytical project and we'll take a long time bashing the question around, trying to figure out exactly what we need to answer. But in the meantime, a certain service has then gone and commissioned a consultancy to do that work because they needed it and they needed it last week. And your process of saying no legitimately has um, presented a barrier and they've gone around you. And that's a lost opportunity for investment in your team. So I know those two things are a bit contradictory, but don't be afraid to say no, but try and say no with a, a way around it, with a, a plan to get out of it. We can't do this, but we could do that. And once we've done that, let's talk about the next stage. So be or employ a technical leader. Um, I would like to suggest being the technical leader is a very powerful thing in your team. Um, I've worked with some very good technical leaders over the years. Um, and I think, again, with no disrespect to any individuals who I've worked with, it's easier to lead a team that does a technical job if you understand the depths of the technical job. You don't need to be doing it every day, but it's much easier to represent that need. That said, you have to also make a transition as a leader into communicating with other people and working with other people's needs as well. But if you haven't got that skill, as a technical leader, or you're rusty because you haven't been able to use it for years, get someone in. Don't be afraid to get someone in, someone you can rely on to do that. Um, I su suggest there's many good candidates in this room for getting someone in to do that sort of job. Um, it sounds a bit cheesy, but you're in a marathon, not a sprint. Um, I found with the last couple of jobs I've, I've landed, and with my enthusiasm, I've said we could do this, and we could use GitHub, and we could use uh, simulation models, and we could do that. Um, and then you get some enthusiastic noises from some people. And then you get some confusion from other people going, what did you want? You, so it was GitHub last week, and it's simulation this week. So it's important to have a time scale to figure out what your priorities are, how you're going to deliver them, and to have a sort of a path to get there, because you can't do them all overnight. And if you're going to try and do anything for your organization, explain to them why it's their benefit. If you can't say to the organization, um, it's a benefit. You trained my staff to do this, therefore we've delivered this piece of work for you and you can now see why doing this piece of work over here will save you X amount of thousand pounds. It's very hard to secure more investment than goodwill. I've also put ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And I'm, I mean that with stuff like tech or new methods. So if you were to ask an IT security department who don't know what GitHub is, whether or not you can use GitHub. Um, what should be their answer if they're doing their job? No. Like, why are you going to use anything external? We don't understand it. We haven't got a risk assessment. The answer should be no. Now, there are ways and means with that. 
if you can set up a, a small demonstration, write a bit of a policy around it, write an operating procedure, demonstrate why there's no risk or the mitigations you've put in place to prevent that happening, then you're in a much different conversation. You've gone past the no. Release your analysts uh, or data scientists. By that, I mean, don't wait for you to do everything. I find personally, it's a very personal reflection, I'm enthusiastic about everything and I want to learn it. But if I prevent people doing things because I don't understand it, we totally destroy the progress in the team. If you have some senior people who are really strong and experienced, then try and scale them up to lead in that area. Um, but also by the same token, if you've got keen junior people, try and remove some barriers, give them enough training and give them enough security to say, go and figure this thing out. You've got the skill, go and figure this thing out for us. Um, that helps them progress and it helps the wider team see that it can be done. The reason I put most people don't think they're a data scientist at first, I mean, Maybe you do, I don't know, I didn't. At first I thought I was an analyst, uh, and then I didn't understand statistics, so I needed to learn some statistics. Um, be aware that some people in your team don't consider themselves to maybe even be as good as you do. You, can, you might consider them to be better than, than uh, they believe they are. So you're in a continuum of skill and confidence, so try and encourage at all levels. You don't need to just be encouraging the superstar high flyers encourage everybody because everybody is on journey towards it. That sounds very cheesy, but you know what I mean. But if you don't allow people space to try these things, you don't make any progress. You need to have space to allow people to make mistakes and you need to have um, a way to wrap around a mistake and take away forward. So if you're adopting GitHub, someone at some time will put something on GitHub that you don't like or shouldn't be up there. So what is your plan to get around that, to mitigate that? That's a more sensible way of doing it. And finally, uh, leadership is a skill. Um, I thought I would be all right at leading teams. Um, it turns out that I'm all right at doing the things I'm most interested in. And I wasn't very good at understanding how everyone else in my team was working. Uh, I did a little bit of work with um, a management coach at one point, which helped me, because he used to ask me very blunt questions. Uh, I remember moaning about my um, people perceiving certain things a certain way. And he said to me, how do you know what they think? I said, well, it's sort of obvious, so I'd read it from them. Said, so you're telling me what you think they think. Um, so there's all sorts of gotchas like that in the leadership kind of progression. You might think you know what, why, and how you're doing it, but you can be deeply blind to your own way of doing things. Delegating is also really important. Um, it's very important when you're a person like myself who wants to be in all the detail of everything that I can't and I need to allow people to do those bits for me um, and also to do them in ways that maybe I wouldn't. So just because you would approach things a certain way doesn't mean someone else's approach is bad. I know that sounds really obvious but it comes down to trust ultimately. You think you're trusting people but then when they deliver something that's not quite what you intended, are you still trusting them? So it comes back to the allowing them space. So apologies, I realise we're getting a bit close to lunch, I'll wrap up in a second. Um, that sounds a bit cheesy again, but vision is important. So by that, I mean, where are we going as a team? What is it you want to achieve over the next year, over the next few years? How are you going to get there? Um, is it going to be by you um, fleshing out some sort of techie approach and then skilling everyone up and going and get it? Is it about you specifying a goal and leaving the techie stuff to be sorted out by the people on the way? How is it you're going to do that? And that could be different for different people. Um, the reason I've got that is a, is a good techie a poor leader, and is a good leader a poor techie. I think we assume that the two things are a continuum, right? You're a good analyst, so you become the manager of your team, therefore you must be a good team leader. Doesn't follow necessarily, does it? It also doesn't mean that good team leaders have to be great analysts either. So my other points there about not knowing many born leaders relates to what I was saying before about the learning and allowing yourself to learn and allowing yourself to progress as a leader, taking your eye off some of the minute detail and allowing and trusting your team to do that for you whilst you stand back and you give them the direction, the assurance and the, the route forward. Um, this has all been very scattergun today. Um, and my reflection on this would be that um, Organizing one's thoughts before communicating is very good. 
But when you can't, you can't. <laughs> so be honest with people. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you for your time and your attention. Um, there are many ways to skin the proverbial cat in leading and creating a data science team. Um, but I'm really interested to talk to people who want to do this because let's get a community of people to mentor each other um, and to challenge each other and help grow teams. We don't all have to look the same, but we can all help each other get there. Thanks. Once again, thank you, Chris, for um, stepping in and saving us a, a horrible gap in the schedule. Um, we do have a couple of questions, Chris. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, sure. So, um, I won't run off too yeah, quick. <laughs> can't let you run away that quickly. Mm -hmm. So, any advice about how analysts lead from the middle, support mm. change where there is a lack of technical leadership or seeming lack of enthusiasm from senior leadership to find some? That, that's a difficult position to be in <laughs> because... I think many of us who've been analysts for a number of years but aren't necessarily the leader of your team might find yourself there. You, you think you can see how a thing can be done better or um, how you could change a team for the better. Um, I think it's the ask for forgiveness rather than permission thing again. So, you know, obviously there's limits to that. You don't go and completely disregard your team's object objectives, for example. But if you're the only person in your department who knows what GitHub is, and why it might be useful. Why don't you have a try setting it up and demonstrating what that is? And so, do you know what I mean? You, from, if you emerge from the middle ground, if you like, by being strong in certain areas, it allows your senior leaders to see and understand what you're doing and why. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, the flip side of set your team free and encourage your junior team members. What if your team members are very happy where they are mm -hmm. with their current um, tools and skills? They don't want to learn R, um, Git, et cetera. Mm. That's, that's a good point. Um, I, I actually got some advice on exactly that question from um, my auntie, who's a former head teacher. Because um, uh, I'd got a, a management job and she was used to training people. And she said, um, which made sense to a statistician, um, there's always um, people below the mean <laughs> as well as above the mean. Um, it's OK to be OK at your job. You don't need to be striving after the next thing. You don't need to be striving after being the best in your um, particular field. And you have to acknowledge and accept that. Um, there is something you can do around uh, identifying the things people are interested in. So if people are um, really not wanting to learn any new technology, but they're very good in a certain thing, why don't they become the owner of that? Why don't they look be the ones who develop that standard um, in that sort of thing? So it's, it's okay, not everybody has to be striving after the next thing, is, is what I would say. And we can't expect unrealistic things from everybody. But uh, if you've got one or two people who want to excel, don't, excel is the wrong term for this one, uh, who want to go beyond what they're currently doing, um, remove the barriers for them. So meet, meet both sets of people where they are. Um, we have two more questions. I'm going to see if we can squeeze them in. First, um, Chris told you to not apologize for your cheesiness. <laughs> um, they're really important points that you're making. So his question would be, um, how do you build a team with the right balance and mix of skills? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, there's a couple of bits. So pragmatically, um, if you inherit a team, um, you've got who you've got. So, right? so um, maybe you might be able to recruit other people. So. Um, learn the strengths and weaknesses and what people are interested in in your team. Um, and then maybe see where that fits with where you want to go and form your direction of your team together like that. Uh, in terms of, of building and constructing the team, I think there's really something very important about recruitment. Um, I th again, this is one of my soapboxes. Um, I think um, some parts of the NHS analytical community do recruitment quite badly because we ask very, very prescriptive things, particularly around testing. So sitting someone in front of a computer, for example, with a very prescriptive coding test isn't really what they would do in their job. So let's say you uh, disable their access to um, search engines, for example. Um, I would expect anyone in my team who didn't know how to code a thing to go and figure it out, not to remember it necessarily. So that's, that's a, to me, that's an unrealistic test. So it's test, uh, I say on recruitment, try and recruit and test with the qualities that you need in your team. So for me, that's problem solving, some exposure to some sort of coding, uh, and preferably some sort of NHS experience. So I, I prioritize those things, but it demands a little bit more of you as a recruiter. 
Right, I think we've, um, we've run out of time now. Um, there, there was a question from um, a, a certain Richard Wilson. That, <laughs> that, I don't know whether he's trying to troll you or um, inflate his own ego. So for anyone who doesn't know, I'm going to work for Richard within a couple of weeks. <laughs> so perhaps we'll leave that one for <laughs> the pub later. But anyway, thank oh, got you got name-checked and no question. <laughs> and over to Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
95th to 99th percentile values are highlighted in yellow. So essentially I found that across 99% of days, the maximum occupancy for that day peaked at 18 pods occupied or lower. And so these figures were, helped, um, were used by the team to help inform their final decision to build the unit with 18 pods. So looking towards the future, um, this model is extremely flexible because of the nature of how it was programmed. And the fact that it reads timetables from a CSV means you can test pretty much any kind of timetable in there. It's also very easy to scale. Um, you can essentially add more theaters generating more patients simply by adding another patient generator. Um, so in conclusion, um, I feel that this is a, a pretty good use case for showing how discrete event simulation can be used um, as a right-sizing tool. It enables us to make an informed decision based on the timetables that they had available. And from that, um, basically select a number of pods that we feel will be an efficient use of resources. So uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much. So um, I almost wanted to ask the same question myself. What package was used to make the animation? Um, I knew that the wizzy dot chart would be the uh, most attention getting <laughs> part of the presentation. That was used, um, I created that using Bupa R. That was, I think, mentioned in the previous, okay. or one of the previous talks. Yeah. It's a yeah. process mining package, essentially, but because um, my simulation outputs um, the patient data in a kind of event log format, it was easy for me to plug that into Bupa R. So um, a question I have is, there's a lot of um, people that do kind of operational research stuff will tend to use commercial tools. How did you find using um, SimPy, or did you try other things like um, Simmer in R? I had previous experience using Jamsim, which is like another freely available um, simulation tool. That's more like it's like a graphical user interface, you know, sort of drag and drop. Um, I found SimPy, after the initial sort of like learning curve, um, to be a lot more flexible and a lot more transparent. I think one of the nice things about it is that when your simulation is contained in a script, you can look through your simulation, you can look through your script and you know exactly what it's doing. In Jamsim, it often felt like options could be sort of hidden within menus, within menus, and it was easy to sort of potentially lose track of what you were really doing. But um, I will say that I was sort of tutored in the use of uh, SimPy because I was a member of the uh, HSMA, um, Health Sciences Modeling Associates Program, which is like a really great, um, sort of like year-long program where they kind of fast track you through lots of different types of uh, modeling techniques. So uh, that kind of segues quite nicely into a question of, is there a, a link to the GitHub available? There isn't at the moment, but it can be made available. So hopefully post that on Slack. Um, one final question, has the theater been built and how has the model held up to real life? The theater has been built. However, it is not yet operational. It's not online. Um, we keep on getting different sort of like vague dates about when it might be. But um, yeah, it is built and ready to go. Amazing, so thank, thank you very much, Helen. So um, last up in this session, we have um, Andy. So over to you, Andy. Thank you very much. Well, you've almost made it. I'm the last one before lunch, so congratulations for making it this far. Um, so, um, the title of this is How to Develop and Evaluate What-If Scenarios Collaboratively and Openly, which hopefully by the end of this you understand why I've named it this way. So, I work for an organisation called Dorset Intelligence and Insight Service, um, the acronym referred to as DICE. So essentially we are a central uh, kind of data warehouse team that works collaboratively across a number of the NHS organisations in Dorset. So we have um, people from the CUPES, people from the community, and people from the ICB. We bring together um, different functions, so data engineering, data analysis, and data science teams, and primarily looking at population health management and cross ICS support on different operational services and how we can generate insight and impact. From a data science perspective, we're focusing on three kind of things. We're looking at demand capacity, so discrete rate simulation model and system dynamics, et cetera. We're looking at forecasting, and we're also looking at risk modeling and risk stratification. 
think it's really interesting hearing everyone's talks today. There's reoccurring themes going on. There's a bit around demand capacity and clinical service reviews. There's a bit around forecasting, particularly in an ED and an urgent care setting. And you know, there's lots of other interesting thing on, particularly like geospatially, I feel like there's lots, we're all dabbling in little bits of it and trying to bring that together. So I guess, who am I? I'm Andy, I, Andy Paul. I'm the data science lead for the data science team in Dawson Intelligence and Insight Service. So I'm gonna talk through a real problem that we went through earlier this year. So this is, was a transformation project um, that we've been supporting earlier this year um, in the first phase. So I'm sure many of you know, um, minor injury units um, will be reclassified or looked at to become urgent treatment centers or there'll be other provisions as well. So I'm gonna start off with some audience participation. I'd like you to all put your hand up if you actually know what you think an MIU is. I'm hoping that will be quite a few. Yeah, good. Do you know where your nearest one is? If you do, please can you put your hand up? Slightly less. Do you know what times they're open if you know um, where your nearest one is? Interesting. About a dozen or so? Um, and do you know, could you put your hand up if you know when you should go to one instead of an ED department? Slightly better. That's good. And would, can you put your hand up if you think the general public know all of this? I think you see the problem. And I'm sure you know, many better people than myself have come together and gone, right, MIUs need to be looked at. But actually, what does that mean for where we are in terms of Dorset? Um, so this is Dorset right here. This is all our urgent care sites across Dorset. We're a very awkwardly shaped county. We're kind of like a diamond shape. So um, we tend to shed, put everything around the border or in the middle, um, nowhere in, else in between. But we've got uh, three ED departments currently, uh, Dorchester in the centre here, Paul and Bournemouth, and then we've also got MIUs and around the area as well. Just to give you an idea of our kind of area. So there's some key requirements for an urgent treatment centre. So this is the key to us setting out the standards for our modelling, is that um, we need to be open 12 hours a day unless we've got special exemption, which is a process you probably don't want to go through unless you've got a really good reason. There is a reduced target time, um, a reduced a &E attendance by making sure that they're in the right place. I guess part of this is trying to make sure that the patients are getting the right care at the right locality level. And there was a kind of a strong, there's a strong benefit to co-locating urgent treatment centres or UTCs, either with an ED department or with a kind of a same day kind of access, um, mind, um, more illness focused um, department. So we were working with a group, a cross-system working group from three or four different organizations that involve clinical, operational, um, and various other groups. We had finance, workforce, looking at how we deal with that. So the initial outline was that we wanted a, a, an outcome of between three and eight UTCs across Dorset. There are currently eight MIUs, or there was at the start of the pandemic at least and an unnumber of SDAs. Now, SDAs we refer to as same-day access sites. So this is the split of, split of um, attendance by uh, illness versus injury. So by splitting out what at heart an urgent treatment centre should look like and treating injuries, then we can look at that kind of data. The same-day access site is more from an illness perspective, so more of a slightly more primary care focused area. There was already some concerns around data sources around the system. How do we pull together all these disparate sites with our eight different MIUs and plus the ED departments? And COVID, what impact has that had? We also, there was questions raised of, should we be modeling SWAS, 1-1, IOX? How big, how many years do you want me to model, I was thinking. Um, 
So what we worked through is we go, we said, what is the realistic outcome? So we kept between three and eight UPCs. We looked at three or more scenarios to, different, to go to appraisal because we didn't have financial information to bring into the model and we didn't have workforce information to bring into the model at straight off the start. So we're okay, we're gonna to need to layer, do a layered approach here. We're gonna to need to do the demand capacity modeling, then we're gonna layer finance, we're gonna lay HR, et cetera. And we were agreed very early that we wanted to look at data quality over data quantity. So we focused in on particular years that we knew we had higher data quality than other years. Um, we also agreed that same day access sites was a much wider ask and linked in with the neighborhood program around PHM. And so that that would be modeled in a separate phase. And we also decided because of the interaction between UTCs and a and &E and ED departments, that they needed to be included within this model. So we needed to look at the whole urgent care system. And we decided that SWAS 1.1 and IX weren't initially in scope, but could be added um, later. We also looked at a Dorset Plus model. So, so often in our jobs, we're confined to looking at our boundaries and just what's in our scope. We started to go, is there anywhere, any urgent care sites within 20 minutes of our border that would be impacted by any changes we make? And the answer was yes. We have, you know, our county, when we look at it, we draw people from Hampshire, from our Bournemouth ED department. And we have a, there's an ED department at Yeovil in Somerset, that if we were to make any changes to the system, that's only five, 10 miles over the border. Um, and Salisbury is um, as well in Wiltshire, that if we were to make any changes, the system could be affected as well. So we need to understand not only our ICB population, but the slightly wider. So we had a look at data, started with ECDS. Um, something interesting happened when we started to play that back to the clinicians and operational teams. That's not right, they said. We don't believe that. And I was like, okay, right, so what data are we using? So, well, well, that's kind of right. You know, it's right at a high level, but as soon as we drill down, it starts to get not high data quality. And when I started to look at it, and I went away and did that, we started to see that certain sites, in terms of appointments, were correct. But actually, when we looked at acuity, when we were trying to split into minors, majors, and could have been seen in primary care, that some sites were classifying um, 90 plus percent of their attendance as minors. Other sites were classing 45%, which is a massive difference between sites. And this isn't ED versus MIU, this is MIU versus MIU. And then there were other sites classing 10 or 20% of their attendances as could have been seen in primary care, and other sites had zero. And as soon as we actually drilled it down, we went, I'm not sure we can use this data. So we, we thought, oh, maybe it's just a field. We looked wider. We went, okay, let's look at the reason for attendance. Let's look at you know, the primary description reason. Different sites use different ones. Different sites are using different number of ones. And actually what we came away with was the data we've got is only good at a really high level. It's no good granularly. So we then worked with that um, stakeholder group, with that working group, and we said, can we go away and do a manual audit? And that's what we did to actually get that right, to get the acuity right, to get the things like descriptions right, actually go, let's talk to the operational teams. Let's actually work collaboratively here. If our data quality is poor, let's not push it back and go, it's not me. Let's actually have that conversation and go, fine. If we really want to do this properly, let's do that manual audit. It, we might not be able to do it with patient level information, but it's going to get the right answer in the end. And as part of that as well, we've, we uh, worked with a, different, a number of different working groups, clinical, operational, and we also public engagement group in this. Part of the working group, this is the short list of questions that they wanted us to answer. Not just a few, isn't it? It's got things like seasonality, staffing levels, uh, demand, spare capacity, optimistic, but perhaps. Um, and we just want to look at different things. So, because of all the different asks, we, we wanted to create a user interface, and then one that actually they could challenge us. So when we came up with these scenarios using our you know, data technical skills, 
You can actually say, here it is, here's the live version. You can go and query it right now if you believe that you can generate a different answer or you want to refinance that, then we can do that. So we went away and did that with Streamlit. Um, we generated a web application. Um, it's just an example on screen of some of the parameters that we can change in there. So we built in opening hours, different opening hours between different uh, uh, urgent care centers. We, it was important that we included seasonal demand because we are being on the sunny south coast, we have a high level of tourism, so we need to look at that. We also looked at if we um, all our A&E sites co-located in the UTC. So how we did it, so many tools that everyone's been talking about today, Simpy, Plotly, Streamlit, Polars I would recommend if you're not already using it instead of Pandas. And we also have um, our cloud um, technology. So we use Azure, others are available, but the NHS is heavily linked to Microsoft in my experience. What does the model actually look like behind the scenes? So this is a very crude approximation of we take some adjustable parameters along the top, it processes it through, we've got data and we've got a model in the center and we get the outputs down the bottom. And what drives it all? So how do we actually get to it? So we use a simple weighting decision system. There's no ML in this. It's let's keep it as simple as possible. And do you know what? Actually, we managed to turn it around really quickly by keeping it simple. We used, we looked at historic data and we generated a decision matrix that reconciles the historic data. We looked at about 1,500 different data points in that matrix. What we did is that we looked at historic data and we tried to understand the factors that were influencing that. So the, primarily these were driving distance from sites, uh, site type, so uh, whether it's an A&E or an MIU or UTC, so how someone identified with their local region and whether there was a tourism or day allowance and there was a handful of minor adjustments, I will admit. So, some of the specs on screen. I mean, we all know that lines of code is no good sign of a model. Also, that's probably a sign of my rather poor coding in places. But it took about seven weeks to build and processes patients um, for a week's demand in 15 seconds so everyone can query it live. What does the results actually look like? So on site, we said, let's look at what happens if we made all M eight MIUs, just looking at minor injury attendances, using that data that we go away and work, um, got a manual audit on. That black line is our estimated minimum capacity that's viable for a UTC. That's just with minors. So either we've got a lot of people that could have been seen in primary care, or the spec for UTC is such that in a, being a primarily rural area, we don't have the demand for every site within the UTC. So we developed a few scenarios. Um, I put some example scenarios because unfortunately this is still an ongoing project and it actually hasn't gone out for public consultation. So I can't give you the actual formal scenarios that we're working out. But you can see that in this first one, we've got four sites that make the line. And it's slight, slightly more optimistic if we bring in those that can be seen at primary care sites or a same day access site. Um, we can also look at the effect of opening hours on ED departments in the area. So if we extend in opening hours from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the UTCs, what's the effect in different sites? So for example, our Dorchester ED department would see a reduction in 11, 11 and a half patients per hour for the additional two hours. And that's something we can go to the ED department and go, would that make a difference? Can we make a cost benefit analysis of that? We also used it to look at where our demand comes from two different sites across our area. We've got Wimborne on the left, which is primarily takes um, demand from our urban area. And then we've got Bridport on the right, which is a kind of more rural community, which takes demand from appearingly everywhere. We could only describe it as being day trips or holiday makers really more than anything. We also looked at where people would go. If a site didn't make the UTC grade, how far would they have to travel? Where would they go to from what postcodes? What's the impact on that patient? The key to this really has been success through collaboration, not data. 
And actually, that's something as a technical person I find very hard to say. That actually everyone operationally and clinically knows everything. And it's just for me to bring it together in a nice whizzy app and say, here you go, here's everything you told me with a tiny bit of data. And actually, then we've actually got something and we get to the right answer. So what it looks like at the moment, it is live and operational and ready, ready for testing. Um, and we looked forward to going to phase two soon. I'll stop there. Oh, thank you very much. I, uh, I wondered, um, as one of the people that kept their hand up knowing all the answers to your questions, is there a correlation between people that have stupid habit, hobbies like mountain biking and knowing what minor injuries units are? Um, but it is an interesting point because I called 111 up once for my child and they said, go to this place. And I turned up and they said, we're a minor injuries unit, we can't help you. So, yeah, do the public know? Does, um, all the people that need to know, no. <laughs> um, so there was a, a really good question. Um, how enthusiastic were the ED team to be audited? Um, did they embrace any recommendations to change their recording practices? So I think we had really good, um, we had a really good working group. We had the right people in the room. And I think them being engaged really early, and making clear that actually, if we use that pool data, there would have been an impact to them that really helps that process. And you know, those relationships are continuing to develop and we're very much like everyone else, we're looking at ED forecasting models now with those same teams that we've worked with on this. And I think it really facilitated the conversation wider about a ballet system-wide urgent care system rather than it being, we're in acute, we're gonna do our thing. We're the MIUs and UTCs, we're gonna do our thing. It's very much, they've always had good links, but now it's gonna kind of go, right, if we do something over here, does it have an impact over there? And very much, you know, particularly with you know, any potential site changes, that's massive. Great. So, yeah, thank you to all our speakers. Okay, so the next talk is uh, Tom. Uh, conference check-in app. I'm going to tell, him, tell you what the, what the subtitle of this uh, talk is, basically, which is... Uh, what, what is the subtitle? Your boss is an idiot, don't listen to your boss, I think would be a fair, um, a fair summary of the subtitle of this. I speak as Tom's boss. Um, so Tom is going to talk about something you've all experienced on the way in, um, and I shall hand over to him now. Yeah, so I um, hope you're all feeling full now. Um, this is probably going to be a little less serious than the rest of the talks throughout the day so far. Um, this was a bit of a mad scramble last night to put something together. Um, much like this conference check-in app was. Um, so yeah, the subtitle of this talk is um, why you should ignore your boss, play about, and have some fun. So I'm sure we've all been to conferences that look something like this, where you've got a lovely organized desk. And you go up and you say your name and instantly find your name badge. Um, but those are the rare exception. Um, most of the time, I tend to find it looks something more like this. There's just a sea of name badges, completely unorganized. I'm not saying that our, um, my lovely colleagues would have done a terrible job, but there's always that thing where you walk up and you say, um, oh, what letters does your name start with? And you say, oh, J, and they look for G. And you go, no, 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 th there's my name. And they go, don't touch our system, it's very organized. Um, so, I asked the question, can we not do better than some paper-based system? Uh, yeah, of course we're a technology-focused group of people. Um, and I suggested this at a meeting and Chris kind of shook his head. And um, Kaylee, who's at the back, who's been doing an absolutely amazing job of um, organizing. I, I feel like she deserves a massive round of applause. Um, <laughs> Yeah, she's been doing great. And she listened to me say this and instantly jumps up and says, yes, I already said that, Chris. Um, so Chris then really shook his head and said, it will fail on the day. All these things are brilliant up until you put it into production and it dies. And um, I kind of said, well, yeah, but what's the harm in trying 
um, you know, if it, if it fails, there's always going to be some um, you know, paper-based backup. We'll just pretend it didn't exist, um, which would have been a bit awkward for this talk. I would have had to be a bit like Richard Nixon with the two envelopes, hoping that um, Buzz Aldrin did manage to safely land on the moon. Um, so fortunately, I'm using the, the good envelope today. So how can we do this checking process better? And of course, QR codes, they are amazing. Um, I hope someone scans this. Um, you'll get a great prize if you scan it. Um, two guesses to what the QR code might take you to. But they're absolutely amazing. I mean, it's similar to a barcode, those just 2D lines that convey a series of numbers. But so much information can be stored in one of these. The, the kind of, go and read Wikipedia afterwards, just the whole design is amazing. The squares in the corner allow the QR code to not only just be rotated, but you know, transposed in 3D space so it scans correctly. There's um, timing lines, um, hopefully the bike's still picking me up, but you'll notice this beautiful pattern, like black, white, black, white, black, white, that follows straight up from that corner in an L shape. Um, and that's so it can always detect that kind of specific pattern. There's all kinds of other stuff in there, really worth um, reading up on if you want to lose um, an hour of your life. But they're really easy to work with as well. Sorry, this is the only um, set of codes I'm going to put on the screen, um, and it's a bit small. But basically, one line in R, you can generate QR codes. There's probably something similar in Python. There's websites that you can use. They're great. Now, if you know Chris, Chris is the shiny master. He literally wrote a book on it. And we've been building a lot of um, applications in Shiny of late. So the logical question is, could we build some kind of tool in Shiny that could read these QR codes? So something on the phone, a Shiny app, and scan the QR code and check the people in. And the answer is probably no. Um, the way Shiny works is, the server has the code that's active, and it sends some stuff to the user in the web browser. Um, so yeah, there's that kind of backwards and forwards process. Any processing that you'd want to do is going to have to be sent from the user's phone back to the Shiny server, back to the user to display. And if we were trying to scan QR codes, that's gonna be a video stream. Lots and lots of bandwidth um, to handle this. And back to Chris's point about stuff always failing. Who's ever been to a conference where the Wi-Fi is flaky? So, can we do it client side instead? Yes. There's a link to go onto our GitHub repo. Um, so, I'm going to quickly talk about kind of how we've built this. Um, the code is all available to go and actually look into, so I'm not going to show any codes, but if you want to know more, um, I will talk your ear off about it. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of image. You can tell that I'm a master of design. Um, you've got a title, the kind of finger scanning the QR code, and a button. Um, the great back, black background is me doing this at about midnight last night um, and taking a screenshot on my computer. Um, that's basically what our guys were seeing. They're looking at the camera feed on the phone. Um, and that little green box, it normally is red. And when it detects a QR code, it turns green. Um, so I built this in the React JavaScript framework. So it's sitting on the user's um, device. All the code's running and doing all of the processing on the device itself. And all that clever stuff about decoding the QR code and building the stuff to actually read from a webcam there's a package for it. I haven't had to write any complicated code at all. Um, so for um, JavaScript, there's something similar to PyPy and um, um, Cran in R, it's called NPM. Um, there's lots of great stories about security vulnerabilities with NPM, but um, story for a different day. Um, but yeah, the, the app just scans the QR codes, and when it detects one of the QR codes, it sends that back to our server, which does the processing and says whether that's the person that we've got in our system, checks them in. 
or it kind of throws an error. Uh, the backend, um, oh sorry, I had one more point then. Yeah, so that's about the showing the error message and whatnot. Um, the back end, I've built that in um, the Plumber package in R. So Plumber is a, I guess it's kind of similar to Shiny that you're building web-based systems in R, except all you're doing is building the API. So if you're not familiar with what a web API is, I like to think of them as functions that you can call over the internet rather than functions that you're calling on your R console. So these endpoints, or maybe you call them functions, um, do various things. We've got one for getting the list of attendees for the day, so it just brings a big long list saying who's here, how many people have checked in and whatnot. Um, and then we have the ability to upload a, a list of the attendees in bulk. So, you know, we're all really keen on RAP at the moment, aren't we? I, I didn't want to have um, Kaylee and Nat and Nache going through manually adding people in one after the other, sending an email. Um, the system kind of just takes an Excel file um, uploads it into our system, and then it automatically generates a QR code and sends it out. Yeah, and then the other things about getting the attendees individually and checking them in. A little bit more about the back end. So I'm just storing it in a SQLite database and nothing clever. Um, once this conference is over, we'll delete that database. Um, doesn't need to exist permanently. Um, it's using the Blastula package, which I've not used before, but it's a great way to send emails automatically. Um, so we're using it, uh, an NHS.NET account that we've got set up. Um, if you're ever needing to do automated emails, ask your IT for an application um, account, I think they say, but then you can get SMTP access to automate emails. Um, if anybody tried to scan the QR codes that you got sent, um, all it is is it's just a random um, UUID. So there's nothing that identifies you otherwise in those QR codes, nice and simple. Um, and then there's some stuff about WebSockets. If you're interested in that, I can talk about that. But yeah, basically, all of the people's devices were kind of communicating to the server, and the server was communicating back to all of them at the same time to sort of say, um, someone else has checked someone in, so it updates a counter in real time about how many people are um, at the venue or not. So um, this might all sound really kind of over the top. Why was I bothering to do this? Um, the truth is I've just wanted to play about with React for a while. Um, so I, I was trying to think back, cause Chris kind of asked me about um, learning JavaScript. I was like, well, I think I actually learned JavaScript in about 1999 or 2000. It's one of the earliest programming languages that I learned. Um, but I keep forgetting about it for a while, and I'll come back and do something else with it, and then um, yeah, leave it another two or three years. But React is a really interesting framework. It's been built by Facebook, and it's actually really nice and easy to kind of um, build stuff with. Um, I think the key thing here is, and you probably want to read it on the screen. Sorry, I picked a really terrible font color, haven't I? Um, Maybe I should spend more time about designing my slides than playing about on pointless apps. Um, but yeah, this was a really silly, inconsequential product to get to grips with something new. If it didn't work, you would have just been crossing your name off on a paper list and not hearing this talk at all. So it's a great place to try and learn something new. But was it worth it? I think so. Um, it seemed like it was an easier process. I'm getting nods from the back. Um, and I learned a lot. So one of the key things I'd say about learning a lot here is I'm sure we've all been in this position where you've been building stuff and you can't see the wood through the trees. Um, sometimes you'll go and ask your colleague, oh, look, I've built this thing. And they'll go, why didn't you just do that? And you suddenly realize, oh, God, that was such a simpler way of doing things. Why did I do this really overly complicated thing? And this is the kind of situation that I faced myself with earlier this week, that learning something different, learning some new tools, can show you the light. So in this particular instance, we had a, a change request of some project that we're working on. And I sat there, I got, oh god, that thing is so overly complicated. It's going to be a mess to add this thing in. And I opened up the code and looked at it again. And then that light bulb moment hit me. And just by learning React, 
uh, kind of had seen a different way of programming than writing code. And it suddenly was apparent, why don't I just do the same kind of style of coding in um, Shiny? And I went away, spent about half an hour, rewrote this entire really horrible, complicated thing, massively simplified it. I'm much happier now. So the moral of the story, go away, learn something new, and ignore your boss. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, yes, I was totally wrong. Happy to be uh, interrupted so publicly. Um, so there's no questions for Tom at the moment on the Slack. Um, so I'm just going to just give you a minute or two just to put anything in if you want to. Um, no one seems to be typing either. Um, <clears throat> this is the moment when I should have a question for Tom, of course, isn't it? Um, so you shouldn't have a question because I proved you wrong, so... Yeah, that's true. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just too furious. Um, oh no! Well, I did have a question actually. Yeah, which is um, so the I mean, I just dawned on me when we were talking about this. So I mean, it's kind of obvious, but so React is reactive, isn't it? That's why it's called React. Yes. So do you want to just talk about maybe other JavaScript frameworks and just whether you could have used them and just that about it just in fact, just that kind of thing? Could I talk about other? Yeah, um, maybe. Um, <laughs> so as I kind of alluded to, I've, I've done bits of JavaScript programming over time and gone from you know, back in the very early days of everything was hard coded and there's all these weird bugs to get around in JavaScript because Microsoft implemented it differently to Netscape and then everyone else tried to make it into a war to build a bigger and better browser. Um, so now we've got all these really interesting frameworks that solve a lot of problems for you. Um, the other one that I've played about with in the past was Angular. Um, and have I got a good reason for why I wanted to learn React? Not really, no. There's no justified reason. I just wanted to give it a go. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Simon Wellesley Miller says, could you publish some more info about getting automated emails through NHS.net? That's a common thing we have on the Slack, isn't it? So, yes. Is it so, on um, demos and how-tos, in fact? No. I'm going to write a blog post about it. So, yeah, it's, it's a very common problem, and I think... Uh, yeah, this, the security around NHS.net has been made really tight for good reason. Um, so it does make it difficult. You just need to know the right questions to ask of IT. So it's getting an application specific account. Um, if you do that and say, I want SMTP access, they should probably argue with you for a bit until you justify your reason, but you'll eventually get one and then you can automate um, things like this. So, yeah. Excellent, we've got another question now actually that's come through. How many megabytes did the React front end add to the page? Some. Um, <laughs> I mean, was it that obvious that I've just been playing about I mean, this is a joke? I didn't check anything important like that. Um, I, I don't think much, because it doesn't seem to take long to load. So less than five megabytes, maybe. I'll have a look. I think there are ways to optimize it to make it much, much smaller in size. I didn't bother doing anything like that. And there's just, to finish, we'll just finish with a comment. There's a comment about um, someone's mentioned the NHS UK React Components Library. So oh, wow, cool. I mean, that's a great thing. A lot of stuff like this, like that QR code scanner, actually decoding those images, God knows how you do it. Very clever stuff. Someone's built a library. I think Google built a library, and then someone built a library on top of that to make it easy to add into stuff. So, yeah, stand on the shoulders of giants. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much to Tom. Uh, that was an emergency talk, so... Um, very well done. I will now hand over to Pavel, who's going to be talking about, he's going to mention the unconference, which I mentioned earlier, yes. um, but he's also going to have some other uh, topics for us as well. See if my slides show up and if my mic is on. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop. Wait, that's my face. Awesome. Before we start talking, I'll plug the unconference a wee bit. You've seen us putting it next to the T. Essentially, tomorrow we're giving, uh, we're given an extra room. Uh, in which we'll be able to, throughout the whole day, have we meetings around subjects that people find interesting. If there, you think there's a bunch of people here who would want to chat about something, fill in one of these rectangular cards and stick it on the schedule of tomorrow. There are little gaps. There's almost no spaces left last time I looked. So if you have something to talk with other people about, oh, I'm louder here, um, then do, do, do it. I think the audio is better when I stand here priest style. Um, right, I'm brought here to fight your post-lunch slump. 
you feeling post lunch? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll talk a tiny bit for about 10 minutes, maybe 15, about teaching programming to non-programmers. I'm a teacher, but I teach in medical school or in something called Asher Institute. And my colleague Brittany in a second will talk with you a little bit about it, but I'll entertain you. Um, hopefully, a little bit talking about how we do it. This is my other job. We, I make audio books for NHS. Yay. Um, okay, do you know this person? Yeah? How many years are between them? This is a rhetorical question. 23. And it's important that Pikachu went through all this journey. So, the teaching I'm used to is this type of teaching. This is a coding bootcamp. Every student is given the identical MacBook, no installation problems. No different versions of software. They have the same literally cloned laptop and they work together in groups like that. And I'll talk to you a little bit how that impacted how we teach in Edinburgh Uni. Um, uh, and essentially, how do you teach programming? Wait, so when I stand here, can you hear me? Awesome. Whee! How do you teach programming to uh, not programming? So it's. Um, not, they don't necessarily care about it, they don't want to be coders but they're like yourselves. And uh, I deliver these courses in medicine, in business school, literature, and politics, essentially, where I'm giving a bunch of people whose life would be way better if they get their hands on some Python or some R, and essentially, if they learn how to do it properly. I used to think that the dog is the Python and I am the person. Now I know it's the other way around. Right? We really sort of look out to the computer and go, just compile, just knit, or whatever it's called in, in R these days, right? So essentially, we figured the only way to do this, the only way to teach like that, is to gamify the hell out of it. You know, to essentially make it, make it fun, make it modular. Think about it. I'm teaching at so many departments, so many courses. How do you do it so I don't have to make these materials again and again? And that's close to your heart. This is blinking. It's, it's not blinking when I'm not looking. <laughs> we have a ghost in the, ghost in the room. Amazing. Uh, it's probably the cable or my laptop. Um, so how to do it so it's social? When you have a bunch of people who've never done this before, the dev team is coming to help. Tum, tum, tum. Oh, ooh, oh no, oh no. It's not me, it's you. It's your HTML for him. But it's great anyway. Right, I'll not touch the computer. It's part of being able to touch it all the time. Right, so essentially, it's all have to be social. It has to be gentle. It really sort of has to be about me. Um, this is just acknowledgement to all the charities and wonderful people who over the last four years allowed me to prototype my courses on them. This is quite nice. When you want to teach people, uh, they will allow you to teach sort of dog food quality courses on them. Uh, dog food is a technical term used by Google means not yet ready. Um, do you know what a badge is? Badge, like scouts, you know scouts have like, I can tie knots, I can canoe, or whatever. Um, so essentially, I broke down the skill of programming into a bunch of about 30, 40 badges. Each badge you can absorb in about an hour. By the way, this is called Ukrainian dolls these days, um, where essentially you're assembling a skill out of smaller skills. And there's always this question, you know, which was first? Come on, slides, we can do this. You probably figured that I love my slides dearly. It's blinking, it's blinking. Anyway, there's an egg and a chicken on the slide. Um, and they're having a conversation. Yay! Right, what, essentially what we do, one badge consists of some video materials and then there's exercises and then essentially sort of like a tweet. I'll talk a little bit about them, but visualize it. I built lots of them. Some of them are about text, some of them about data munching, some of them about machine learning, and I am assembling courses for different needs, sort of for different students, you know, so, so they can go on a learning journey. I'll switch to my teacher voice now, and I'll show you in a demo. So for example, you know, you walk, you're a janitor, you walk into a room, and all they told you is that in this room, one of the light bulbs doesn't work. How do you do it? Right? <laughs> in this room, one of the projectors doesn't work. <laughs> Heavens. Right, essentially, there's a bunch of switches and there's a bunch of light bulbs. What I would do, I would start toggling them and seeing what blinks. Does that make sense? Is that what you would do? Now, programming is more like this. You have a million knobs, 
and million light bulbs, and they all sort of pulsate. So just switching things on and on is not going to fly. Or rather, programming, as you know, it's more like this. This is a very, very old buzzer system somewhere in Portugal. Um, this is a, a black slide somewhere in Portugal. So essentially what we do, we use a lot of cooking metaphors, because why not? And we're teaching people about figuring out what is expected and what is the actual thing, and then you do your testing. I've spoken to a bunch of people who work on quality assurance and stuff. And also, it's a micro pattern, just to show you. So essentially, then we can assemble from these badges big, big courses, two-day workshops, week-long workshops, 11-week-long workshops, anything sort of we, we want to do. And then we're using something called flipped classroom. Do you know what a flipped classroom is? Yeah, this is some hands from my team. That's cheating. Um, <laughs> Essentially, you consume the knowledge that you don't need the teacher for at home. And if it's fun enough, you actually end up consuming it. And because I make it, it is fun enough. Um, so then, essentially, you come and we do the coding together. We do the coding when you have your partner, which brings us to the pair programming. Essentially, it's always, but it's in a very big room. It's not like boutique pair programming like on this photo. Essentially, you have two people, um, including a rubber duck. You probably know about rubber ducks already, right? Yep. By the way, if I'm running out of time, someone throws a bottle at me. Um, you always have two students and one computer, and they pass the keyboard around. It sort of works like this, right? Every 10 minutes, we have this massive beeping clock, and they pass the keyboard, and they take turns coding and accompanying the person who's coding, which is quite amazing, and we've been doing this very successfully online over the last few years. What becomes very important in this sort of social programming is that you have very good infrastructure. And I know how geeky you all are about Quartro? Quartro? Quartro. Like, essentially, good infrastructure saves you a lot of time. So we've been heavily leaning on GitHub, something like Collab, which Edinburgh Uni has, called Notable. But it's quite important for this to be just smooth. Really? Really? Right, the final bit in this puzzle is Self-reflection. You all probably know that when you're learning something, you essentially end up taking notes. So I saw this in a junior, junior school, like when you're six or seven and you're in school. In Scotland, they get you to do something called three stars and a wish. So when my student is watching a video, I don't ask them to write bullet points of headlines, of headings. I ask them to, to tell me three things that brought them joy. Find me three things in this book, in this notebook, in this video, three things that sparked some, some star in your heart, but also give me one thing that you wish you understood better. One thing you wish that was different, that you were better. And you know, when you have 200 students in a room, very much like here, uh, there, we create something called community of vulnerability. I'm not the only person who doesn't understand logarithmic math. Half of you, neither do. Even I'm not gonna ask you to raise a hand, uh, right? But it, what happens is people essentially are not afraid to talk about stuff that they wish they sort of got better. And we ask these in some boot camps sort of every hour. We ask students to just put a little dot on a feedback mechanism. This is a GIF of a feedback mechanism we use. So we sort of know from these self-reflections and other places how, how we're doing. I'm gonna almost skip through this bit, but we do now teach it with 20 students in the room and 20 students online and we group them together. They're per program together, essentially. Sometimes both humans are in a room, sometimes both humans are, uh, sorry, online, sometimes both are in person, and sometimes uh, not. I told you we talk about ghost, right? What happens when we teach in this mixed hybrid environment that some of you are in a room and some of you are online, the teachers are cru cruising through the room in one of the realms. And essentially, we have this rule that a teacher is always online. So what happens, I suddenly see you perk up your head, look right and left, because you hear Pavel in your earphones. But it's not me, Pavel, standing in front of you. I actually, I'm hiding in a cupboard uh, or, or something, and I'm helping you. So it's quite amazing how you end up creating communities where communities didn't exist, or rather these sort of human experiences, like, like ghosty thing. Before I pass on to Brittany, all of the badges are Creative Commons. So all of the videos, all of the code, everything we create is available out there, right? Uh, because we have a bunch of courses using, using these badges. And indeed, I'm taking other people's materials and with their um, blessing. Uh, 
um, I'm sort of building, uh, turning them into even more materials. And then uh, I was initially based in business school. Yes, we ran out of funding for slides, that's why it's black. Um, I was initially built, uh, based in business school and they were uh, literally saying, you cannot give your courses away. We're making a fortune here, uh, uh, charging these people to be our students. So essentially we're using a freemium model. All of the materials are free, but if you come to the course, what happens, you get your weekly tutorials, you get your pair programming partners, all the feedback, all the uh, assessments, for example. And actually, to finish, I think Brittany's coming next. I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, but what happens is we have this rule that assessment has to be fun to mark. Because if I have 200 students <laughs> submitting the same report, I'm just gonna hate myself for three weeks of marking. But uh, uh, we do stuff that we don't have to. Brittany, what is Usher Institute? Let me tell you. So the Usher Institute is based at the University of Edinburgh. As a Pavel has beautifully described it, it's sort of like if you imagine informatics and the medical school had a baby, you would get the Usher Institute and it would be branded in orange. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about briefly is some of the teaching that Pavel contributes to, and you've seen a brief preview of how wonderful and innovative and enticing and engaging that teaching material is as part of the health and social care DDI talent program. Lots of words, I appreciate. Um, DDI being data-driven innovation, which sounds very fancy, because it is, and this is funded by the Edinburgh and Southeast Scotland City Region deal. So this is based, as I say, at the University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, but what we offer is learning pathways, not just for people based in Edinburgh. Um, so talent program is our teaching program, and these are the really cool foundations that we have. What I'm gonna focus on today, just now though, is the black screen, but the second one, if you can see it when it comes back, is the learning and career pathways. So our goal as a talent program is to upskill health and social care professionals and students who are interested in health and social care in order to get the most out of data and really have an impact of data-driven innovation in this sphere. So how we do that is through teaching and through learning, and we do that in a variety of ways. So this uh, sort of shows our offering, if you will, and we have a really scalable offering as well. So it's founded in the core program, which is our online MSc Data Science for Health and Social Care. And as I say, this is online. We have students from all around the world joining us, and it's a really wonderful learning environment. I teach on that program, and I learn just as much from my students, arguably more, than I'm actually able to teach them because they bring so many different perspectives. So we have that core program, and then we feed that up into CPD, which is Continuing Professional Development courses, as well as at an undergraduate level. So we have some really exciting new programs being developed at an undergraduate level in the medical school with the BMED side Data Science and Health and Social Care Intercalated degree. Um, so that's just for you to know sort of what, what our offering is. And I'm now gonna pitch to you very briefly. Um, if you're passionate about teaching, if you have a really cool health and social care related data-driven project that you'd like to talk to our students about, we would be more than happy to, to invite you to give us a talk, maybe contribute to some teaching. If you have open data that you're willing to share, I will also be happy to take that and use it for teaching materials. Um, and just lastly, I will mention that if you're interested in this or if there's any information that you'd like to perhaps upskill yourselves around or if uh, maybe you have some colleagues who'd like to be upskilled. Um, our CPD courses might be quite interesting to, to this audience. So these are one-off courses that you can get credit for. So for example, we have one called uh, Health Data Science, very on the nose. And this is, we've upskilled over 360 students so far, and we've introduced them to R very delicately and passionately, and so they can begin their R journey. Um, and we have some stickers as well in the back. This might be engaging for you. Beautiful stickers in the back and also um, some leaflets that's on sort of the main table. And there's also stickers there uh, from Code Bar, which I will also pitch to you very briefly, uh, which is a really wonderful um, charity organization about diversifying the tech space. Uh, so if you're interested in tech and diversity, also have a look back there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'll unplug it. So this is supposed to go black. Yay. Awesome. Uh, so thank you. I don't know if there are questions or are we passing on? We'll probably run over time. Yay. No, no, it doesn't go away that easy. We've not run over time. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do contribute towards the unconference tomorrow. I don't know if you can hear me. Boop, boop. Um, so there's, there's still quite a bunch of spots. If there's something you want to discuss with everyone else, do put it on We Sticker and do it tomorrow. Uh, what are you saying? There are no questions. Yes, no, there is a, well, there's a question for me, and I'm hoping while I'm reading it, I'm answering it, someone else will ask a question. 
Um, so uh, my question is about, you talked about uh, what I'm assuming is teaching people with no background in programming. So I'm just wondering, because sometimes we have people who have maybe SQL experience or VBA. So have you got any comments about if people have made a bit of a start, if it's a different process or? Yep. So what we do, uh, on, depending on a course, uh, we would have say 20 or even 120 students, every single one with a different background. So what we do each session, if it's a boot camp, every hour you get a new partner. Every hour you work with a different student. And every hour you learn from someone who might be on a different place in their programming journey, right? So in some ways, it's a little bit like, you know the traffic sign roadworks, like a person with a shovel? You know how it becomes more readable, the more dirty it is. It's actually designed to be dirty. So in these courses, the more diverse the group is, I've seen over the last six years of using pair programming, the more diverse group is in terms of skill, the better it works. I know it's counterintuitive, but try it, trust me. Um, okay, well we don't, I don't think we've got any more questions that have come through. No, okay, so that was yes, I mean it seems churlish to mention it really because that talk was so brilliantly done, but that was offered also at the last moment as well, wasn't it? So thank you very much for that, that's excellent. We've had a couple of dropouts recently, so that's good. Um, we are running a little bit ahead of time now. Uh, I'm just going to jump off the stage and grab my notes. Right, so I don't have any slides for this bit, which is very uh, off-brand for me. Um, so yes, as I say, so uh, well, as you've seen on the program, so we've had a couple, I think COVID has uh, claimed a few of our um, possible speakers um, today. So we've cobbled together this, and I think mine is the most cobbled together of all of it. I, I didn't want to just leave this as a blank space. We did think about shuffling the talks around, but then we didn't, we obviously thought people online would be confused as to when things were. So we wanted to run the program as it was. Um, and I didn't want to, well, I mean, you may disagree at the end of this, you might think, you know, you should have just let me go and stretch my legs, but I didn't want to do that, I wanted to use it productively. Um, and so this is the way that I want to use it productively. Um, so this is quite a special year. As I mentioned this morning, I, I was feeling, I mean, there's loads of people here. I am gonna go away and check to see if we have a record attendance. So, I mean, it's always been very well attended this conference, but it's really great. It's just funny, there's no one in this kind of front bit, but then it's, it's absolutely packed at the back. Um, so, but this is the first year um, that we're under sort of, it's the, what, what's the expression I'm looking, it's not poached turn going, I don't know what it is really. So um, this is the first year basically that we've had a sort of the new management. So Mohammed, who's sitting at the back, Mohammed, um, he's the sort of grandfather of NHSR uh, and he'll be our sort of um, president for life kind of thing. Um, but he has handed over the reins, um, partly to me and Zoe and partly to uh, others in the team, such as Tom, um, and Kaylee, and, and we've also co-opted Nat as well late in our continuing mission to make everybody care about data science. Um, so I, I think it's re this conference is very deliberately very similar to last year. That's the first thing that I want to say. I didn't want to come in, so I've been in my post now for about 10 months. It's only really my job to worry about NHSR for the last 10 months. Um, so we ran the same conference again. I put the same venue with the same size with the same, you know, it was very deliberately. Other than a tweak with the Python room becoming an unconference, um, it's all the same. So what I want to talk to you about today and hopefully maybe provoke a conversation on Slack or maybe provoke some, I'll check the questions myself uh, in a moment when I've uh, talked a bit and we can maybe have a bit of a, um, a slight back and forth. Um, so we can look, you know, very fundamentally at what NHSR is, what it does. So I want that to be to be quite quite um, wide ranging, really. Um, so where where sh where shall I start? What shall I talk about first? Well, let's talk about the conference first, since we're all sitting in it. Um, so just to make clear, so often you get a survey when you've been to a conference, and we will be sending you a survey. Um, but I think sometimes when they send that survey, they just want you to tick all the boxes. Yes, I had a nice time because they want to run the same conference next year because it's just easy for them to keep running the same conference over and over. Speaking of someone that's run two conferences in the space of one year, I can say that's definitely true. Um, but in this case, I, I want to emphasize to you that it's a very genuine offer that we want to really rethink this. There are loads of different ways that we could run this conference. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we've spent what I would consider, it's not our money in the sense of it doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to everybody. And it's being spent for the purpose of making healthcare analytics better. Now I consider this conference to be an extremely cost-effective and ex excellent way of doing that, and I'm presuming that everybody sitting in this audience does too. Um, 
but there are other ways that we could have spent that money. So, for example, one of the things we talked about is we could just have a remote conference. And we could spend the money that we say, oh, someone shake the head out there already. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. So this is all the kind of opinions we want to be hearing. So um, we could run a remote conference. We could run a conference with multiple streams. We could run, we could just go in with a hacker. We could, um, I don't know if anyone's not familiar with the hacker brand, you might not be. So we ran a two-day conference in July, Health and Care Analytics Conference. It was the first one of its type. Um, we could just throw in a hand with them and just have a sort of uh, NHSR, NHS PyCom stream there. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. We're really thinking seriously about what the conference looks like, how we're spending money, what you want, what you want to see. Do you want workshops? Do you want hacks? Do you want online things before, after, whatever? Um, you know, and this is, it's very much, I mean, it's always been a, a community effort, but I feel like it's almost, um, as I say, it's, it's passed into the hands of people who came off as community members now. So I want to really emphasize that now. Um, so that's the first thing that I want you all to be thinking about. Uh, the second thing that I want you all to be thinking about is um, the governance of NHSR. It's not, a, it's not a very exciting word, is it, governance? Um, but, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, we've, we haven't done as much uh, consulting with the community and the committee as we would have liked to have done um, because we've been getting used to the roles and so on and so forth. So some of the decisions I think we've made away from all the influences that we should have had. Um, but we are always making a sincere, sincere effort to listen to people on the Slack and informally and through other water channels we have. Um, but we want to start putting better governance around this process. We did used to have a technical advisory group um, back in the day, and we haven't had a session of that for a while, but I want to repurpose that, and I want to make sure basically there are voices in the committee that are being brought together regularly um, to discuss uh, some of the things that should happen. Um, because although I feel like a lot of the people that I deal with with NHSR, you know, can represent to me what people are thinking. There might be lots of other people thinking all sorts of other things, um, such as about the conference. Um, so I wanted to flag that with you. That basically been off our radar because of the conference basically we've been absolutely um, stacked up thinking about that. But um, yes, look out for that. So we're making a sincere effort basically to reach out um, for more people to, to influence what we're doing. Um, so that's the third thing, no, that's, sorry, that's the second thing that I want to talk about. And the third thing that I want to talk about is, sorry, let me just check how we're doing for time. Oh yeah, fine. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about, is, and it will be the subject of an unconference tomorrow, but again, I want to flag it. Um, so I will be at the unconference. Um, I think, when did I put it? I can't remember. Might be in the afternoon sometime. Um, we've also for a long time struggled with branding of the NHSR community. So obviously this is the first NHSR NHS PyCom conference and we're all um, happily here rubbing shoulders together. Um, so NHSR is a very powerful brand. Um, the, that phrase features many, I did count once, I can't remember, I think it's 17 times in the Goldacre report. Um, it is a very strong brand, but I think ever since it came up, we came up with it, we've struggled with it because it, it's not just the NHS. So there are lots of people in this room who don't work for the NHS, um, and it's not just R either. Um, so, and I don't think it's even just Python either. I mean, Tom was just up here talking about React, wasn't he? And I don't think we should have all been throwing tomatoes and saying, shut up, we don't want to hear about that, get to the blast job a bit. Um, so, but clearly, you know, there's an issue with, we don't want to be too over-inclusive, do we? We don't want it to make it just everything because then it just kind of falls apart and becomes uninteresting. Um, Zoe and I have talked about this many times and uh, maybe I'll do a proper presentation about it one day, but I think there's something very interesting about the kind of, the size of, of, of communities and what they're interested in. There is a sort of perfect size, I think. Um, if they're too small, then they're not welcoming enough to new members and they're not, uh, they're not diverse, they don't have enough diverse perspectives. They're, they're missing things that they could be missing. Um, and if they're too big, it just stops feeling like a community. Um, so, you know, that's something that I think, well, I want us all to think seriously about something that I have been thinking seriously about. Um, so yes, and of course, the other thing that's been added to the mix recently is the NHSR, um, no, not NHSR, sorry, is the hacker brand. So that's the Health and Care Analytics Conference. NHSR didn't really do much at Hacker this year. That wasn't because I didn't want NHSR to do much at Hacker. It was just because it's just more work and it's just really hard to get, you know, to be represented well at, at everything. Um, so, but, you know, what I personally want for NHSR is I want NHSR to be at Hacker somehow, however that would be done, and to promote what we're doing, basically. Not to say, ha, we've got all the answers, you know, what's all this, 
but just to say, because there will be people there who really just don't know anything about R in Python. They might have heard of it, possibly, um, but they won't know any of the clever things that we're doing. Um, and so, um, although I think it's really nice to come together as a community like this, because we all speak the same language and we're all going to get on with each other, I think it's also really important to reach outside of uh, the group that we're in now and kind of promote what we're doing. I think the other thing that's really interesting about Hacker, sorry to put my Hacker hat on, but I do unfortunately wear it from time to time, is there is a slight focus on decision making, management, leadership, all that kind of a strand. And picking up on what Chris Maney was saying earlier, um, I really like the talk to Chris Maney, sorry to go off topic. Um, I think that Chris Maney's talk for me was a real sign of kind of half hour we've come. So I think the first conference, I, was it 2018? I think the first conference I went to. And I don't, well, I don't know. I don't know what you were all thinking, but I d wasn't aware of anybody thinking the kind of things that Chris Maney was thinking. I think we were all just sitting in a room being angry that nobody was listening to us. That's how it felt. Um, but now all of us as a community, the Chris Maney's and others that I could name, um, are starting to really think about how we can, um, you know, productionize it in a sort of organizational sense of this. How can we, we get this show on the road? Um, and Hacker's a really good way of doing that. It's a really good way of doing that because of, of all the analysts there who will look at it and go, oh, wow, look at that. You can do that in five minutes. That took me a week last week. Um, and also decision makers and leaders uh, and all that kind of thing. Right, okay, so I think I've used uh, quite a chunk of my time now. And I'm going to slightly awkwardly uh, just have a quick look in the Slack and see if anybody is... Um, is talking about stuff. Um, yeah, go for it, yeah. Can we have, uh, what, which mic is that? Is that mic two? Hello. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Sam, people. Just to interrupt, because there's a lot of conversation, and to get through it all by skimming it would be quite difficult, I think. What's come out a couple of times is accessing the knowledge in the room through a hackathon type thing or training. I think really what's coming out from some of the discussion is it works both ways, the flexibility, but there's probably a lot more to be discussed about conferences. But the key feature for me is the conversations and getting knowledge from people. And sometimes that works virtually and sometimes that works in person. So I think that's what people are looking for. Maybe even the problem solving thing that we always want to do, um, if that's fair to say. Yeah, so I think it's, it's a sort of question of emphasis, isn't it here really? So, um, and we, we did talk, we did do, do talk, I think a hack is a good point actually, it's worth, I'm glad someone mentioned that because we did talk about doing a hack um, in the, where the on-conference is. Um, and we were dissuaded by one of the voices in the group and I think, um, because it's really hard to do well. So I think the thing about a hack is I've, um, and I do agree with this, is if we're gonna do a hack, then we're almost not doing something else. And I suppose that's kind of the conversation I'm trying to trigger with you all today, is we have, I mean, I love NHSR. As many of you know, I've probably done way more for NHSR than I'm really supposed to um, throughout my career. Um, and I will, you know, I will always do whatever I can um, but at, at a certain point, you do start making hard choices about should we have a two-day conference or a one-day conference and three hacks, or you know, it's those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, it's it's about you know what we want to see and wh where we think we can uh, most uh, get the benefit. And I'm just going to throw this in as metrics about communities. I've been trying. It was a book review that you gave me, Tom. This um, suggestion of how to do metrics on communities. It's quite hard to do. And I just want to uh, sort of point out that you said one metric is that you can count the, say, comments in a week, and then you need to divide it by the comments over a month. Now, if we start this week, our Slack is going to <laughs> be something to really work towards because we're getting a lot of activity in our Slack um, channels, which is really nice. So I think my difficulty, just to throw it there, is how do we think maybe outside of our usual processes of meetings and conferences and hacks, things that we've done before because the community has changed over time. Ours is actually over four countries, if we like to call them countries or nations. Where do we go to explore these ideas of doing things that we've never done before? Yeah, indeed. And of course, I think the other voice that we really want, and this is always true, isn't it, is the people who 
would get involved with NHSR and HSPICOM, but don't because of something that we could do something about. And it's really hard to hear from those voices, obviously, because they're not necessarily engaged with us. Um, again, going back perhaps to a little bit of what Chris Manny was talking about, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're, um, you know, signposting people to communities and people. And if, uh, if they're not working for whatever reason, if you've got a team, imagine you've got a new team who don't really use um, R or Python and you point them in the direction of these communities and they kind of turn their nose up at it, then you know, that's, that's really valuable learning. And that's the kind of thing where we ask ourselves, well, why, you know, why is it? Is it the language that we're using? Is it the projects that we're doing? Is it, um, you know, what, what, what is it? Okay, so I think I'm gonna wrap up soon because we're just about at the next point. Is there any other points from the site before we do? Not directly, but just to direct you to go and maybe look at them to answer and we can collate them together. But I think that's summarized very well. Yes, so please do talk about any of the issues I've raised in the Slack. Please do come along to my on-conference session, which I should have looked up when it was, but forgot. Um, but you'll know it's me because it's got my name on it. Uh, tomorrow, and as I say, I don't know quite what we're gonna put in the survey, but I do want to really get some good feedback about what, what you, what's really important to you. Not do you want a two day conference with some you know, nice food, because we all want that, don't we? But what's, what's really important, what will really make a difference? Okay, so I hope that was better than 10 minutes of shuffling around, but you can tell me that in the social if it wasn't. Um, with that, I shall now introduce the next speaker, uh, Steve Piper, who'll be talking about using R to automate the generation of performance matrices from fingertips. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. A um, little bit about myself before I go into my lightning talk. I work in public health in local authorities, so a little bit different uh, to many of us here. Uh, I have a background in public health intelligence, uh, but what I would say is that I'm not a data scientist. Uh, I'm not an analyst. So I do feel a little bit of an imposter being here today, walking amongst real data scientists. Um, so whilst my pr pr presentation is probably high in terms of impactability, it's probably low in terms of technical content around R. Uh, so there's four problems that I wanted to solve with R. One was to look at uh, OHID uh, fingertips data. I wanted to interrogate that to look at all quartile D indicators for my local authority. I wanted to provide a monthly data update for teams to say what information has been updated in the last month. Uh, I wanted to uh, use fingertips to provide a performance uh, matrix and also wanted fingertips to uh, sorry, I wanted R to be able to produce uh, a data visual, interesting data visuals. So they were the four absolute problems I wanted to solve. Just for those that you don't know about Fingertips, Fingertips is a marvelous package by OHID. It includes about 1,600 indicators in there. Each indicator is possibly divided by gender, so ranging around 2,500 indicators on, on there. Uh, does some beautiful presentations, and it also has a wonderful API. What I'm going to talk about is the API and how I've used that to download the data and interrogate it. So the first problem I tried to solve was the quartile D problem. And you can see on the far side, that's the information that comes from fingertips. Uh, it's very flat. It doesn't include it on the, on the nice visuals and fingertips I had to work with uh, as my solution. And the solution looks like a typical sort of data matrix. Doesn't look particularly fantastic or clever, I'm sure you would say. Uh, however, for me to get to that point, took about 15 tables. So I had to write about 15 tables to bring all this data together. And I was surprised more than anyone else when it worked. Um, it evaluated everything and it picked out all the quartile D. So it's absolutely fantastic. It answered the question. And as you can probably appreciate, two and a half thousand indicators to do manually would just not be possible. So R was my solution, uh, my go-to product. When I did that, the most, most obvious thing to do next then was to look at all the other quartiles. That produced reams and reams of uh, lines of data. So here you can see quartile Ds and Cs, as well as an A in there. So the logical thing to do was then to use ggplot, which I did uh, in conjunction with patchwork, and I worked out the deciles at the top, and then the quartiles at the bottom, and then that gave the distribution. We could say how many quartile Ds we'd had in proportion to the others. And the, um, the plot package lined those up nicely, so you kind of got an approximation between the two. So that's problem one that I solved. You can appreciate two and a half thousand indicators to do manually, that's why I used R. And it worked, and it took me about, once I'd written the code, about an hour and a half to run the script and to get that data for the answers. The next problem I wanted to solve was to do a surveillance report every month to update colleagues on all the indicators that are changed on fingertips. Fingertips does identify when indicators have been updated, 
but it's more by good luck or, or um, chance that you find that out. There's no tool on fingertips to do that. So I used, recycled some of the other code that I'd used on the other product. Uh, fingertips, own, so fingertips only gets downloaded through an API through a unique identification. So it doesn't work on date ranges and I wanted to work on date ranges. So there was a bit of learning I had to do about understanding how to do code on date ranges. But again, the product worked really well. When I've delivered this product now for the last couple of months, giving updates, and it's been really interesting to hear people's feedback to say, oh, I didn't even know those indicators were on fingertips. Uh, the last tranche that we did had a load of indicators around H, uh, H um, so, sorry, around uh, uh, various diseases, and people that were interested in health protection were able to understand that those indicators even existed and evaluated those. So that was really helpful. Um, and this is, I use ggplot and the tile uh, function on the geome to produce that nice little visual that accompanied it. Um, the next tool I use, a, a slight variation, but the key with this is this is the data matrix that I developed. And what I did here was use local data, which is in here. So local data obviously is on fingertips on the overhead uh, website. And I spliced that together with the overhead data here. So I've created a, an indicator which includes local data and national data and does the evaluation through uh, the various condition format in there. Um, and then the, the last kind of approach to this. So what you can see, I'm kind of building up a a package, a data suite, a package of uh, products to understand data. And one of my jobs in my local authority is to explain data. And I really wanted to provide some tools for people to use that left nowhere to hide when it looked at the performance. Um, so this is the indicator information that you get from fingertips, which is really good. Uh, I wanted to sort of do that a bit more localized about my local authority. So I use ggplot for this tool. And on this, you can see there's a couple of key features. It evaluates the England uh, average in terms of best, worst, or uh, similar. Uh, and where it says Anon here, I've just redacted that because I don't want to be distracted about looking at other authorities' performance. But where it says Anon, they're all the statistical neighbors that are very similar to my own local authority. So we can judge my own local authority here for smoking at the time of delivery. And then we can say, well, why is our authority up there when similar ones are actually doing much better down here? And when I say about doing visuals that leave nowhere to hide, I think this is really a, a good way of kind of clearing the clutter and, and, and explaining that in a, a really simple term about uh, seeing where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the other authorities. Uh, the data then, you know, it's, it, I'm cheating now because I'm just using, recycling the data, but using the facet, I can then do the time series from the same data sets. And then because from my experience, people struggle with box plots, I've done this visual, which is again based on statistical neighbors to try and understand the clustering around the interquartile range and also in, uh, particularly on this one around quartile B and the unfortunate outlier at the end. And then this is one I really like because it does strip it right down to the, the absolute simplicity of data and performance. It again, it includes the, the, the RAG rating, but it includes the average here. And you can see really clearly that the home authorities identified there. So all you need to do for these indicators, when I go into meetings now, I've got a, a batch of these kind of visuals that I use. I type the indicator number in and it turns out these visuals and I can produce them very quickly. And I find them very impactful and able to help me tell the story about the data. Um, so what I've shown you, uh, four, four problems, four solutions which I've used R for. Um, I think when I showed the first visual, I uh, said that it looked deceptively simple, but there was 15 tables that underpinned it. And, in, and this is my representation of that. So whilst when I set out on my R journey to use this, bearing in mind I've only been using R for about 20 weeks, uh, it is a bit of a side hustle for me. I don't do it as my job. It's just something I've been doing in my own time. I thought it'd be really easy. I thought I would just sort of download the data. And then in, in the same way you do with Excel, just do filters, but it was far from that. And this shows how I built it up. So for the surveillance project I did, uh, at the far end you can see there's over 100,000 observations. That was just for April. Um, I had to break those observations down into three tables, male, female, and uh, persons. And then for each of those tables, I had to break them down to look at the current local authority indicators, the past performance. Uh, I had to look for the England average, and then I had to calculate all the quartiles. And then I brought those together back into a single data frame 
uh, and then came down here. And then you can see profile information, polarity and updates were all separate tables in fingertips and they all had to be brought forward into a single data, uh, what I've called the metadata frame here. And when that all calculates for April, it goes from over 100,000 observations down to 116 observations. And like I say, that was a really kind of helpful uh, product which helped people understand what was happening on, on a monthly basis. So my journey for ours has sort of been 20 weeks and this has been my learning. So in terms of commands that I've used, I mean, I've not been a programmer in a previous life. So I've learned all those commands there. Used lots of different data visualizations. Um, a lot of the reports which I've produced in terms of the, uh, the sort of long reports, I've, I've used Cable Extra for, uh, but ggplot for, for many of the, the other data visuals. Got used to using lots of different libraries and uh, they're the calculations that I've used. So from a, a local authority point of view, I think from my, my experience, we don't use R very much. I'm, I'm the only person I know in my local authority that's using it. Uh, I was given a problem to solve around the quartile Ds. R was absolutely fantastic at helping me do that once I'd understood the code and able to use that code effectively. And hopefully now there's an opportunity for me to work with colleagues within the council to extend my knowledge about R and get other people using it. So that's been uh, my journey and uh, how I've used R and I think it's been indispensable and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks very much, sorry, there might be one, one quick question. That is quite amazing, isn't it? Starting on and then 20 weeks later presenting the NHSR conference. That is absolutely, yeah, that's a brilliant performance, that. Um, right, so I'm just gonna ask one quick question. Um, someone, uh, which one shall I pick? Uh, mm, let's go with this one. What do you wish R did differently? Uh, I think it's not always intuitive. I think some of the commands uh, could be more intuitive. Uh, so I'll probably say that I think ggplot can take, you know, some difficulty to sometimes get your head around the logic of it. Um, I often spend some of my time sort of cutting and pasting code and then trying to unpick it and, and learn it that way. Um, so I think it could be a bit more intuitive, but it's a, it's a great product. And it does, I think, from people that use, tend to use Excel in local authorities, there's a big mind jump to go to, to R because of the, the different way in, 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 in that it works. Sure, great. Okay, thanks very okay, much. thank you. Right, so now we have, with the final lightning talk of this session, uh, Richard Wilson, who will be talking about generating outcome framework slide packs for ICSs. So Steve has kindly helped by doing a lot of the stuff in fingertips to get you to coffee quicker. So, um, as usual with the sort of requests you get, the My Integrated Care Partnership, they run locally here, um, wants to create an outcome framework. So they went away and identified 151 indicators uh, with seven domains at uh, NHICS, place, locality, provider collaborative, and PCN. Now, of course, that's the sort of standard we get. So 151 indicators with seven domains. I feel calculated we're going to create something like 50,000 charts or something. So nothing, something quite simple to do. They all thought that was easy to do. Um, 90 of the indicators are already available for fingertips. So we needed a way of visualizing this quickly because um, they all said, oh, you can do it quickly. You can work more agile, can't you? So obviously they all love a slide pack, so they got a slide pack, which is a little bit of revenge for giving me 151 indicators, I've given them 210 slides. So um, you get what you ask for if you don't ask the right question, as Chris said earlier. So fingertips are, so um, Steve has already mentioned a bit of fingertips, so there's lovely fingertips, lots of really good R packages. There's a fantastic package called fingertips charts, which is maybe deprecated and has not been maintained as much as it should do but it allows you to create all the charts you see later. And it's all done for an API, so I think I was probably a number one hit on the fingertips site for quite a few weekends as I tried to work out the best way to download the data sets. Um, so Steve's given the impression that fingertips is a really tidy data set. It has cunningly hidden some time bombs in the data set. So every, not all the indicators are unique. So you think they've got 1,600 indicators, um, there's actually 1,900 in the metadata, so some are deprecated away. Some indicators are more than one gender-specific category or age group. You can't see out at the back, but it's just a couple of examples of where indicators suddenly go wrong when you try to do a join, and you wonder why you've got indicators which are coming through more times. So we have one which has actually got um, three different agendas under the same indicator. So 
you have to address that issue because otherwise you get bizarre charts. So also, not all indicators are available for latest geography. So Steve went through all that thing about bringing the data in. There's something like 20 different area types. Um, there's three for local authority and a 502, a 402, and a 302. You've got to go through every single one to find your indicators because they may not exist in the most recent. So there's a lot of going back and forward in the data set. It's quite a messy data set in that regard. Um, sometimes not available for latest counties, which is quite surprising. Um, some have only one, end, one data point on the data set. Um, some are missing denominators, so some of them have got a rate but no denominator. So when you come to do funnel charts, it drops off and goes blank. Um, so I had to create a new um, ID. Um, cunningly, because we're downloading data files, it was having a real problem with identifying hidden characters. So I had to do a string replace all because inside the data set was hidden characters. So the, you'd have, you'd have uh, indicator A would not match indicator A. And you're like standing there for ages going, why is it not working? Uh, which is not great when you're slightly dyslexic. So <clears throat> downloading the data set. You can download all the indicators for an area type, which is fine. Or you can try and download each indicator individually or for a list using a vector. So you have to do this whole thing of going through and pinging, 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 um, which is not necessarily very nice and takes a bit long time. As I say, you can indicate, you can download them all as area type ID all, but only one indicator at a time. I had 90. So I didn't plan to write out and do this 90 times because I was already having lots of this API is not available because I was basically killing a website trying to download them all. So you do have to union them all together at the end and then obviously create an RDS file just because you don't want to do it over and over and over again. So initially this talk was going to be about Markdown to do slide packs. Um, I rapidly realized that Markdown was very limited in slide packs. It's great for doing a presentation, rubbish for doing slide packs. Officer is brilliant. Um, Officer allows you to define any layout you like. If you want to have an image in the bottom left-hand corner and in a little teeny weeny box, you can set up a template for that in your, out, in your PowerPoint and you can just tell it to put it in there. So it's really, really good. Um, Markdown's a bit of a black box. As I say, Officer allows you to create your own layouts, which is really, really important for this work. Um, a good resource, there's a bit of a um, resource, because as like everybody else, I didn't know how to do this until I started stealing stuff from everybody else. Um, but uh, Officer, I, I didn't think it was going to be great, but it's fantastic. Because you can actually have multiple fonts on the same slide. If you want to have change of color in the font side, you can do all that using the um, layout. You don't have to do it in R. Uh, in Markdown, you just can't do it. Um, creating a slide pack is easy as one, two, three. You create a slide pack template in um, PowerPoint, making sure the first slide is blank, as in like you don't have any slides. Delete all slides, because otherwise your first slide will be a blank slide. Um, but you just bring in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, you decide which layout you want to use, and you just paste your content into that location in the slide. So it's as easy as that. Um, there's a little bit of code down here. It just says PH label equals title one. So I just put my title in the title one. You can have five titles if you like. Um, you can do that sort of flexibility. Um, right. Um, lots of R for people at the back so they can't read it. Um, the structure just went through a series of nested sub loops to create the slide pack. So you'd have your standard layout for one chapter, repeat it seven times, repeat it for all indicators within each. Um, I've got over 210 slides, so major success there. It's getting bigger by the day. Um, and it's really good to easy just to do your output. You just print, print my presentation and the file and name you want to use. So it's really, really easy. I used a couple of other packages. So I used fingertips charts and funnel put R. So fingertip, this is actually, this slide is actually produced by Officer. So it put all the other stuff in, all my green lines, my change, my font color. Um, so that's basically the, exactly the same as on Fingertips website. Um, there's, I just put this another slide straight from Officer, so I've got two GG plots next to each other, um, using Funnel Plotter to basically do the Funnel Plot comparison. Um, might have to use another tool because it depends if people want their Funnel Plots because it does get a bit problematical when we do have denominators. Um, you have some issues where these are two slides 
cutouts. So the one on the right-hand side is, I didn't realize, because I've got every domain has a different number of indicators, when you do some automated text, I've got some inline text just creating, or I've just done a, a series of um, text just saying if something's higher or lower than something. But Burmese is not great for lots of things, and it went off the slide, so it's gone below the blue. So you have to go back and manually edit that or work out a way of doing it. But also, when you've got too few indicators, you suddenly have massive box plots, um, which look a bit blur. They don't, aesthetically unpleasing is the way I put it. Um, so in terms of my last slide before T, Officer R is really, really flexible for PowerPoint. If you need to do a PowerPoint slide, go into use, use that tool. It's very, very good. Um, it's very efficient, and, very, and R is very efficient for using live slide packs. When they say, can you run us a slide pack off, I go, oh, yes, please, because it takes about five minutes to run off, you know, to change, make your changes, run of a slide pack, and then you send them a lovely PDF of 210 slides and go, can you please read these by an hour's time and feedback, and of course, they never read them. So it's that sort of thing where we deflect with scale and volume. Um, so we are going to have to build probably a Power BI tool for it because basically everybody uses Power BI now. But if you are going to do this, you need balanced numbers of indicators in each chapter because otherwise you'll end up with your text going off and you'll have to go back manually editing 210 slides. So it kind of becomes like a paint, you know, you get what you asked for, Richard. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind, ThinkTips is phenomenal as a resource, but it's got lots of exercise. So if you're using lots and lots of indicators, and you've set up a really nice flow, you may find out that it doesn't work because of some hidden issues within the data set. And it's all on our um, ICS GitHub, and I shall stop there. Right, thanks very much. So we're at the break now, but I think it's time for one or two quick questions. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask both, I think. Yeah, so the first one is, I'm just interested, so you, you, you said you didn't like Markdown for slides, but are you, do you mean Quarto? Have you, have you looked at Quarto? I didn't look at Quarto. I okay. was, yeah, not, I've dabbled in Quarto, but not, I was using Markdown because that's where my expertise had been. Okay. I don't know if Quarto is any better in terms of... Well, I think it is, that's why I asked, but yeah. No, 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 if not, it might well better. be, yeah. 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 It was just, because Markdown auto-selects the layout. It, it decides what layout it's going to use. So if you've got two GG plots, you hope it's going to use the right con ones next to each other. I just was getting, being honest, I was getting fed up with Markdown, kept changing it yeah, and choosing yeah. the wrong one. So therefore I went for Officer where I could have complete control. Cool, right, and last question is, how do you let your customers add their words and stuff to your fancy slide packs? So these are actually produced as PowerPoints so they can add what they like to it. So we can leave a box for them to add rationale. So I've actually, one of the slides has actually tried to bring in some of the metadata from um, fingertips, basically replicating the fingertips outcome stuff. And you can just leave it, you know, I can leave a, a empty text box for them to fill in officer. Excellent. So okay. Well, with that, we'll leave it there. So thank you again. As a very wise man once said that we should stop, collaborate and listen. And this is a fabulous opportunity to do all of those things. Um, very, very mindful of time, so let's keep things on time. So I would like to introduce Yuan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Yuan, and I'm going to talk to you about PX Text Mining, which is our natural language processing package for um, qualitative patient feedback. So just a bit of background about what we did. So it's part of a, um, a project sponsored by NHS England. And the whole aim is to support better use of qualitative patient experience data. So every day, um, NHS trusts receive thousands of patient comments, often through surveys like the friends and family test. And not all resources, um, not all trusts have the resources to be able to look through this data and analyze it and produce actionable insights. So this is why this project exists, um, thanks to NHS England, to try and help NHS trusts make better use of this um, rich wealth of data that's available to them. So um, it was a two-year project. Um, the part that I'm working on now is a continuation of what happened about two years ago with Chris Geely and Andreas Soteriadis. And the big um, thing that I'm trying to get across today is how fully open we've made this project. 
um, from all aspects, from the code through to the ways of working and the way that we're disseminating the project outputs as well. So a little bit of context around it. Um, sorry about the slides being so small. I didn't realize about the um, uh, size of the thing, but next time I'll have more slides. So the main thing that I wanted to get across was the background. So we have a creation of a qualitative framework. So we had two qualitative analysts from NHS England working on 21,000 comments um, from six participating trusts. So we had a wide variety of different types of trusts participating. Um, and they were creating a framework for categorizing the data um, and the labels or the themes would emerge inductively out from the data. Um, we also had a machine learning model that was trained with the data above. Um, and that was the bit that I'm working on and which I will spend the majority of this uh, talk about. And there was also a shiny dashboard which was um, enabling trust to explore this data. And my colleague, Oloa Sagan, um, was uh, talked about this last week in the online conference. So if you want to check out um, his talk, um, that is available. So in terms of the patient experience text mining aspect, um, we had two different targets with the data that we had. So here's an example piece of text that would, um, a piece of feedback that a patient might give. Nurses were lovely, but the ward was freezing. So we had two different targets. The first was um, the sentiment. So whether it was positive, negative, or neutral and mixed. So it could only belong to one of those categories at a time. And what was more challenging was the multi-label themes. So we had over 30 themes um, that the qualitative analysts had created. And a piece of text could have one or more themes um, attached to it. So this was a big development from the phase one of the project where it was just one theme at a time per comment. Um, in this case, you know, it's about staff manner and about environment and facilities, but a longer comment might have four or five um, themes attached to it. Um, yeah, there was no limits to the number of themes attached. So, how did we do this in an open way? So there's the usual guidelines around um, reproducible analytical pipelines, and a lot of that is applicable to machine learning as well. So things like style, um, testing, um, peer review using Git and GitHub, using open source packages and making sure that the license in our package is open. So that's you know things that you're used to and are comfortable with. But there are other ways that you can be open as well. So the first is with our data, being as open as possible with the data that we had. So the creation of this data set was a huge outcome from this project, you know, having the expertise of these two qualitative analysts, manually tagging all those comments. Um, two out of the six participating trusts agreed to make their data public as well so that other people can use this data set for training their own models if they wish to. Um, and we've saved the train test split seed so people can see if they did have access to the full data set, you could see exactly which data was used for the training of the model and which data was used for the testing and the performance metrics of the model. Um, and where I think we've been maybe a little bit more, more radical in some ways is in being open about the whole decision-making processes. Um, and um, what I've created is I've called it a non-technical documentation website. So we try to consult our stakeholders as much as possible um, throughout the whole process. So for example, when we were deciding on performance metrics and whether to optimize for recall and precision, trying to explain that to someone who works a lot with patient experience data, um, trying to decide which one we would optimize for, for example. Um, we did that in person in online meetings, but we also made this website so they could come back and look at it and just understand the decisions that we were making um, with the machine learning model that they would use later on. So that website's there and it's free and open for everyone to see. And we've also like written down things that we tried and didn't work out because I think that the mo models and the outputs are just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, as you know, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes um, under the water, all the, all the rabbit holes, all the things that you tried that didn't work out in the end. And sharing all that stuff means that somebody doesn't have to make those mistakes and they can save time later on. Um, so that's where we've written down all of those things that went into our decision making um, on this website. So um, in terms of the actual model performance, this is what well, we had some pretty decent performance, I think, considering the difficulty of the task we had. Um, we used a large language model. So we used the smallest of the large language models, the Stilbert, um, which was very slow and resource intensive. And we found had significant technical challenges in terms of um, pushing that into deployment. 
Um, it was consuming 100% of our server resources when it was making predictions. So we had to really think a little bit more creatively um, about how we would make this project output available to the people who are participating. So we ensembled the models together to produce the best, like some kind of mega hybrid monster that was made up of three models under the hood. So as I said, um, the Distilbert model was really heavy, and that's not even you know the large language model with the most parameters, or it's like has the best performance. We just used whatever was smallest because that's what worked on my machine. So um, we knew that there would be challenges for trusts wanting to use these project outputs because if I was struggling to get it to work, um, somebody with less confidence with programming or with less less hardware capabilities would have an even tougher time. So we created um, an API. Rather than expecting people to download the models themselves and run it on their computers, um, we've created an API so that all they need to do is um, rerun the models on our hardware, on our servers, and um, they, all they need to do is have an internet connection and send their queries across for their content to be labeled via the API. Um, we had to get a bit creative with the um, API architecture. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into it um, today because we don't have time, but it involves uh, Docker, which is my new, my new love, I would say. And we also provided lots of example code in R and Python so that um, yeah, partner trusts we know don't always have, you know, there's lots of different levels of confidence with coding. So we provided as much assistance as possible um, so that people can utilize these packages. So in summary, um, PX text mining, it's a package for natural language processing of patient experience feedback. Um, it's fully open. Um, it does both multi-label and sentiment classification of patient experience feedback. When we say that it's open, we mean that it's open in terms of the code, um, the project output, so the models are available on GitHub as well but we were also open in the ways that we worked with our stakeholders and in the ways that we're sharing our learning, um, all the things that we did wrong and would like to do better next time. There's lots of useful links there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're just trying to keep on to time, yep. so unfortunately no I don't, there's gonna be time for questions today. Um, but do feel free to put them in the chat and we can pick those up later. So can I ask Nicola, she's on her way now, to come, come on. <laughs> oh, take the clicker. And once again, thanks very much to you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I just want to say how much of a treat it is to come and kind of geek for two days. Um, we are here to talk you through a little bit. One of the times that we, we didn't get to do what the first choice might have been when it comes down to R. So um, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about who we are, what our challenges were, um, who our stakeholders were, and then I think Chi is going to, in a nice kind of mirror of the way it actually happened, I'm gonna to go to Chi with the challenges and he's gonna talk you through the solution. So, we are a team called Cadias. We are based in NHS England within the cancer program. And we're a little bit of a weird team, to be honest, because historically, we were almost like a, a vessel where NHS England data would kind of go through us and we would disseminate it to other teams who might have been outside of NHS England proper, so they'd be in an ICB, they'd be a cancer alliance, they would be not able to access that internal data. Um, with the restructure and with sort of just time, we have changed our tact a little bit. We still are providing that service of sending data out to people who can't get access to the data, but we're trying to be adding more value to actually be analysts. We're trying to do more of the interesting ad hoc questions and that sort of thing but also our, our kind of base of, of stakeholders have changed. So originally it was just people in a cancer alliance. And that was always a bit varied because some cancer alliances would have a lot of analytical skills and others wouldn't. But now we're not just sending it to cancer alliances. We've got policy leads within the cancer program who are really interested in our sort of data. 
we have um, performance leads within a trust or an ICB who are really interested in our sort of data. So although CADIAS does a huge range of things, it does evaluation, it does health inequalities, it does anything you could think of to do with cancer, our little sub-team in particular focus on operational performance data. So we're talking about whether a trust is meeting a cancer standard, for example. And we basically make weekly, monthly, and ad hoc packs of, of the data. Um, and this, let me talk you through the challenges. So historically, as I said, we would kind of get data from NHS England, we would dump it into a spreadsheet, and we would send it out. Um, it would be a huge analytical drag on our time. There's four of us in our team. So trying to get all these spreadsheets out and all the different geographical cuts and, and just trying to get it through in time and QA'd was, it was just such a panic, especially when you're thinking that we were talking about weekly timescales. So we'd get the data one day and really we needed it, our products out the next day because otherwise they're, they're out of date pretty soon. So it would be, it'd be like panic stations. We'd get that data, we'd be like, oh no, we can't do anything else. We have to get these products out. And it would be a huge, huge stress. Um, but also we were trying to cater to all these different kinds of people. We had analysts who we, we put lots of work in and they'd just go in the back and strip the data out. And they didn't really want all the things we were trying to do on the front end. Or we had people who were almost scared to open, like if you gave them an Excel, sheet they'd be a bit panicky that what they really wanted was a powerpoint slide with a table or a graph and it they had to be their geographical area it had to be all you know cleanly spelled out didn't really want to do too much themselves um, and they really did like a powerpoint slide <laughs> um, and i know you're probably you're all sat here going well just do a dashboard like that's obviously the best thing you should do in this situation and we did think about that and we were sat there trying to evaluate what our options were um, we had to rule out things like Tableau and Power BI because we were sending it to different people with, um, like in the different geographies, ICBs, cancer alliances, they didn't all have that kind of software. So it had to be something that they could open really easily with some kind of open source software. It really needed to speed up. Like we couldn't be spending days at a time trying to get these things out. Couldn't be monopolizing our time because we had other sort of more ad hoc pieces that we needed to be getting done. Ideally, we really wanted it to be able to output into a PowerPoint, if possible, certain cuts of the data. Um, we wanted people to re really easily select their geography and see the graphics or the table or whatever that it was for their region really clearly. And one of the huge issues we had is that this was sensitive uh, NHS data. It's not published, so we can't, we don't have a Shiny server within NHS England at the moment, so we couldn't, can't put it online, we can't host it. So Shiny was all but ruled out, um, despite us doing, <laughs> look at the Shiny, Shiny. Um, so those were the challenges we, I basically presented to she, that we couldn't do all of these things, and we wanted to do all of these things. So what was the workaround? And I'll hand over to she now. So. Thank you, Nate. Um, oh, so, so yeah, just to build on top of um, what Nate mentioned in terms of the challenges and constraint. Um, so what we um, uh, recognized was that these challenges were not unique to us. These, uh, you know, are challenges that are faced by a lot of our teams. And um, what we decided to do uh, basically to use our markdown to build a dashboard. And I'll touch why we uh, didn't quite pick the portal route. Um, so essentially we uh, harness the, um, uh, the power of um, a number of packages. So primarily um, the uh, flash dashboard, crosstalk, plotly, D DTN and uh, flex table. And uh, yeah, we've now going into, like, because we've got less than 10 minutes, um, so I'm just going to uh, hopefully give um, everyone a uh, relatively high level overview of this so that you don't actually need to jump down to the rabbit hole that we, we've been to. Um, so, so what it does is that um, um, the um, Flex dashboard basically creates more or less the framework, so we can create pages and subpages to basically at that level of in interactivity um, uh, for the users. And um, um, so, so basically, um, 
Cortel didn't have that support, at least the last time I checked. So we, we basically stuck an arm up down. And then, um, sorry, I'll just, um, the next, yep. <laughs> and then, um, so, um, so obviously the Plotly, I'm sure a lot of you know that um, uh, basically gives that uh, interactivity that, you know, you can have all these um, uh, um, change the plots and so on. But what's really the game changer here is this package called uh, Crosstalk because it basically changes the, um, the underlying data frame driving these visuals. Um, so, however, it's got, it, we, we basically need to use some tricks um, because we don't have Shiny, so the computation is not ha happening on the surface side, it happens locally, so basically it's the browsers that are doing the computation. Um, and um, so what we uh, had to do was to basically write some JavaScript to basically compensate some of the, um, the issue that we, we uh, or the nitty gritty stuff that we faced, such as uh, like a dependency drop down. Um, so on the next slide, I can show you this, uh, some hideous uh, JavaScript, but uh, I'm sure a lot of it can't really see it anyway. But what, what it does is basically it just, uh, a force a default value in the drop down and also create this illusion of dependency drop down. So basically, say for example, if a region level drop down is selected, then only the regional kind of selection drop down would appear. And obviously the same for cancer alliances or, or providers in, uh, in our case. And um, yeah, and, and this way we can kind of um, have a second best solution that we, we add to that uh, interactivity um, to basically tailor all our report um, based on um, our, our, you know, um, wide diverse range of uh, stakeholders requirements. Um, so, so yeah, I hope this um, uh, gives everyone a bit of a pointer that uh, I hope that is some sort of inspiration. If your team is just starting using R and we are facing these constraints, then um, yeah, I think I think the kind of summary of this is that it's possible. We just need to have a go at it, and uh, we managed to do it in uh, two weeks. Um, that saved a lot of the time, so that we can actually use R properly to do some modeling and and uh, statistical analysis. Um, to really show some insight to help our colleagues ac uh, across the system. So thank you. And have you got any questions? Hello? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're still very, very tight on time, so uh, no questions at this time. Uh, however, there were some potential leads on Shiny and Shiny yeah. Live as potential options. That, that would be, yeah, that, I mean, that would be the optimum if we could just yeah. not have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, over to Jacqueline. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Jacqueline. I work at the strategy unit. Um, and um, I'm just going to talk to you about a little project. It's like a little side project of mine. Um, uh, and uh, how I used um, sort of GitHub to collaborate to, to work on the project. Um, okay, so, so this project started because um, there are quite a lot of now of um, webinars and uh, online live events. Um, obviously, the popularity of those has, in, has increased in the last few years for obvious reasons. Um, um, but um, as an analyst who had to um, host a, a, a live event, I was um, wanted to know when it was over. Uh, obviously, how how was it? So, what what was the uh, participation rate, uh, did people stay, were they interested, did they look and switch off after 10 minutes, but I, I, I couldn't work, out, work it out. So I'm going to show you how, um, this, this is like the, this is my project, so top left, this is me, uh, had a live event, wanted to know who came, who went, so then I had a lot of frustration, um, and eventually um, we've got through collaborating in GitHub with colleagues uh, and uh, dashboard in Shiny. So, oh, so I, I had a, I got the data out of the back of Microsoft um, Teams. If you do a live event in Microsoft Teams, you can, um, or, or an event in Zoom or a webinar in Teams, 
it generates a file of, of attendance data. So um, I knew from watching and while the event was going on, how many people were there at any one time. Um, but um, if you wanted more detailed information, um, I found out that you could get this file from the, from the back of Microsoft Teams and I was really excited. And then I opened the file and it looked like that. Now, I know that if you're sitting at the back, you probably can't see, see this so well, but it's okay, I'm gonna describe it to you. So it's, it's not ideal, is the first glance, you, you, you think it's okay, and then you start to look properly. And you can see things like, um, each person's got a row of data when they join the event, and then another row of data when they leave the event, it's good so far. But also, if they join the event on the wrong day, then that's also recorded. And so then you, you won't be able to see, but for as an example, there's a person in there, person 56, I called them in, my, in this sample data. Um, they'd obviously got diary issues. They joined a month early for the event, <coughs> left again, came back again at the right time, and left again. So if somebody joined the, the, the meeting um, and then they lost connection, let's say they were joined on the mobile, they lost connection, uh, and then left the meeting and rejoined, and, and that went on through the meeting. Um, or if somebody joined 10 minutes early, you don't, if the event starts at 10 o'clock and they join at 10 to 10, you, you, you can't count those 10 minutes as, as attended because it's not started yet. So at first you, you think it's gonna be easy, but it's not. <laughs> um, so I started playing around with the spreadsheet and I, I was cleaning it up and organizing the data. And as I started to um, think, uh, which was always dangerous, um, I thought, well, I, I could turn this into a set of rules. What I'm doing here is making rules. And if I could change this set of rules um, into something in R, then once I've written it, then, then that's it. I don't have to ever do, go through this pain again. So I'm, I've gone from a mess um, to thinking, right, I need to do something different. So one Sunday evening, I wrote about 70 lines of code, which most of my colleagues would probably write in about 10. But I wrote some code to find the answers. And by the end of the evening, and I don't know if you'll be able to read this, see this, so I'll, I'll, re I'll read it to you, but I tidied the data up in R. And then by the end of the evening, I had answers to all these questions. The average attendance time was 42 minutes. Um, 50 people attended for less than 15 minutes, 430 people attended in total, 261 of them lasted for more than 45 minutes of the hour, 35 people joined 15 minutes late, at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I was happy, I'd got everything I wanted. Um, this, is, this was all I needed to know. But then, even bigger mistake was, I thought, well, I've got this piece of code now, and I could really do something with this. <laughs> because then if I want to know these things, then other people will want to know these things. And then I started talking to some colleagues and they said, yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. And, uh, and then in, before long, in fact, with it less than a week of this Sunday, I was already envisaging something in Shiny. And I'd, before long, I'd built a prototype in Shiny. So, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see that, um, to be honest, but, so this was my prototype, quite, quite basic. So you start off, um, you select, in fact, I can't even see it, so I'm just gonna move over. <laughs> um, you, um, yeah, so you've, it's got the functionality at the side, you can browse to select the file. Um, um, and then the first version, you had to tell it what date the event took place and you had to say what time it started and what time it finished. And then before long, I, 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 adapted that so that it would work out what date it was and what time it started and what time it finished without you ever having to put it in just by looking at the medians and, 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 and analyzing the data to figure out what time the event actually started and finished. And then before long, I'd got this shiny app where you could basically grab your file from your event, um, browse for it on your machine. Um, it would then tell you um, how all those stats that I read out before, present those, um, and it would give you uh, some sort of chart so you could have a look at how that how the attendance was um, was going with um, in terms of how long were they staying, when did they arrive, when did they leave, and so on. 
And then I thought I'd put it in GitHub and I made it public on GitHub and I started um, um, putting some issues in and labeling the issues up um, and uh, asking for help. Um, and then I demonstrated it to some colleagues um, and told them that I'd put these issues on and if anybody had any other thoughts and ideas and a couple of colleagues put things on and then one colleague, colleague who now from this point onwards, I can't claim any credit for any of this work because my colleague, um, Craig Parallo, he um, got massively involved. Um, and um, and then my, my, I just kept getting all these messages, more and more it, issues resolved, new ideas, and then before long, he'd rewritten the whole thing, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, which is great because I just had the idea and then he's done all, all the work. Um, so now we've got a, a nicer looking version um, so, um, uh, and we've got like ideas and we, uh, to, to develop it further. Um, so now, um, it's the same basic idea. You, you grab the file, it tells you about the number of attendees um, per minute of the, that the event's taking place, um, presents the stats in a little bit of a nicer way, so you probably hopefully can see, that, see it this time. Um, uh, it also tells you whether the people who joined on a computer or on a mobile device. Um, so now we have really gone from this like mess of people to, to something that's like a nicer looking um, dashboard. And Craig also had the idea to use some survival analysis. So he's put like survival analysis uh, data in as well. Um, and um, so we've got that, that in as well. Um, and so now we've gone from this to this, to go, to go faster stripes. Um, so what next? So now, uh, this is like me with a, a um, saying, well, we've got a lot of other ideas. There are other issues on the GitHub um, that, that and, and thoughts and ideas that we've had, but also it's not limited to those thoughts and ideas. So I'd really welcome other suggestions. Um, one of the things that I'm halfway through doing is trying to make this work also for files out of the back of Zoom. Um, and I, I think there might be other, maybe there are other things, other of these types of files that we could just put that option in. At the, at the moment, it's just got a, like a radio buttons, but only one of them works. But the idea is that they'll, they'll all work eventually for the different event types. Um, it's also gonna be possible to put in some exporting functions so you could export a cleaned up and organized set of attendance data, uh, maybe export certain presentations. If, you thought, if you've got project reports maybe that you've got to like justify for your events. Um, also, perhaps something like if you needed um, attendance certificates, but you don't want to give them to people who only joined for five minutes, um, it, you, could, you could maybe develop it for that. Um, so this project served a dual purpose as a useful tool and as a safe vehicle from which to practice collaborating on GitHub, or as Tom said, a silly and consequential project to learn something new. And I, um, so, um, there's, there's, yeah, there's, so as I've said, there's still quite a lot of suggestions and ideas. Um, it's a nice little project to practice on because um, if you want to practice your collaboration on GitHub, because you're not going to break anything, it's not real work. Um, it's not got a massive time pressure. I've been doing this for working on this for months. Um, uh, it's a kind of a, a would be nice, but actually I think it is of use. Some people will find it really useful. Um, there's lots of little small things that you could do um, to dabble in, in GitHub without fear. And it's not specific to any organization, so it doesn't even matter if NHS, not NHS, anybody who's using any of these things like t uh, Teams or Zoom. Um, so if it's of interest to you, um, and, you and you're looking to develop any of your, any sort of collaboration skills, then, then I'd invite you to um, join in um, and, and give, a, give us a hand with it, because otherwise I might never, ever finish it. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we're at time. Still leave the clicker here. Yeah. Um, I cannot say how useful doing a survival analysis on certain meetings that I have to attend to um, would be useful for. Um, but yeah, I've, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. So I think we're over to Ozia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Hi everyone, uh, so my name's Jose. I'm a junior data scientist at the Strategy Unit and I'll be talking to you about evidence mapping in Shiny. So to give you a bit of context, uh, early this year, our evidence and knowledge team approached us 
looking for a data science solution to the evidence maps they have to produce. So they fairly regularly have to produce evidence maps and typically they'd use Excel, but they were looking for an output that's more interactive and they were hoping would have an internal solution rather than having to outsource that work. Uh, so the process of making an evidence map <coughs> is sort of data collection, so uh, obtaining the evidence, processing it, and then visualizing it, and it was, uh, it was our aim to be involved in the visualization part of that process. Uh, so a very good question is what is an evidence map? So prior to this piece of work, uh, I had never heard of an evidence map. Uh, it just hadn't crossed into my, my field of work. So an evidence map is a visualization of a current body of knowledge on a specific topic, uh, typically used to identify gaps in evidence. Uh, they're usually uh, a table with column headers and row headers as parameters, and each grid is a count of the number of evidence that meets those criteria. They're typically interactive, so the user could maybe change the parameters of the table or filter the evidence going into the table before the evidence map is produced. So some current examples. So the first part of our process was to kind of look at what currently exists and if we think we can emulate those. So our first example is from a study, and this is just a static evidence map. So you have parameters on the column and row headers. You have the count in each cell, and they've also included a color scale, uh, just to kind of help visualize the difference between the numbers, because sometimes that can get lost as just a static number. Uh, the next example is uh, looks fairly similar. So you've got your column headers and row headers, but in this case, uh, it's interactive, and the user has the option to uh, filter the data going in uh, before the evidence map is produced. And the final example is perhaps the least clear of all the examples. So instead of using numbers, uh, people making this have used, uh, used dots, and the size of the dot uh, being the size or the number of studies that meet the criteria. So why might you want to use data science in this process? So the part of the process that gets repeated the most, I think, is the visualization aspect. The evidence map is produced over and over and over in a number of different spreadsheets. And we were hoping that we could reduce the repetition of work and also free up resources to work on a single data science solution rather than repeating the same process. Um, and also, if we were to do this using data science, we'd actually have a lot more control over the output, the functionality, and how everything looks. So our aim to start with, we wanted to produce um, a dashboard in Shiny that looked very similar to the evidence maps that we'd seen. And we wanted to have like a single generic solution that we could then apply to a range of different evidence maps rather than having to make each one ad hoc. And uh, yes, yeah, so we wanted to have a generic solution and we wanted to repurpose it for specific project needs. So a generic solution looked a little bit like this. So there's the uh, evidence map that you that would look similar to the ones you've seen on the examples with column header and row header. Uh, we decided we'd use a waffle chart to kind of show the proportion of the numbers rather than a sliding color scale. And if the user is to select a specific cell, we then populate a table, which is kind of cut off in the example, but it populates a table with all the relevant evidence and links to that evidence. So we had a previously a version 0.1.0, so it's a, it's a work in progress, but it kind of has the initial functionality that we're looking for. And then we had an opportunity to repurpose it. So a couple of months after we started developing uh, the generic evidence map, uh, we had an internal need for an evidence map for the NHP project. You may have heard of that today. But very briefly, so as a number of new hospitals plan to be built, the strategy unit is involved in the demand modeling and the forecasting, and there was a need for an evidence map to support some of that forecasting. So what we were able to do is take our generic version and start building up to meet the demands of this specific use case. 
As far as our programming approach, uh, so we produce this using Shiny, which is a package in R, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but what was pivotal to this and to our like, overall aim was a package called Golem. So Golem is used to modularize Shiny dashboards. Uh, in its own words, it's an opinionated framework uh, to help people produce production grade Shiny applications. So the way it works is it encourages you to separate out your code into lots of different modules. And these modules are then called up when the Shiny app starts. And the reason this was really important for us is it meant that we could have a specific module to do a specific task and we could repurpose it and reuse it in the future. And it effectively turns your code into a package and each module is a bit like a function. And uh, so we, we managed the project using GitHub uh, for the fairly obvious reasons of version control and collaboration, but it also allowed us to release stages of this piece of work. So we've currently got a version 0.1.0 released of our generic uh, evidence map, uh, and that made it much easier for us to build upon that when working on our specific NHP evidence map. And then as far as our future plans, so we aim to just continu continue developing the generic version as and when needed, we'll kind of branch off, work on a specific version, come back to the generic version, keep building that up. And we would like to have a number of different modules that are pre-coded that meet all the requirements we may ever need for an evidence map. And as and when evidence work comes in, we can say, okay, this map needs X, Y, and Z functionality. We can kind of turn on those modules or include those modules um, and ship off an evidence map uh, fairly quickly. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but maybe there is. I don't think there are any questions at the moment, so. Thank you very much, Osma. Thank you. Uh, so I think Neil is next, and I think this is uh, the most intriguing title today. So if you can actually reduce cognitive load while coding, then uh, yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. So over to you, Neil. Thank you. I work as a scientist at UK Health Security Agency, and I'll be talking about strategies to reduce cognitive load when coding, or in other words, how to reduce stress um, when coding. So I code in R, so the examples I'll give will be based using R. And it'll be a high level overview. So I'll talk about six topics and there'll be links to resources for people to review in their own time. So I'll talk about documentation, functions, writing tests for functions, error messages, visualizing code and code review. So the first one's probably the most obvious, making sure you have good documentation. So readme files in GitLab and GitHub a really good way to do this. So most commonly a markdown file which allows for easy formatting. So you can do bold, italics, underlining, things like that. And it should contain everything that a colleague would need to know to pick up your project, to use, and to contribute to the code. It should be kept up to date and reviewed for accuracy. And it can be, um, you can signpost for more extensive documentation, such as local drives, um, other document stores, we can even set up your own wiki pages on GitLab and GitHub. So writing functions. So write functions replace long scripts with smaller, easy to understand portions of code. And I'll show an example of this on the next slide. So as most of us may know, it allows code to be reused where appropriate without having to copy and paste. And it simplifies your R script so you can see the workflow more easily and not get too bogged down with the code. So once we've written our functions, we can store those in packages, or if we don't want to do all the work to create a package, we could use the box or doctoring package, which allows us to write our functions, write documentation, and that will even work with the help function in our studio. So we can store functions for use across future projects. So in this example, there's a load of code on the left-hand side that produces the plot on the right-hand side. So I've worked through it. I've got the code the way that I wanted it to be. But what I've done is I've turned it into a function. So rather than having all of that code in my script, I open up the script. So I could have maybe 10 or so plots 
and I don't want to get overwhelmed by thousands of lines of code. So by turning that into a function and giving it a useful name, so it's called create fuel economy plot. On the right hand side, for this example, my workflow would just be, I've got a data frame called MPG, I'm piping it through this create fuel economy plot function, and it will produce the, the plot as we see here. So the only time I need to see my code is when I go to look at it, to tweak it, to update it. I don't need to see it every time I run my scripts. So we've written documentation, we've wrote some functions, and now it's time to look at writing tests for functions. So when, when we write a function, we will all test this within our code. And so we'll write a function, make sure it works, and move on to the next thing. So what we're thinking about is formalizing testing within the code. And this will reduce uncertainty when functions are updated, or even when packages are updated. It provides confidence that functions work as intended, so you don't need to worry are your functions still working? So the example I'm going to show is from the test that package, which provides functions to test code. So in this example, I've written a function called addition. It takes two digits, x and y, adds them together. So I've written a test to say, if I give three and five to that function, I expect the number eight to be returned. And if that happens, it says test passed. So I can be confident this function is still working and no updates has affected it. So we've written documentation, wrote, written functions, wrote tests for those functions, and now it's time to think about writing useful error messages. So anticipate problems within your workflow. What's likely to go wrong? And then think of writing an error message that describes the problem and what the user needs to do to fix the problem. The CLI package in R provides tools to write attractive command line interfaces. So for example, you might be running a project and the spreadsheet might be produced by a different team and they'll say it'll be ready by 11 o'clock. And you may run your script and you'll find that it's not there. You could write an error message to say spreadsheet not available, email support, or whatever the case may be for your individual project. So it tells the user that Something's not happened and tells them what to do so they don't have to waste time looking around for the solution. The next thing I'm going to talk about is visualizing your code. So we've written loads of functions and it can be useful to visualize how all those functions fit together and work together in the workflow. And it helps when explaining code or collaborating with others if you're handing over a project. It provides a visual frame of reference when it comes to debugging code. For function oriented workflows, this can be done using the targets package. And I'll show an example on the next slide. But if you want to produce some documentation manually, the GG flowchart package is really good to create flowcharts. So in this example, using the targets package, it's um, on the left-hand side is the code that's produced the, the graph on the right-hand side. And it's a workflow where there's one CSV file and four functions and a series of things happen to it. So on the right-hand side, I can talk you through what's happening. So in the diagram, at the top, there's a circle called file. So that's a CSV file. It's being combined with the get data function to load it into R, and it's being called raw data. So that's a data frame. And that data frame is being um, subjected to the two functions, add weak number, add age groups, so some transformations are happening. And so that raw data, data frame, becomes data with those transformations, and the create plot function is being used that to create the plot at the end. So the outcome is the plot. So in under a minute, so I've talked you through a workflow, and it probably is more useful with um, larger scripts. So that gives you an idea of what's possible. The last thing I want to talk about is code reviews. Have a designated person for each project to maintain an overview of all the code. Is it particularly useful if you have a number of people collaborating and adding to the code? It's useful to have somebody that can understand how all these different moving parts fit together. 
It provides ownership of the project, and it's easier to troubleshoot errors um, if they occur. So I suggest if using Git, if you protect the main or master branch, code review can take place in response to a pull merge request. And it provides confidence that master branch will always work because development will take place in branches. And when suggestions have been made and changes have been made, they've been looked at by somebody and tested and accepted if they work or pushed back to the collaborators if more work needs to be done. And all of this provides quality assurance. And if you work in a team where you have to provide evidence that quality assurance happens, then you can say, well, every time the code changed in the master branch, the one that we used, there was a code review. And you could even provide a list of all the code reviews that have taken place. So in summary, I've talked about documentation. Writing functions to simplify the workflow and storing functions for future use, either through own packages or the box or doc string packages. Writing tests for those functions to make sure any code tweaks or any package updates haven't affected how they should be functioning. Writing useful error messages. The CLI package in R provides tools to do this. Anticipate errors and tell users what to do when things go wrong. Visualizing your code using the targets package or maybe the GG flowchart package. And code review, having a named person who's responsible for the code and using code reviews to quality assure the code when changes and updates happen. So hopefully with these tips, it'll make coding a little bit less stressful. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, there is one quick question I think we might be able to sneak in. Yep. Uh, for a workflow that doesn't have any of these things, what do you suggest somebody starts with for the greatest impact? That's a good question. question. I, I would say, um, thinking about write, writing functions, think about the things you do most um, in your work, writing functions, and think about how and um, documenting those using the methods that I described would be a good starting point. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, last talk for today is over to Hamira. Um, so, my name is Tamara, and I'm a senior information analyst at NHS England, but I'm actually presenting a bit of work that I did for my PhD, which I recently completed. Um, and that is looking at um, com doing a network mess analysis in R, and I'm going to present this specific example in type 2 diabetes treatments. So the very common um, hierarchy of evidence that is currently used in evidence-based medicine is that randomized controlled trials are generally considered the gold standard because they, you know, randomize people, reduce bias, have um, a more reliable results. Um, but what's the top of the pyramid is um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of these randomized controlled trials because they aggregate the results from these randomized controlled trials. So it increases the power and the generalizability. So this is a sort of basic graphical representation of what a meta-analysis is. And um, suppose you have a number of trials that are comparing two treatments, so treatment A and treatment B, and they are all comparing these treatments in a very similar population, and you're getting the same outcome out of it. So you're getting the same effect estimate out of each randomized control trial. What meta-analysis does is it allows you to collate all of these effect estimates that you have extracted from the randomized control trials, aggregate it together to get an overall estimate of treatment A versus treatment B for a particular outcome. So again, there's many benefits of doing this. So you're increasing your power, your accuracy, and your generalizability. What network meta-analysis is, is an extension of meta-analysis where you can increase your network and compare many treatments rather than just two. Now, this is particularly useful when you don't have a direct comparison between two treatments. Usually, you have trials that are comparing a active treatment to a placebo rather than two active treatments to each other, but your interest might be comparing the two active treatments. So what network meta-analysis does is, is that it allows you to get the indirect effect estimate, 
So suppose you've got treatment A versus treatment B in a direct randomized control trial, and treatment A versus treatment C in another direct randomized control trial. You can use this common com comparator, treatment A, to get the indirect effect estimate of treatment B versus treatment C. Now, with these models, as most statistical models, there are some key assumptions that you need to make sure you follow and check. So um, the similarity of populations, you can't have like people comparing two treatments, but then very varied populations, you can't include them in the same network meta-analyses. Um, consistency between direct and indirect effect estimates. So in the case of getting the indirect effect estimate of B versus C, um, suppose you did have a direct randomized control trial comparing these two, the indirect estimate that you get from the network meta-analysis should be the same as the direct estimate that you get from the actual randomized control trial and homogeneity within the network. So the example that I'm going to be presenting on is in type 2 diabetes, where I looked at two specific classes of glucose-lowering um, medications. These were SGLT2Is and GLP-1RAs. And there are a number, I've listed the treatments that I looked for. I'm not going to say them all out loud because they are very complicated names. Um, but I specified um, the study design and the population just to make sure that these assumptions held. So I looked at parallel designed randomized control trials. These were trials that compared um, treatments to treatments or treatments to placebo, um, looking at adults with type 2 diabetes. And the outcome that I am going to be presenting on is the mean change in HbA1c, which is a measure of blood glucose, after 24 weeks of treatment or placebo. And the outcome format, which is important that you do consider, is um, the mean change within a specific treatment arm. So I looked at the change in treatment A and treatment B from baseline after 24 weeks, and that's the numbers that I extracted from the randomized control trials that I searched. So the package that I used to do this was the GEMTC package in R, and there are some prerequisites that you need to first sort out before it will actually run. So this is a Bayesian network meta-analysis methodology. So um, it calls a program called JAGS, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation method. Um, so it calls that into R and runs whatever model that you're going to run through that. So you have to install JAGS first of all for it to run. And then you have to obviously install and load the packages that you're going to use. Um, and the other thing is, is that you need to set up the data and format it in the way that um, the package will recognize it. So in this case, because I'm looking at the mean change uh, from baseline in each treatment arm per study, um, it's in long format. So each row is a particular treatment arm in a particular study. And that's how you have to set it up. And it has to have the specific names. So then the package will automatically recognize it when you run the model. So when you set up the network using the MTC network command. So the next thing I did was to actually plot the network that I have. So the circles, which are the treatments, which I will call nodes, and the edges are the lines between the treatments, um, represent the direct comparison. So they represent the randomized control trials that are available comparing these treatments. And what this is really good for is that you need to check if you have any disconnected nodes. And that means that if there's any treatment comparisons that are actually not included in the network, because then you won't be able to include them in your actual analysis and your models won't run correctly. Um, so then you can just plot the command, use the plot command once you've set up the network and it'll give you this really nice graph. So this is just um, how to set up the network. And um, because this is a sim simulation method, I do tend to set a seed just because if I'm going to run the model multiple times on my laptop, I want to make sure I get the same results each time. But obviously, if you, even if you use the same seed on your laptop, you will probably get slightly different results to what I've got. Um, and then once you've set your seed, you can um, set up the model. So use the MTC network that you've set up before the type of model that you want to run. So in this case, it's consistency, but there's many different models that you can run with this package. So there's inconsistency, node splitting, many different things for checking assumptions of the actual model. 
Um, and then you can run the model using the MTC run command. Um, and then because this is a simulation method, you set how many simulations you're going to run for. So when you summarize the model that you've run, which it will call JAGS, run in JAGS, and then import the results back into R, um, this is something that you get, which can get a bit complicated and a bit confusing to actually understand. Um, but what the focus is on is you're going to look at the medians and the 95% credible intervals. So that's the 2.5% quintiles, the 50% quintile, and the 97.5. Yeah, so the right quintile. Um, and this gives you your sort of probability and your range. And it compares it against your baseline treatment that you have considered. So in this case, because quite a lot of treatments were compared to placebo, that's the one that I used as my baseline treatment. And the reason we use medians is because sometimes um, these sort of models can be a little bit skewed. So rather than using the mean, um, a median would be a more accurate representation of your results and your simulation analysis. But this can be a bit confusing to actually understand. So we like graphs. Um, so this is a forest plot, and what this does is, is that you can easily plot your, your summarized results in a forest plot, um, and it shows it against your baseline treatment, which is placebo, and it allows you to quickly see which treatment effects work best. So in this case, it was one particular treatment called semaglutide that had the greatest reduction in HbA1c in comparison to placebo. But what's really good about this package and the results that you get and the results that are stored is that you can actually get the comparisons against each other. So you could say, for example, if you wanted to look at a canagliflozin, so the top one versus the second one, dapagliflozin, you could easily do that and get those numbers from the model. So there's quite a lot of flexibility with this. But yeah, that's my quick whistle-stop tour of network meta-analyses methods in R. And I will be happy Brilliant. to take any questions, but my email's there if there's no time. Thank you very much. There is a quick question. Oh, there is. No running away yet. Uh, where's it gone? So the quick question is, how do you define similar enough populations for network meta-analysis? And is there a way of testing whether the groups are too different to compare? Okay, um, so you tend to have a sort of, um, you sort of define it with clinician advice usually. So for, my, for me, it was, um, one of my supervisors was an actual clinician, so there's more experience in diabetes and these treatments. So that's how we sort of defined it. But um, a way of testing uh, if you've got a good model fit is, there's um, statistics that you can calculate with the model, so DICs and residual deviances, which um, the model does pull out for you. And um, you count that and compare that to the amount of data points you have, so the amount of studies you have. Um, so that's a good way of checking if you've got a good model fit. Brilliant, thank you. No, is that the questions? Thank you very much. So, um, I guess it's my privilege now to hand over to Mr. Beeney for final comments. Thanks, yes. I'm not going to... Um, it does say thank you. I'm not going to say thank you to everyone now because we're, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, but it's really been a really great day. It's really great to see everyone. It's absolutely jam-packed. The Slack is absolutely full of comments. Loads of people worked really hard today, which is really great. So, thank you to everybody that's helped and all the speakers. I am thinking everyone. I've started now, haven't I? So, anyway, yes. Thanks to everybody.